Chapter 22, Part 2 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The ambassadors of Julian had been instructed to execute with the utmost diligence their important commission, but in their passage through Italy and Illyricum they were detained by the tedious and affected delays of the provincial governors. They were conducted by slow journeys from Constantinople to Caesarea in Cappadocia, and when at length they were admitted to the presence of Constantius, they found that he had already conceived, from the dispatches of his own officers, the most unfavorable opinion of the conduct of Julian and of the Gallic army. The letters were heard with impatience, the trembling messengers were dismissed with indignation and contempt, and the looks, the gestures, the furious language of the monarch expressed the disorder of his soul. The domestic connection, which might have reconciled the brother and the husband of Helena, was recently dissolved by the death of that princess, whose pregnancy had been several times fruitless and was at last fatal to herself. The Empress Eusebia had preserved, to the last moment of her life, the warm and even jealous affection which she had conceived for Julian, and her mild influence might have moderated the resentment of a prince who, since her death, was abandoned to his own passions and to the arts of his eunuchs. But the terror of a foreign invasion obliged him to suspend the punishment of a private enemy. He continued his march towards the confines of Persia, and thought it sufficient to signify the conditions which might entitle Julian and his guilty followers to the clemency of their offended sovereign. He required that the presumptuous Caesar should expressly renounce the appellation and rank of Augustus, which he had accepted from the rebels, that he should descend to his former station of a limited and dependent minister, that he should vest the powers of the state and army in the hands of those officers who were appointed by the imperial court, and that he should trust his safety to the assurances of pardon, which were announced by Epictetus, a Gallic bishop, and one of the Arian favorites of Constantius. Several months were ineffectually consumed in a treaty which was negotiated at the distance of 3,000 miles between Paris and Antioch, and as soon as Julian perceived that his moderate and respectful behavior served only to irritate the pride of an implacable adversary, he boldly resolved to commit his life and fortune to the chance of a civil war. He gave a public and military audience to the quaestor Leonis. The haughty epistle of Constantius was read to the attentive multitude, and Julian protested, with the most flattering deference, that he was ready to resign the title of Augustus, if he could obtain the consent of those whom he acknowledged as the authors of his elevation. The faint proposal was impetuously silenced, and the acclamations of Julian Augustus continue to reign by the authority of the army, of the people, of the republic which you have saved, thundered at once from every part of the field, and terrified the pale ambassadors of Constantius. A part of the letter was afterwards read, in which the emperor arraigned the ingratitude of Julian, whom he had invested with the honors of the purple, whom he had educated with so much care and tenderness, whom he had preserved in his infancy when he was left a helpless orphan. An orphan, interrupted Julian, who justified his cause by indulging his passions. Does the assassin of my family reproach me that I was left an orphan? He urges me to revenge those injuries which I have long studied to forget. The assembly was dismissed, and Leonis, who with some difficulty had been protected from the popular fury, was sent back to his master with an epistle in which Julian expressed, in a strain of the most vehement eloquence, the sentiments of contempt, of hatred, and of resentment, which had been suppressed and embittered by the dissimulation of twenty years. After this message, which might be considered as a signal of irreconcilable war, Julian, who some weeks before had celebrated the Christian festival at the Epiphany, made a public declaration that he committed the care of his safety to the immortal gods, and thus publicly renounced the religion as well as the friendship of Constantius. The situation of Julian required a vigorous and immediate resolution. He had discovered from intercepted letters that his adversary, sacrificing the interest of the state to that of the monarch, had again excited the barbarians to invade the provinces of the west. The position of two magazines one of them collected on the banks of the Lake of Constance, the other formed at the foot of the Cotian Alps, seemed to indicate the march of two armies, and the size of those magazines, each of which consisted of 600,000 quarters of wheat, or rather flour, was a threatening evidence of the strength and numbers of the enemy who prepared to surround him. 
but the imperial legions were still in their distant quarters of Asia. The Danube was feebly guarded, and if Julian could occupy, by a sudden incursion, the important provinces of Illyricum, he might expect that a people of soldiers would resort to his standard, and that the rich mines of gold and silver would contribute to the expenses of the civil war. He proposed this bold enterprise to the assembly of the soldiers, inspired them with a just confidence in their general, and in themselves, and exhorted them to maintain their reputation of being terrible to the enemy, moderate to their fellow citizens, and obedient to their officers. His spirited discourse was received with the loudest acclamations, and the same troops which had taken up arms against Constantius when he summoned them to leave Gaul, now declared with alacrity that they would follow Julian to the farthest extremities of Europe or Asia. The oath of fidelity was administered, and the soldiers, clashing their shields and pointing their drawn swords to their throats, devoted themselves with horrid imprecations to the service of a leader whom they celebrated as the deliverer of Gaul and the conqueror of the Germans. This solemn engagement, which seemed to be dictated by affection rather than by duty, was singly opposed by Nebriticus, who had been admitted to the office of Praetorian Prefect. That faithful minister, alone and unassisted, asserted the rights of Constantius in the midst of an armed and angry multitude, to whose fury he had, he had almost fallen an honorable but useless sacrifice. After losing one of his hands by the stroke of a sword, he embraced the knees of the prince whom he had offended. Julian covered the prefect with his imperial mantle, and protecting him from the zeal of his followers, dismissed him to his own house, with less respect than was perhaps due to the virtue of an enemy. The high office in Nebriticus was bestowed on Sallust, and the provinces of Gaul, which were now delivered from the intolerable oppression of taxes, enjoyed the mild and equitable administration of a friend of Julian, who was permitted to practice those virtues which he had instilled in the mind of his pupil. The hopes of Julian depended much less on the number of his troops than on the celerity of his motions. In the execution of a daring enterprise, he availed himself of every precaution, as far as prudence could suggest, and where prudence could no longer accompany his steps, he trusted the event to valor and to fortune. In the neighborhood of Basil, he assembled and divided his army. One body, which consisted of ten thousand men, was directed, under the command of Nevetta, general of the cavalry, to advance through the midland parts of Raetia and Noricum. A similar division of troops, under the orders of Jovius and Jovinus, prepared to follow the oblique course of the highways through the Alps in the northern confines of Italy. The instructions to the generals was conceived with energy and precision to hasten their march in close and compact columns, which, according to the disposition of the ground, might readily be changed into any order of battle, to secure themselves against the surprises of the night by strong posts and vigilant guards, to prevent resistance by their unexpected arrival, and to elude examination by their sudden departure, to spread the opinion of their strength and the terror of his name, and to join their sovereign under the walls of Sirmium. For himself, Julian had reserved a more difficult and extraordinary part. He selected three thousand brave and active volunteers, resolved, like their leader, to cast behind them every hope of retreat. At the head of this faithful band, he fearlessly plunged into the recesses of the Marcian, or Black Forest, which conceals the sources of the Danube, and for many days the fate of Julian was unknown to the world. The secrecy of his march, his diligence and vigor, surmounted every obstacle. He forced his way over mountains and morasses, occupied the bridges or swam the rivers, pursued his direct course without reflecting whether he traversed the territory of the Romans or of the barbarians, and at length emerged between Redisban and Vienna, at the place where he had designed to embark his troops on the Danube. By a well-concerted stratagem he seized a fleet of light brigantines as it lay at anchor, secured a supply of coarse provisions sufficient to satisfy the indelicate but voracious appetite of a Gallic army and boldly committed himself to the stream of the Danube. The labors of his mariners, who plied their oars with incessant diligence, and the steady continuance of a favorable wind, carried his fleet above seven hundred miles in eleven days, and he had already disembarked his troops at Bononia, only nineteen miles from Sirmium, before his enemies could receive any certain intelligence that he had left the banks of the Rhine. In the course of this long and rapid navigation, the mind of Julian was fixed on the object of his enterprise, and though he accepted the deputations of some cities, which hastened to claim the merit of an early submission, he passed before the hostile stations, which were placed along the river, without indulging the temptation of signalizing a useless and ill-timed valor. The banks of the Danube were crowded on either side with spectators, 
who gazed on with the military pomp, anticipated the importance of the event, and diffused through the adjacent country the fame of the young hero, who advanced with more than mortal speed at the head of innumerable forces of the West. Lucilian, who with the rank of general of the cavalry commanded the military powers of Illyricum, was alarmed and perplexed by the doubtful reports, which he could neither reject nor believe. He had taken some slow and no resolute measures for the purpose of collecting his troops, when he was surprised by Dagalephus, an active officer, whom Julian, as soon as he landed at Bononia, had pushed forwards with some light infantry. The captive general, uncertain of his life or death, was hastily thrown upon a horse, and conducted to the presence of Julian, who kindly raised him from the ground, and dispelled the terror and amazement which seemed to stupefy his faculties. But Lucilian had no sooner recovered his spirits than he betrayed his want of discretion, by presuming to admonish his conqueror that he had rashly ventured, with a handful of men, to expose his person in the midst of his enemies. Reserve for your master Constantius these timid remonstrances, replied Julian, with a smile of contempt. When I gave you my purple to kiss, I received you not as a counselor, but as a suppliant. Conscious that success alone could justify his attempts, and that boldness only could command success, he instantly advanced, at the head of three thousand soldiers, to attack the strongest and most populous city of the Illyrian provinces. As he entered the long suburb of Sirmium, he was received by the joyful acclamations of the army and the people, who, crowned with flowers, and holding lighted tapers in their hands, conducted their acknowledged sovereign to his imperial residence. Two days were devoted to the public joy, which was celebrated by the games of the circus. But, early on the morning of the third day, Julian marched to occupy the narrow pass of Suchi in the defiles of Mount Hymus, which, almost in the midway between Sirmium and Constantinople, separates the provinces of Thrace and Dacia by an abrupt descent towards the former and a general declivity on the side of the latter. The defense of this important post was entrusted to the brave Nevita, who, as well as the generals of the Italian division, successfully executed the plan of the march and the junction which their master had so ably conceived. The homage which Julian obtained from the fears or the inclinations of the people extended far beyond the immediate effects of his arms. The prefectures of Italy and Illyricum were administered by Taurus and Florentius, who united that important office with the vain honors of the consulship. And as those magistrates had retired with precipitation to the court of Asia, Julian, who could not always restrain the levity of his temper, stigmatized their flight by adding, in all the acts of the year, the epitaph of fugitive to the names of the two consuls. The provinces which had been deserted by their first magistrates acknowledged the authority of an emperor who, conciliating the qualities of a soldier with those of a philosopher, was equally admired in the camps of the Danube and in the cities of Greece. From his palace, or more properly from his headquarters of Sirmium and Nisus, he distributed to the principal cities of the empire a labored apology for his own conduct, published the secret dispatches of Constantius, and solicited the judgment of mankind between two competitors, one of whom had expelled and the other had invited the barbarians. Julian, whose mind was deeply wounded by the reproach of ingratitude, aspired to maintain by argument as well as by arms the superior merits of his cause, and to excel not only in the arts of war, but in those of composition. His epistle to the Senate and people of Athens seems to have been dictated by an elegant enthusiasm, which prompted him to submit his actions and motives to the degenerate Athenians of his own times, with the same humble deference as if he had been pleading in the days of Aristides before the tribunal of the Areopagus. His application to the Senate of Rome, which was still permitted to bestow the titles of imperial power, was agreeable to the forms of the expiring republic. An assembly was summoned by Tertullius, prefect of the city. The epistle of Julian was read, and as he appeared to be the master of Italy, his claims were admitted without a dissenting voice. His oblique censure of the innovations of Constantine, and his passionate invective against the vices of Constantius, were heard with less satisfaction, and the Senate, as if Julian had been present, unanimously exclaimed, Respect, we beseech you, the author of your own fortune an artful expression, which, according to the chance of war, might be differently explained as a manly reproof of the ingratitude of the usurper, or as a flattering confession that a single act of such benefit to the state ought to atone for all the failings of Constantius. The intelligence of the march and rapid progress of Julian was speedily transmitted to his rival, who, by the retreat of Sapor, had obtained some respite from the Persian war. 
disguising the anguish of his soul under the semblance of contempt, Constantius professed his intention of returning into Europe and of giving chase to Julian, for he never spoke of this military expedition in any other light than that of a hunting party. In the camp of Heriopolis in Syria, he communicated this design to his army, slightly mentioned the guilt and rashness of the Caesar, and ventured to assure them that, if the mutineers of Gaul presumed to meet them in the field, they would be unable to sustain the fire of their eyes and the irresistible weight of the shout of their onset. The speech of the emperor was received with military applause, and Theodotus, the president of the council of Heriopolis, requested with tears of adulation that his city might be adorned with the head of the vanquished rebel. The chosen detachment was dispatched away in post wagons to secure, if it were yet possible, the pass of Suchi, the recruits, the horses, the arms, and the magazines, which had been prepared against Sapor, were appropriated to the service of the civil war, and the domestic victories of Constantius inspired his partisans with the most sanguine assurances of success. The notary Gaudentius had occupied in his name the provinces of Africa. The substance of Rome was intercepted, and the distress of Julian was increased by an unexpected event, which might have been productive of fatal consequences. Julian had received the submission of two legions and a cohort of archers which were stationed at Sirmium, but he suspected, with reason, the fidelity of those troops which had been distinguished by the emperor, and it was thought expedient, under the pretense of the exposed state of the Gallic frontier, to dismiss them from the most important scene of action. They advanced, with reluctance, as far as the confines of Italy, but as they dreaded the length of the way and of the savage fierceness of the Germans, they resolved, by the instigation of one of their tribunes, to halt at Aquileia, to erect the banners of Constantius on the walls of that impregnable city. The vigilance of Julian perceived at once the extent of the mischief and the necessity of applying an immediate remedy. By his order, Jovinus led back a part of the army into Italy, and the siege of Aquileia was formed with diligence and prosecuted with vigor. But the legionaries, who seemed to have rejected the yoke of discipline, conducted the defense of the place with skill and perseverance, invited the rest of Italy to imitate the example of their courage and loyalty, and threatened the retreat of Julian, if he should be forced to yield to the superior numbers of the armies of the East. But the humanity of Julian was preserved from the cruel alternative which he pathetically laments of destroying or of being himself destroyed, and the seasonal death of Constantius delivered the Roman Empire from the calamities of civil war. The approach of winter could not detain the monarch at Antioch and his favorites durst not oppose his impatient desire of revenge. A slight fever, which was perhaps occasioned by the agitation of his spirits, was increased by the fatigues of the journey, and Constantius was obliged to halt at the little town of Maxurene, twelve miles beyond Tarsus, where he expired, after a short illness, in the forty-fifth year of his age, and the twenty-fourth of his reign. His genuine character, which was composed of pride and weakness, of superstition and cruelty, has been fully displayed in the preceding narrative of civil and ecclesiastical events. The long abuse of power rendered him a considerable object in the eyes of his contemporaries. But, as personal merit can alone deserve the notice of posterity, the last of the sons of Constantine may be dismissed from the world with the remark that he had inherited the defects without the abilities of his father. Before Constantius expired, he is said to have named Julian for his successor, nor does it seem improbable that his anxious concern for the fate of a young and tender wife, whom he left with child, may have prevailed in his last moments over the harsher passions of hatred and revenge. Eusebius and his guilty associates made a faint attempt to prolong the reign of the eunuchs by the election of another emperor, but their intrigues were rejected with disdain by an army which now abhorred the thought of a civil war and two officers of rank were instantly dispatched to assure Julian that every sword in the empire would be drawn for his service. The military designs of that prince, who had formed three different attacks against Thrace, were prevented by this fortunate event. Without shedding the blood of his fellow citizens, he escaped the dangers of a doubtful conflict, and acquired the advantages of a complete victory. Impatient to visit the place of his birth, and the new capital of the empire, he advanced from Nisus through the mountains of Hymus and the cities of Thrace. When he reached Heraclea, at the distance of sixty miles, all Constantinople was poured forth to receive him, and he made his triumphal entry amidst the dutiful acclamations of the soldiers, the people, and the senate. And innumerable multitude pressed around him with eager respect, and were perhaps disappointed when they beheld the small stature and simple garb of a hero, who 
whose inexperienced youth had vanquished the barbarians of Germany, and who had now traversed, in a successful career, the whole continent of Europe, from the shores of the Atlantic to those of the Bosphorus. A few days afterwards, when the remains of the deceased emperor were landed in the harbor, the subjects of Julian applauded the real or affected humanity of their sovereign. On foot, without his diadem, and clothed in a mourning habit, he accompanied the funeral as far as the Church of the Holy Apostles, where the body was deposited, and if these remarks of respect may be interpreted as a selfish tribute to the birth and dignity of his imperial kinsmen, the tears of Julian professed to the world that he had forgotten the injuries, and remembered only the obligations which he had received from Constantius. As soon as the legions of Aquileia were assured of the death of the emperor, they opened the gates of the city, and, by the sacrifice of their guilty leaders, obtained an easy pardon from the prudence or lenity of Julian, who, in the thirty-second year of his age, acquired the undisputed possession of the Roman Empire. End of chapter 22, part 2「Philosophy had instructed Julian to compare the advantages of action and retirement, but the elevation of his birth and the accidents of his life never allowed him the freedom of choice. He might perhaps sincerely have preferred the groves of the academy and the society of Athens, but he was constrained, at first by the will and afterwards by the injustice of Constantius, to expose his person and fame to the dangers of imperial greatness, and to make himself accountable to the world and to posterity for the happiness of millions. Julian recollected with terror the observation of his master Plato, that the government of our flocks and herds is always committed to beings of a superior species and that the conduct of nations requires and deserves the celestial power of the gods, or of the genie. From this principle, he justly concluded that the man who presumes to reign should aspire to the perfection of the divine nature, that he should purify his soul from her mortal and terrestrial part, and that he should extinguish his appetites, enlighten his understanding, regulate his passions, and subdue the wild beast which, according to the lively metaphor of Aristotle, seldom fails to ascend the throne of a despot. The throne of Julian, which the death of Constantius fixed on an independent basis, was the seat of reason, of virtue, and perhaps of vanity. He despised the honors, renounced the pleasures, and discharged with incessant diligence the duties of his exalted station. And there were few among his subjects who would have consented to relieve him from the weight of the diadem, had they been obliged to submit their time and their actions to the rigorous laws which their philosophic emperor imposed on himself. One of his most intimate friends, who had often shared the frugal simplicity of his table, has remarked that his light and sparing diet, which was usually of the vegetable kind, left his mind and body free and active for the various and important businesses of an author, a pontiff, a magistrate, a general, and a prince. In one in the same day he gave audience to several ambassadors, and wrote or dictated a great number of letters to his generals, his civil magistrates, his private friends, and the different cities of his dominions. He listened to the memorials which had been received, considered the subject of the petitions, and signified his intentions more rapidly than could be taken in shorthand by the diligence of his secretaries. He possessed such flexibility of thought, and such firmness of attention, that he could employ his hand to write, his ear to listen, and his voice to dictate, and pursue at once three several trains of ideas without hesitation and without error. While his ministers reposed, the prince flew with agility from one labor to another, and after a hasty dinner, retired into his library till the public business which he had appointed for the evening summoned him to interrupt the prosecution of his studies. The supper of the emperor was still less substantial than the former meal. His sleep was never clouded by the fumes of indigestion, and, except in the short interval of a marriage, which was the effect of policy rather than love, the chaste Julian never shared his bed with a female companion. He was soon awakened by the entrance of fresh secretaries, who had slept the preceding day, and his servants were obliged to wait alternately, while their indefatigable master allowed himself scarcely any other refreshment than the change of occupations. The predecessors of Julian, his uncle, his brother, and his cousin, 
indulged their puerile taste for the games of the circus, under the specious pretense of complying with the inclinations of the people, and they frequently remained the greatest part of the day as idle spectators, and as a part of the splendid spectacle, till the ordinary round of twenty-four races was completely finished. On solemn festivals, Julian, who felt and professed an unfashionable dislike to these frivolous amusements, condescended to appear in the circus, and after bestowing a careless glance on five or six of the races, he hastily withdrew with the impatience of a philosopher, who considered every moment as lost that was not devoted to the advantage of the public or the improvement of his own mind. By this avarice of time, he seemed to protract the short duration of his reign, and if the dates were less securely ascertained, we should refuse to believe that only sixteen months elapsed between the death of Constantius and the departure of his successor for the Persian War. The actions of Julian can only be preserved by the care of the historian, but the portion of his voluminous writings which are still extant remains as a monument of the application as well as the genius of the emperor. The Misopogon, the Caesars, several of his orations, and his elaborate work against the Christian religion were composed in the long nights of the two winters, the former of which he passed at Constantinople, and the latter at Antioch. The reformation of the imperial court was one of the first and most necessary acts of the government of Julian. Soon after his entrance into the palace of Constantinople, he had occasion for the service of a barber. An officer, magnificently dressed, immediately presented himself. It is a barber, exclaimed the prince with effective surprise, that I want, not the receiver general of the finances. He questioned the man concerning the profits of his employment, and was informed that, besides a large salary and some valuable perquisites, he enjoyed a daily allowance for twenty servants and as many horses. A thousand barbers, a thousand cupbearers, a thousand cooks were distributed in the several offices of luxury, and the number of eunuchs could be compared only with the insects of a summer's day. The monarch who resigned to his subjects the superiority of merit and virtue was distinguished by the oppressive magnificence of his dress, his table, his buildings, and his train. The stately palaces erected by Constantine and his sons were decorated with many-colored marbles and ornaments of massy gold. The most exquisite dainties were procured to gratify their pride rather than their taste. Birds of the most distant climates, fish from the most remote seas, fruits out of their natural season, winter roses, and summer snows. The domestic crowd of the palace surpassed the expense of the legions, yet the smallest part of this costly multitude was subservient to the use, or even to the splendor of the throne. The monarch was disgraced, and the people was injured, by the creation and sale of an infinite number of obscure and even titular appointments, and the most worthless of mankind might purchase the privilege of being maintained without the necessity of labor from the public revenue. The waste of an enormous household, the increase of fees and perquisites, which were soon claimed as a lawful debt, and the bribes which they extorted from those who feared their enmity or solicited their favor, suddenly enriched these haughty menials. They abused their fortune without considering their past or their future condition, and their rapine and venality could be equaled only by the extravagance of their dissipations. Their silken robes were embroidered with gold, their tables were served with delicacy and profusion. The houses which they built for their own use would have covered the farm of an ancient consul, and the most honorable citizens were obliged to dismount from their horses and respectfully to salute an eunuch whom they met on the public highway. The luxury of the palace excited the contempt and indignation of Julian, who usually slept on the ground, who yielded with reluctance to the indispensable cause of nature, and who placed his vanity not in emulating but in despising the pomp of royalty. By the total extirpation of a mischief which was magnified even beyond its real extent, he was impatient to relieve the distress and to appease the murmurs of the people, who support with less uneasiness the weight of taxes if they are convinced that the fruits of their industry are appropriated to the service of the state. But in the execution of this salutary work, Julian is accused of proceeding with too much haste and inconsiderable severity. By a single edict, he reduced the palace of Constantinople to an immense desert, and dismissed with ignominy the whole train of slaves and dependents, without providing any just or at least benevolent exceptions for the age, the services, or the poverty of the faithful domestics of the imperial family. Such indeed was the temper of Julian, who seldom recollected the fundamental maxim of Aristotle, that true virtue was placed at an equal distance between the opposite vices. 
the splendid and effeminate dress of the Asiatics, the curls and paint, the collars and bracelets, which appeared so ridiculous in the person of Constantine, were constantly rejected by his philosophic successor. But, with the fopperies, Julian affected to renounce the decencies of dress, and seemed to value himself for his neglect of the laws of cleansiness. In a satirical performance, which was designed for the public eye, the emperor descants with pleasure, and even with pride, on the length of his nails, and the inky blackness of his hands, and protests that, although the greatest part of his body was covered with hair, the use of the razor was confined to his head alone, and celebrates with visible complacency this shaggy and populous beard, which he fondly, which he fondly cherished, after the example of the philosophers of Greece. Had Julian consulted the simple dictates of reason, the first magistrate of the Romans would have scorned the affectation of Diogenes, as well as that of Darius. But the work of public reformation would have remained imperfect if Julian had only corrected the abuses without punishing the crimes of his predecessor's reign. We are now delivered, says he, in a familiar letter to one of his intimate friends. We are now surprisingly delivered from the voracious jaws of the Hydra. I do not mean to apply that epithet to my brother Constantius. He is no more. May the earth lie light on his head. But his artful and cruel favorites studied to deceive and exasperate a prince, whose natural mildness cannot be praised without some efforts of adulation. It is not, however, my intention that even those men should be oppressed. They are accused, and they shall enjoy the benefit of a fair and impartial trial. To conduct this inquiry, Julian named six judges of the highest rank in the state and army, and as he wished to escape the reproach of condemning his personal enemies, he fixed this extraordinary tribunal at Chalcedon, on the Asiatic side of the Bosphorus and transferred to the commissioners an absolute power to pronounce and execute their final sentence without delay and without appeal. The office of president was exercised by the venerable prefect of the East, a second Sallust, whose virtues conciliated the esteem of Greek sophists and of Christian bishops. He was assisted by the eloquent Mamertinus, one of the consuls elect, whose merit is loudly celebrated by the doubtful evidence of his own applause. But the civil wisdom of two magistrates was overbalanced by the ferocious violence of four generals, Nevita, Agilo, Jovinus, and Arbetio. Arbetio, whom the public would have seen with less surprise at the bar than on the bench, was supposed to possess the secret of the commission. The armed and angry letters of the Jovian and Herculean bands encompassed the tribunal, and the judges were alternately swayed by the laws of justice and by the clamors of faction. The chamberlain Eusebius, who had so long abused the favor of Constantius, expiated by an ignominious death the insolence, the corruption, and cruelty of his servile reign. The executions of Paul and Apodemius, the former of whom was burnt alive, were accepted as an inadequate atonement by the widows and orphans of so many hundred Romans whom those legal tyrants had betrayed and murdered. But justice herself, if we may use the pathetic expression of Ammianus, appeared to weep over the fate of Ursulus, the treasurer of the empire, and his blood accused the ingratitude of Julian, whose distress had been seasonably relieved by the intrepid liberality of that honest minister. The rage of the soldiers, whom he had provoked by his indiscretion, was the cause and excuse of his death, and the emperor, deeply wounded by his own reproaches and those of the public, offered some consolation to the family of Ursulus by the restitution of his confiscated fortunes. Before the end of the year, in which they had been adorned with the ensigns of the prefecture and consulship, Taurus and Florentius were reduced to implore the clemency of the inexorable tribunal of Chalcedon. The former was banished to Vercelli in Italy, and a sentence of death was pronounced against the latter. A wise prince should have rewarded the crime of Tarsus, the faithful minister, when he was no longer able to oppose the progress of a rebel, had taken refuge in the court of his benefactor and his lawful sovereign. But the guilt of Florentius justified the severity of the judges, and his escape served to display the magnanimity of Julian, who nobly checked the interested vigilance of an informer, and refused to learn what place concealed the wretched fugitive from his just resentment. Some months after the tribunal of Chalcedon had been dissolved, the Praetorian vice-regent of Africa, the notary Gaudentius, and Artemius, the duke of Egypt, were executed at Antioch. Artemius had reigned the cruel and corrupt tyrant of a great province. Gaudentius had long practiced the arts of calumny against the innocent, the virtuous, and even the person of Julian himself. Yet the circumstances of their trial and condemnation were so unskillfully managed 
that these wicked men obtained, in the public opinion, the glory of suffering for the obstinate loyalty with which they had supported the cause of Constantius. The rest of his servants were protected by a general act of oblivion, and they were left to enjoy with impunity the bribes which they had accepted either to defend the oppressed or to oppress the friendless. This measure, which, on the soundest principles of policy, may deserve our approbation, was executed in a manner which seemed to degrade the majesty of the throne. Julian was tormented by the importunities of a multitude, particularly of Egyptians, who loudly redemanded the gifts which they had imprudently or illegally bestowed. He foresaw the endless prosecution of vexatious suits, and he engaged a promise, which ought always to have been sacred, that if they would repair to Chalcedon, he would meet them in person, to hear and determine their complaints. But as soon as they were landed, he issued an absolute order, which prohibited the watermen from transporting any Egyptian to Constantinople, and thus detained his disappointed clients on the Asiatic shore, till, their patience and money being utterly exhausted, they were obliged to return with indignant murmurs to their native country. End of chapter 22, part 3《Chapter 22, Part 4 of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Part 4. — This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The numerous army of spies, of agents, and informers enlisted by Constantius to secure the repose of one man and to interrupt that of millions was immediately disbanded by his generous successor. Julian was slow in his suspicions, and gentle in his punishments, and his contempt of treason was the result of judgment, of vanity, and of courage. Conscious of superior merit, he was persuaded that few among his subjects would dare to meet him in the field, to attempt his life, or even to seat themselves on his vacant throne. The philosopher could excuse the hasty sallies of discontent, and the hero could despise the ambitious projects which surpassed the fortune or the abilities of the rash conspirators. A citizen of Ankara, had prepared for his own use a purple garment, and this indiscreet action, which, under the reign of Constantius, would have been considered as a capital offense, was reported to Julian by the officious importunity of a private enemy. The monarch, after making some inquiry into the rank and character of his rival, dispatched the informer with a present of a pair of purple slippers to complete the magnificence of his imperial habit. A more dangerous, dangerous conspiracy was formed by ten of the domestic guards, who had resolved to assassinate Julian in the field of exercise near Antioch. Their intemperance revealed their guilt, and they were conducted in chains to the presence of their injured sovereign, who, after a lively representation of the wickedness and folly of their enterprise, instead of a death of torture, which they deserved and expected, pronounced a sentence of exile against the two principal offenders. The only instance in which Julian seemed to depart from his accustomed clemency was the execution of a rash youth, who, with a feeble hand, had aspired to seize the reins of empire. But that youth was the son of Marcellus, the general of cavalry, who, in the first campaign of the Gallic War, had deserted the standard of the Caesar and the Republic. Without appearing to indulge his personal resentment, Julian might easily confound the crime of the son and of the father. But he was reconciled by the distress of Marcellus, and the liberality of the emperor endeavored to heal the wound which had been inflicted by the hand of justice. Julian was not insensible to the advantages of freedom. From his studies he had imbibed the spirit of ancient sages and heroes. His life and fortunes had depended on the caprice of a tyrant, and when he ascended the throne, his pride was sometimes mortified by the reflection that the slaves, who would not dare to censure his defects, were not worthy to applaud his virtues. He sincerely abhorred the system of oriental despotism, which Diocletian, Constantine, and the patient habits of fourscore years had established in the empire. A motive of superstition prevented the execution of the design which Julian had frequently meditated, of relieving his head from the weight of a costly diadem. But he absolutely refused the title of Dominus, or Lord, a word which had grown so familiar to the ears of the Romans that they no longer remembered its servile and humiliating origin. The office, or rather the name of consul, was cherished by a prince, who contemplated with reverence the ruins of the Republic. And the same behavior which had been assumed by the prudence of Augustus was adopted by Julian from choice and inclination. On the calends of January, 
at break of day, the new consuls, Mamertinus and Nevita, hastened to the palace to salute the emperor. As soon as he was informed of their approach, he, le he leaped from his throne, eagerly advanced to meet them, and compelled the blushing magistrates to receive the demonstrations of his affected humility. From the palace they proceeded to the senate. The emperor, on foot, marched before their litters, and the gazing multitude admired the image of ancient times, or secretly blamed a conduct which, in their eyes, degraded the majesty of the purple. But the behavior of Julian was uniformly supported. During the games of the circus, he had, imprudently or designedly, performed the manumission of a slave in the presence of the consul. The moment he was reminded that he had trespassed on the jurisdiction of another magistrate, he condemned himself to pay a fine of ten pounds of gold, and embraced this public occasion of declaring to the world that he was subject, like the rest of his fellow citizens, to the laws, and even to the forms of the Republic. The spirit of his administration, and his regard for his nativity, induced Julian to confer on the Senate of Constantinople the same honors, privileges, and authority which were still enjoined by the Senate of ancient Rome. A legal fiction was introduced and gradually established that one half of the National Council had migrated to the East, and the despotic successors of Julian, accepting the title of senators, acknowledged themselves the members of a respectable body which was permitted to represent the majesty of the Roman name. From Constantinople, the attention of the monarch was extended to the municipal senates of the provinces. He abolished, by repeated edicts, the unjust and pernicious exemptions which had withdrawn so many idle citizens from the service of their country, and by imposing an equal distribution of public duties, he restored the strength, the splendor, or, according to the glowing ex expression of Libanius, the soul of the expiring cities of his empire. The venerable age of Greece excited the most tender compassion in the mind of Julian, which kindled into rapture when he recollected the gods, the heroes, and the men superior to heroes and to gods, who had bequeathed to the latest posterity the monuments of their genius, or the examples of their virtues. He relieved the distress and restored the beauty of the cities of Epirus and Peloponnesus. Athens acknowledged him at, for her benefactor, Argos for her deliverer. The pride of Corinth, again arising from her ruins with the honors of a Roman colony, exacted a tribute from the adjacent republics for the purpose of defraying the games of the Isthmus, which were celebrated in the amphitheater along with the hunting of bears and panthers. From this tribute, the cities of Elis, of Delphi, and of Argos, which had inherited from their remote ancestors the sacred office of perpetuating the Olympic, the Pythian, and the Nemean games, claimed the just exemption. The immunity of Elis and Delphi was respected by the Corinthians, but the poverty of Argos tempted the insolence of oppression, and the feeble complaints of its deputies were silenced by the decree of a provincial magistrate, who seems to have consulted only the interest of the capital in which he resided. Seven years after this sentence, Julian allowed the cause to be referred to a superior tribunal, and his eloquence was interposed, most probably with success, in the defense of a city which had been the royal seat of Agamemnon, and which had given to Macedonia a race of kings and conquerors. The laborious administration of military and civil affairs, which were multiplied in proportion to the extent of the empire, exercised the abilities of Julian, but he frequently assumed the two characters of orator and of judge, which are almost unknown to the modern sovereigns of Europe. The arts of persuasion, so diligently cultivated by the first Caesars, were neglected by the military ignorance and Asiatic pride of their successors, and if they condescended to harangue the soldiers, whom they feared, they treated with silent disdain the senators, whom they despised. The assemblies of the Senate, which Constantius had avoided, were considered by Julian as the place where he could exhibit, with the most propriety, the maxims of a republic and the talents of a rhetorician. He alternately practiced, as in a school of declamation, the several modes of praise, of censure, of exhortation. And his friend, Libanius, had remarked, has remarked that the study of Homer taught him to imitate the simple, concise style of Menelaus, the copiousness of Nestor, whose words descended like the flakes of a winter's snow, or the pathetic and forcible eloquence of Ulysses. The functions of a judge, which are sometimes incompatible with those of a prince, were exercised by Julian not only as a duty, but as an amusement. And although he might have trusted the integrity and discernment of his praetorian prefix, he often placed himself by their side on the seat of judgment. 
the acute penetration of his mind was agreeably occupied in detecting and defeating the chicanery of the advocates, who labored to disguise the truth of facts and to pervert the sense of the laws. He sometimes forgot the gravity of his station, asked indiscreet or unseasonable questions, and betrayed, by the loudness of his voice and the agitation of his body, the earnest venomance with which he maintained his opinions against the judges, the advocates, and their clients. But his knowledge of his own temper prompted him to encourage, and even to solicit, the reproof of his friends and ministers, and whenever they ventured to oppose the irregular sallies of his passions, the spectators could observe the shame as well as the gratitude of their monarch. The decrees of Julian were almost always founded on the principles of justice, and he had the firmness to resist the two most dangerous temptations which assault the tri tribunal of a sovereign under the specious forms of compassion and equity. He decided the merits of the cause without weighing the circumstances of the parties, and the poor, whom he wished to relieve, were condemned to satisfy the just demands of a noble and wealthy adversary. He carefully distinguished the judge from the legislator, and though he meditated a necessary reformation of the Roman jurisprudence, he pronounced sentence according to the strict and literal interpretation of those laws which the magistrates were bound to execute and the subjects to obey. The generality of princes, if they were stripped of their purple and cast naked into the world, would immediately sink to the lowest ranks of society without a hope of emerging from their obscurity. But the personal merit of Julian was, in some measure, independent of his fortune. Whatever had been his choice of life, by the force of intrepid courage, lively wit, and intense application, he would have obtained, or at least he would have deserved, the highest honors of his profession, and Julian might have raised himself to the rank of minister or general of the state in which he was born a private citizen. If the jealous caprice of power had disappointed his expectations, if he had prudently declined the paths of greatness, the employment of the same talents and studious solitude would have placed beyond the reach of kings his present happiness and his immortal fame. When we, when we expect with minute, or perhaps with malevolent attention, the portrait of Julian, something seems wanting to the grace and perfection of the whole figure. His genius was less powerful and sublime than that of Caesar, nor did he possess the consummate prudence of Augustus. The virtues of Trajan appear more steady and natural, and the philosophy of Marcus is more simple and consistent. Yet Julian sustained ad adversity with firmness, and prosperity with moderation. After an interval of 120 years after the death of Alexander Severus, the Romans beheld an emperor who made no distinction between his duties and his pleasures, who labored to relieve the distress and to revive the spirit of his subjects, and who endeavored always to connect authority with merit and happiness with virtue. Even faction, and religious faction, was constrained to acknowledge the superiority of his genius in peace as well as in war, and to confess with a sigh that the apostate Julian was a lover of his country, and that he deserved the empire of the world. End of chapter 22, part 4. Chapter 23, part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 23. The Religion of Julian. Universal Toleration. He Attempts to Restore and Reform the Pagan Worship. To Rebuild the Temple of Jerusalem. His Artful Persecution of the Christians. Mutual Zeal and Injustice. The character of apostate has injured the reputation of Julian and the enthusiasm which clouded his virtues has exaggerated the real and apparent magnitude of his faults. Our partial ignorance may represent him as a philosophic monarch who studied to protect, with an equal hand, the religious factions of the empire, and to allay the theological fever which had inflamed the minds of the people from the edicts of Diocletian to the exile of Athanasius. A more accurate view of the character and conduct of Julian will remove this favorable prepossession for a prince who did not escape the general contagion of the times. We enjoy the singular advantage of comparing the pictures which have been delineated by his fondest admirers and his implacable enemies. The actions of Julian are faithfully related by a judicious and candid historian, the impartial spectator of his life and death. 
The unanimous evidence of his contemporaries is confirmed by the public and private declarations of the emperor himself, and his various writings express the uniform tenor of his religious sentiments, which policy would have prompted him to dissemble rather than to affect. A devout and sincere attachment for the gods of Athens and Rome constituted the ruling passion of Julian. The powers of an enlightened understanding were betrayed and corrupted by the influence of superstitious prejudice, and the phantoms which existed only in the mind of the emperor had a real and pernicious effect on the government of the empire. The venomous zeal of the Christians who despised the worship and overturned the altars of those fabulous deities engaged their votary in a state of irreconcilable hostility with a very numerous party of his subjects, and he was sometimes tempted by the desire of victory or the shame of a repulse to violate the laws of prudence and even of justice. The triumph of the party which he deserted and opposed has fixed a stain of infamy on the name of Julian, and the unsuccessful apostate has been overwhelmed with a torrent of pious invectives of which the signal was given by the sonorous trumpet of Gregory Nazianzen. The interesting nature of the events which were crowded into the short reign of this active emperor deserves a just and circumstantial narrative. His motives, his counsels, and his actions, as far as they are connected with the history of religion, will be the subject of the present chapter. The cause of his strange and fatal apostasy may be derived from the early period of his life when he was left an orphan in the hands of the murderers of his family. The names of Christ and of Constantius, the ideas of slavery and of religion, were soon associated in a youthful imagination which was susceptible to the most lively impressions. The care of his infancy was entrusted to Eusebius, bishop of Nicomedia, who was related to him on the side of his mother, until Julian reached the twentieth year of his age, he received from his Christian preceptors the education not of a hero, but of a saint. The emperor, less jealous of a heavenly than of an earthly crown, contented himself with the imperfect character of a catechumen, while he bestowed the advantages of baptism on the nephews of Constantine. They were even admitted to the inferior offices of the ecclesiastical order, and Julian publicly read the holy scriptures in the church of Nicomedia. The study of religion, which they assiduously cultivated, appeared to produce the fairest fruits of faith and devotion. They prayed, they fasted, they distributed the alms to the poor, gifts to the clergy, and oblations to the tombs of the martyrs. And the splendid monument of St. Mamus at Caesarea was erected, or at least was undertaken, by the joint labor of Gallus and Julian. They respectfully conversed with the bishops who were eminent for superior sanctity and solicited the benediction of the monks and hermits who had introduced into Cappadocia the voluntary hardships of the ascetic life. As the two princes advanced towards the years of manhood, they discovered in their religious sentiments the difference of their characters. The dull and obstinate understanding of Gallus embraced, with implicit zeal, the doctrines of Christianity, which never influenced his conduct or moderated his passions. The mild disposition of the younger brother, was less repugnant to the precepts of the gospel, and his active curiosity might have been gratified by a theological system which explains the mysterious essence of the deity and opens the boundless prospect of invisible and future worlds. But the independent spirit of Julian refused to yield the passive and unresisting obedience which was required in the name of religion by the haughty ministers of the church. Their speculative opinions were imposed as positive laws, and guarded by the terrors of eternal punishments. But while they prescribed the rigid formulary of the thoughts, the words, and the actions of the young prince, whilst they silenced his objections and severely checked the freedom of his inquiries, they secretly provoked his impatient genius to disclaim the authority of his ecclesiastical guides. He was educated in the Lesser Asia amidst the scandals of the Arian controversy. The fierce conduct of the Eastern bishops, the incessant alterations of their creeds, and the profane motives which appeared to actuate their conduct insensibly strengthened the prejudice of Julian that they neither understood nor believed the religion for which they so fiercely contended. Instead of listening to the proofs of Christianity with that favorable attention which adds weight to the most respectable evidence, he heard with suspicion and disputed with obstinacy and acuteness the doctrines for which he had already entertained an invincible aversion. 
whenever the young princes were directed to compose declamations on the subject of the prevailing controversies, Julian always declared himself the advocate of paganism, under the specious excuse that, in the defense of the weaker cause, his learning and ingenuity might be more advantageously exercised and displayed. As soon as Gallus was invested with the honors of the purple, Julian was permitted to breathe the air of freedom, of literature, and of paganism. The crowd of sophists who were attracted by the taste and liberality of the royal pupil had formed a strict alliance between the learning and the religion of Greece, and the poems of Homer, instead of being admired as the original productions of human genius, were seriously ascribed to the heavenly inspiration of Apollo and the Muses. The deities of Olympus, as they are painted by the immortal bard, imprint themselves on the minds which are the least addicted to superstitious credulity. Our familiar knowledge of their names and characters, their forms and attributes, seem to bestow on those airy beings a real and substantial existence, and the pleasing enchantment produces an imperfect and momentary assent of the imagination to those fables which are the most repugnant to our reason and experience. In the age of Julian, every circumstance contributed to prolong and fortify the illusion. The magnificent temples of Greece and Asia, the works of those artists who had expressed, in painting or in sculpture, the divine conceptions of the poet, the pomp of festivals and sacrifices, the successful arts of divination, the popular traditions of oracles and prodigies, and the ancient practice of two thousand years. The weakness of polytheism was, in some measure, excused by the moderation of its claims, and the devotion of the pagans was not incompatible with the most licentious skepticism. Instead of an indivisible and regular system, which occupies the whole extent of the believing mind, the mythology of the Greeks was composed of a thousand loose and flexible parts, and the servant of the gods was at liberty to define the degree and measure of his religious faith. The creed which Julian adopted for his own use was of the largest dimensions, and by a strange contradiction he disdained the salutary yoke of the gospel, whilst he made a voluntary offering of his reason on the altars of Jupiter and Apollo. One of the orations of Julian is consecrated to the honor of Sibylle, the mother of the gods, who required from her effeminate priests the bloody sacrifice so rashly performed by the madness of the Phrygian boy. The pious emperor condescends to relate, without a blush and without a smile, the voyage of the goddess from the shores of Pergamus to the mouth of the Tiber, and the stupendous miracle which convinced the senate and people of Rome that the lump of clay which their ambassadors had transported over the seas was endowed with life and sentiment and divine power. For the truth of this prodigy, he appeals to the public monuments of the city and the censures with some acrimony, the sickly and affected taste of those men who impertinently derided the sacred traditions of their ancestors. But the devout philosopher, who sincerely embraced and warmly encouraged the superstition of the people, reserved for himself the privilege of the liberal interpretation, and silently withdrew from the foot of the altars into the sanctuary of the temple. The extravagance of the Grecian mythology proclaimed, with a clear and audible voice, that the pious inquirer, instead of being scandalized or satisfied with the literal sense, should diligently explore the occult wisdom, which had been disguised by the prudence of antiquity under the mask of folly and of fable. The philosophers of the Platonic school, Plotinus, Porphyry, and the divine Iamblichus, were admired as the most skillful masters of this allegorical science, which labored to soften and to harmonize the deformed features of paganism. Julian himself, who was directed in the mysterious pursuit by Adesius, the venerable successor of Iamblichus, aspired to the possession of a treasure which he esteemed, if we may credit his solemn asseverations, far above the empire of the world. It was indeed a treasure which derived its value only from opinion, and every artist who flattered himself that he had extracted the precious ore from the surrounding dross claimed an equal right of stamping the name and figure most agreeable to his peculiar fancy. The fable of Attis and Sibylle had already been explained by Porphyry, but his labors served only to animate the pious industry of Julian, who invented and published his own allegory of that ancient and mystic tale. This freedom of interpretation, which might gratify the pride of the Platonists, exposed the vanity of their art. Without a tedious detail, the modern reader cannot form a just idea of the strange allusions 
the forced entomologies, the solemn trifling, and the impenetrable obscurity of these sages who profess to reveal the system of the universe. As the traditions of pagan mythology were variously related, the sacred interpreters were at liberty to select the most convenient circumstances, and as they translated an arbitrary cipher, they could extract from any fable any sense which was adapted to their favorite system of religion and philosophy. The lascivious form of a naked Venus was tortured into the discovery of some moral precept or some physical truth, and the castration of Attis explained the revolution of the sun between the tropics, or the separation of the human soul from vice and error. The theological system of Julian appears to have contained the sublime and important principles of natural religion, but as the faith was not founded on revelation, must be destitute of any firm assurance. The disciple of Plato imprudently relapsed into the habits of vulgar superstition, and the popular and philosophic notion of the deity seems to have been confounded in the practice, the writings, and even in the mind of Julian. The pious emperor acknowledged and adored the eternal cause of the universe, to whom he ascribed all the perfections of an infinite nature, invisible to the eyes and inaccessible to the understanding of feeble mortals. The supreme God had created, or rather, in the Platonic language, had generated, the gradual succession of dependent spirits, of gods, of diamonds, of heroes, and of men, and every being which derived its existence immediately from the first cause received the inherent gift of immortality. That so precious an advantage might not be lavished upon unworthy objects, the Creator had entrusted to the skill and power of the inferior beings the office of forming the human body and of arranging the beautiful harmony of the animal, the vegetable, and the mineral kingdoms. To the conduct of these divine ministers he delegated the temporal government of this lower world, but their imperfect administration is not exempt from discord or error. The earth and its inhabitants are divided among them, and the characters of Mars, of Minerva, of Mercury, or Venus may be distinctly traced in the laws and manners of their peculiar votaries. As long as our immortal souls are confined in a mortal prison, it is our interest, as well as our duty, to solicit the favor and deprecate the wrath of the powers of heaven, whose pride is gratified by the devotion of mankind, and whose grosser parts may be supposed to derive some nourishment from the fumes of sacrifice. The inferior gods might sometimes condescend to animate the statues and to inhabit the temples which were dedicated to their honor. They might occasionally visit the earth, but the heavens were the proper throne and symbol of their glory. The invariable order of the sun, moon, and stars was hastily admitted by Julian as a proof of their eternal duration, and their eternity was a sufficient evidence that they were the workmanship not of an inferior deity, but of the omnipotent king. In the system of the Platonists, the visible was a type of the invisible world. The celestial bodies, as they were informed by a divine spirit, might be considered as the objects most worthy of religious worship. The sun, whose genial influence pervades and sustains the universe, justly claimed the adoration of mankind, is the bright representative of the Logos, the lively, the rational, the beneficent image of the intellectual father. In every age, the absence of genuine inspiration is supplied by the strong illusions of enthusiasm and the mimic arts of imposture. If, in the time of Julian, these arts had been practiced only by the pagan priests for the support of an expiring cause, some indulgence might perhaps be allowed to the interest and habits of the sacerdotal character. But it may appear a subject of surprise and scandal that the philosophers themselves should have contributed to abuse the superstitious credulity of mankind, and that the Grecian mysteries should have been supported by the magic or theurgy of the modern Platonists. They arrogantly pretended to control the order of nature, to explore the secrets of futurity, to command the service of the inferior diamonds, to enjoy the view and conservation of the superior gods, and, by disengaging the soul from her material bands, to reunite that immortal particle with the infinite and divine spirit. The devout and fearless curiosity of Julian tempted the philosophers with the hopes of an easy conquest, which, from the situation of their young proselyte, might be productive of the most important consequences. 
Julian imbibed the first rudiments of the Platonic doctrines from the mouth of Idesius, who had fixed at Pergamus his wandering and persecuted school. But as the declining strength of that venerable sage was unequal to the ardor, the diligence, the rapid conception of his pupil, two of his most learned disciples, Chrysanthes and Eusebius, supplied at his own desire the place of their aged master. These philosophers seem to have prepared and distributed their respective parts. They artfully contrived, by dark hints and affected disputes, to excite the impatient hopes of the aspirant, till they delivered him into the hands of their associate, Maximus, the boldest and most skillful master of the theurgic science. By his hands, Julian was secretly initiated at Ephesus in the twentieth year of his age. His residence at Athens confirmed this unnatural alliance of philosophy and superstition. He obtained the privilege of a solemn initiation into the mysteries of Eleusis, which, amidst the general decay of the Grecian worship, still retained some vestiges of their primeval sanctity. And such was the zeal of Julian that he afterwards invited the Eleusinian pontiff to the court of Gaul for the sole purpose of consummating, by mystic rites and sacrifices, the great work of his sanctification. As these ceremonies were performed in the depth of caverns and in the silence of night, and as the inviolable secret of the mysteries was preserved by the discretion of the initiated, I shall not presume to describe the horrid sounds and fiery apparitions which were presented to the senses or the imagination of the credulous aspirant, till the visions of comfort and knowledge broke upon him in a blaze of celestial light. In the caverns of Ephesus and Eleusis, the mind of Julian was penetrated with sincere, deep, and unalterable enthusiasm. Though he might sometimes exhibit the vicissitudes of pious fraud and hypocrisy, which may be observed, or at least suspected, in the characters of the most conscientious fanatics. From that moment he consecrated his life to the service of the gods, and while the occupations of war, of government, and of study seemed to claim the whole measure of his time, a stated portion of the hours of the night was invariably reserved for the exercise of private devotion. The temperance which adorned the severe manners of the soldier and philosopher was connected with some strict and frivolous rules of religious abstinence, and it was honor of Pan, or Mercury, or Hectate, or Isis, that Julian, on particular days, denied himself the use of some particular food, which might have been offensive to his tutelar deities. By these voluntary fasts he prepared his senses and his understanding for the frequent and familiar visits with which he was honored by the celestial powers. Notwithstanding the modest silence of Julian himself, we may learn from his faithful friend, the orator Labanius, that he lived in a perpetual intercourse with the gods and goddesses, and they descended upon earth to enjoy the conversation of their favorite hero, that they gently interrupted his slumbers by touching his hand or his hair, that they warned him of every impending danger and conducted him by their infallible wisdom in every action of his life, and that he acquired such an intimate knowledge of his heavenly guests as readily to distinguish the voice of Jupiter from that of Minerva, and the form of Apollo from the figure of Hercules. These sleeping or waking visions, the ordinary effects of abstinence and fanaticism, would almost degrade the emperor to the level of an Egyptian monk. But the useless lives of Antony or Pacomius were consumed in these vain occupations. Julian can break from the dream of superstition to arm himself for battle, and after vanquishing in the field the enemies of Rome, he calmly retired into his tent to dictate the wise and salutary laws of an empire, or to indulge his genius in the elegant pursuits of literature and philosophy. The important secret of the apostasy of Julian was entrusted to the fidelity of the initiated, with whom he was united by the sacred ties of friendship and religion. The pleasing rumor was cautiously circulated among the adherents of the ancient worship, and his future greatness became the objects of the hopes, the prayers, and the predictions of the pagans in every province of the empire. From the zeal and virtues of the royal proselyte, they fondly expected the cure of every evil, and the restoration of every blessing, and instead of disapproving of the ardor of their pious wishes, Julian ingenuously confessed that he was ambitious to attain a situation in which he might be useful to his country and to his religion. But this religion was viewed with an hostile eye by the successor of Constantine, 
whose capricious passions alternately saved and threatened the life of Julian. The arts of magic and divination were strictly prohibited under a despotic government, which condescended to fear them, and if the pagans were reluctantly indulged in the exercise of their superstition, the rank of Julian would have exempted him from the general toleration. The apostate soon became the presumptive heir of the monarchy, and his death alone could have appeased the just apprehensions of the Christians. But the young prince, who aspired to the glory of a hero rather than of a martyr, consulted his safety by dissembling his religion, and the easy temper of polytheism permitted him to join in the public worship of a sect which he inwardly despised. Libanius has considered the hypocrisy of his friend as a subject not of censure, but of praise. As the statues of the gods, says the orator, which have been defiled with filth are again placed in a magnificent temple, so the beauty of truth was seated in the mind of Julian, after it had been purified from the errors and follies of his education. His sentiments were changed, but as it would have been dangerous to have avowed his sentiments, his conduct still continued the same. Very different from the ass in Aesop, who disguised himself with a lion's hide, our lion was obliged to conceal himself under the skin of an ass, and while he embraced the dictates of reason, to obey the laws of prudence and necessity. The dissimulation of Julian lasted above ten years, from his secret initiation at Ephesus to the beginning of the civil war, when he declared himself at once the implacable enemy of Christ and of Constantius. This state of constraint might contribute to strengthen his devotion, and as soon as he had satisfied the obligation of assisting on solemn festivals at the assemblies of the Christians, Julian returned with the impatience of a lover to burn his free and voluntary incense in the domestic chapels of Jupiter and Mercury. But as every act of dissimulation must be painful to an ingenuous spirit, the profession of Christianity increased the aversion of Julian for a religion which oppressed the freedom of his mind and compelled him to hold a conduct repugnant to the noblest attributes of the human nature, sincerity and courage. End of chapter 23, part 1. Chapter 23, part 2 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The inclination of Julian might prefer the gods of Homer and of the Scipios to the new faith which his uncle had established in the Roman Empire, and in which he himself had been sanctified by the sacrament of baptism. But, as a philosopher, it was incumbent on him to justify his descent from Christianity, which was supported by the number of its converts, by the chain of prophecy, the splendor of miracles, and the weight of evidence. The elaborate work which he composed amidst the preparations of the Persian War contained the substance of those arguments which he had long revolved in his mind. Some fragments have been transcribed and preserved by his adversary, the venomous Cyril of Alexandria, and they exhibit a very singular mixture of wit and learning, of sophistry and fanaticism. The elegance of the style and the rank of the author recommend his writings to the public attention, and in the impious list of the enemies of Christianity, the celebrated name of Porphyry, was effaced by the superior merit or reputation of Julian. The minds of the faithful were either seduced or scandalized or alarmed, and the pagans, who sometimes presumed to engage in the unequal dispute, derived from the popular work of their imperial missionary an inexhaustible supply of fallacious objections. But in the assiduous prosecution of these theological studies, the emperor of the Romans imbibed the illiberal prejudices, and passions of a polemic divine. He contracted an irrevocable obligation to maintain and propagate his religious opinions, and whilst he secretly applauded the strength and dexterity with which he wielded the weapons of controversy, he was tempted to distrust the sincerity or to despise the understandings of his antagonists, who could obstinately resist the force of reason and of eloquence. The Christians, who beheld with horror and indignation the apostasy of Julian, had much more to fear from his power than from his arguments. The pagans, who were conscious of his fervent zeal, expected, perhaps with impatience, that the flames of persecution should be immediately kindled against the enemies of the gods, 
and that the ingenious malice of Julian would invent some cruel refinements of death and torture, which had been unknown to the rude and inexperienced fury of his predecessors. But the hopes, as well as the fears of the religious factions, were apparently disappointed by the prudent humanity of a prince who was careful of his own fame, of the public peace, and of the rights of mankind. Instructed by history and by reflection, Julian was persuaded that, if the diseases of the body may sometimes be cured by salutary violence, neither steel nor fire could eradicate the erroneous opinions of the mind. The reluctant victim may be dragged to the foot of the altar, but the heart still abhors and disclaims the sacrilegious act of the hand. Religious obstinacy is hardened and exasperated by oppression, and, as soon as the persecution subsides, those who have yielded are restored as penitents, and those who have resisted are honored as saints and martyrs. If Julian adopted the unsuccessful cruelty of Diocletian and his colleagues, he was sensible that he would stain his memory with the name of tyrant, and add new glories to the Catholic Church, which had derived strength and increase from the severity of the pagan magistrates. Actuated by these motives, and apprehensive of disturbing the repose of an unsettled reign, Julian surprised the world by an edict which was not unworthy of a statesman or a philosopher. He extended to all the inhabitants of the Roman world the benefits of a free and equal toleration, and the only hardship which he inflicted on the Christians was to deprive them of the power of tormenting their fellow subjects, whom they stigmatized with the odious titles of idolaters and heretics. The pagans received a gracious permission, or rather an express order, to open all their temples and they were at once delivered from the oppressive laws and arbitrary vexations which they had sustained under the reign of Constantine and of his sons. At the same time, the bishops and clergy, who had been banished by the Arian monarch, were recalled from exile and restored to their respective churches. The Donatists, the Novatians, the Macedonians, and the Eunomians, and those who, with a more prosperous fortune, adhered to the doctrine of the Council of Nice. Julian, who understood and derided their theological disputes, invited to the palace the leaders of the hostile sects, that he might enjoy the agreeable spectacle of their furious encounters. The clamor of controversy sometimes provoked the emperor to exclaim, Hear me! The Franks have heard me, and the Alemanni! But he soon discovered that he was now engaged with the more obstinate and implacable enemies, and though he exerted the powers of oratory to persuade them to live in concord, or at least in peace, he was perfectly satisfied, before he dismissed them from his presence, that he had nothing to dread from the union of the Christians. The impartial Ammianus has ascribed this affected clemency to the desire of fomenting the intestine divisions of the church, and the insidious design of undermining the foundations of Christianity was inseparably connected with the zeal which Julian professed to restore the ancient religion of the empire. As soon as he ascended the throne, he assumed, according to the custom of his predecessors, the character of supreme pontiff, not only as the most honorable title of imperial greatness, but as a sacred and important office, the duties of which he was resolved to execute with pious diligence. As the business of the state prevented the emperor from joining every day in the public devotions of his subjects, he dedicated a domestic chapel to his tutelar deity, the sun. His gardens were filled with statues and altars of the gods and each apartment of the palace displayed the appearance of a magnificent temple. Every morning he saluted the parent of light with a sacrifice. The blood of another victim was shed at the moment when the sun sank below the horizon, and the moon, the stars, and the genie of the night received their respective and seasonable honors from the indefatigable devotion of Julian. On solemn festivals he regularly visited the temple of the god or goddess to whom the day was peculiarly consecrated and endeavored to excite the religion of the magistrates and people by the example of his own zeal. Instead of maintaining the lofty state of a monarch, distinguished by the splendor of his purple, and encompassed by the golden shields of his guards, Julian solicited, with respectful eagerness, the meanest offices which contributed to the worship of the gods. Amidst the sacred but licentious crowd of priests, of inferior ministers, and of female dancers, who were dedicated to the service of the temple, it was the business of the emperor to bring the wood to blow the fire, to handle the knife, to slaughter the victim, and of thrusting his bloody hands into the bowels of the expiring animal, to draw forth the heart or liver, and to read, with the consummate skill of a harjuspex, the imaginary signs of future events. 
The wisest of the pagans censured this extravagant superstition, which affected to despise the restraints of prudence and decency. Under the reign of a prince who practiced the rigid maxims of economy, the expense of religious worship consumed a very large portion of the revenue. A constant supply of the scarcest and most beautiful birds were transported from distant climates to bleed on the altars of the gods. A hundred oxen were frequently sacrificed by Julian on one and the same day, and it soon became a popular jest that if he should return with conquest from the Persian war, the breed of horned cattle must infallibly be extinguished. Yet this expense may appear inconsiderable when it is compared with the splendid presents which were offered either by the hand or by the order of the emperor to all the celebrated places of devotion in the Roman world, and with the sums allotted to repair and decorate the ancient temples which had suffered the silent decay of time, or the recent injuries of Christian rapine. Encouraged by the example, the exhortations, the liberality of their pious sovereign, the cities and families resumed the practice of their neglected ceremonies. Every part of the world, exclaims Libanius, with devout transport, displayed the triumph of religion and the grateful prospect of flaming altars, bleeding victims, the smoke of incense, and a solemn train of priests and prophets, without fear and without danger. The sound of prayer and of music was heard on the tops of the highest mountains, and the same ox afforded a sacrifice for the gods and a supper for their joyous votaries. But the genius and power of Julian were unequal to the enterprise of restoring a religion which was destitute of theological principles, of moral precepts, and of ecclesiastical discipline, which rapidly hastened to decay and dissolution, and was not susceptible to any solid or consistent reformation. The jurisdiction of the Supreme Pontiff, more especially after that office had been united with the imperial dignity, comprehended the whole extent of the Roman Empire. Julian named for his vicars in the several provinces the priests and philosophers whom he esteemed the best qualified to cooperate in the execution of his great design, and his pastoral letters, if we may use that name, still represent a very curious sketch of his wishes and intentions. He directs that in every city the sacerdotal order should be composed, without any distinction of birth or of fortune, of those persons who are most conspicuous for their love of the gods and of men. If they are guilty, continues he, of any scandalous offense, they should be censured or degraded by the superior pontiff. But as long as they retain their rank, they are entitled to the respect of the magistrates and people. Their humility may be shown in the plainness of their domestic garb, their dignity, in the pomp of holy vestments. When they are summoned in their turn to officiate before the altar, they ought not, during the appointed number of days, to depart from the precincts of the temple. Nor should a single day be suffered to elapse without the prayers and the sacrifice which they are obliged to offer for the prosperity of the state and of individuals. The exercise of their sacred functions requires an immaculate purity both of mind and body, and even when they are dismissed from the temple to the occupations of common life, it is incumbent on them to excel in decency and virtue the rest of their fellow citizens. The priest of the gods should never be seen in theaters or taverns. His conversation should be chaste, his diet temperate, his friends of honorable reputation. And if he sometimes visits the forum or the palace, he should appear only as the advocate of those who have vainly solicited either justice or mercy. His studies should be suited to the sanctity of his profession. Licentious tales or comedies or satires must be banished from his library, which ought solely to consist of historical and philosophical writings, of history, which is founded in truth, and of philosophy, which is connected with religion. The impious opinions of the Epicureans and skeptics deserve his abhorrence and contempt, but he should diligently study the systems of Pythagoras, of Plato, and of the Stoics, which unanimously teach that there are gods, that the world is governed by their providence, that their goodness is the source of every temporal blessing, and that they have prepared for the human soul a future state of reward or punishment. The imperial pontiff inculcates, in the most persuasive language, the duties of benevolence and hospitality, exhorts his inferior clergy to recommend the universal practice of those virtues, promises to assist their indigence from the public treasury, and declares his resolution of establishing hospitals in every city, where the poor should be received without any invidious distinction of country or of religion. Julian beheld with envy the wise and humane regulations of the church, 
and he very frankly confesses his intention to deprive the Christians of the applause, as well as the advantage which they had acquired by the exclusive practice of charity and beneficence. The same spirit of imitation might dispose the emperor to adopt several ecclesiastical institutions, the use and importance of which were approved by the success of his enemies. But if these imaginary plans of reformation had been realized, the forced and imperfect copy would have been less beneficial to paganism than honorable to Christianity. The Gentiles, who peacefully followed the customs of their ancestors, were rather surprised than pleased with the introduction of foreign manners, and in the short period of his reign, Julian had frequent occasions to complain of the want of fervor of his own party. The enthusiasm of Julian prompted him to embrace the friends of Jupiter as his personal friends and brethren, and though he partially overlooked the merit of Christian constancy, he admired and rewarded the noble perseverance of those Gentiles who had preferred the favor of the gods to that of the emperor. If they cultivated the literature as well as the religion of the Greeks, they acquired an additional claim to the friendship of Julian, who ranked the muses in the number of his tutelar deities. In the religion which he had adopted, piety and learning were almost synonymous, and a crowd of poets, of rhetoricians, and of philosophers hastened to the imperial court to occupy the vacant spaces of the bishops who had seduced the credulity of Constantius. His successor esteemed the ties of common initiation as far more sacred than those of consanguinity. He chose his favorites among the sages who were deeply skilled in the occult sciences of magic and divination and every impostor who pretended to reveal the secrets of futurity was assured of enjoying the present hour in honor and affluence. Among the philosophers, Maximus obtained the most eminent rank in the friendship of his royal disciple, who communicated with unreserved confidence his actions, his sentiments, and his religious designs during the anxious suspense of the civil war. As soon as Julian had taken possession of the palace of Constantinople, he dispatched an honorable and pressing invitation to Maximus, who then resided at Sardis in Lydia, with Chrysanthius, the associate of his art and studies. The prudent and superstitious Chrysanthius refused to undertake a journey which showed itself, according to the rules of divination, with the most threatening and malignant aspect. But his companion, whose fanaticism was of a bolder cast, persisted in his interrogations till he had exhorted from the gods a seeming consent to his own wishes and those of the emperor. The journey of Maximus through the cities of Asia displayed the triumph of philosophic vanity, and the magistrates vied with each other in the honorable reception which they prepared for the friend of their sovereign. Julian was pronouncing an oration before the senate when he was informed of the arrival of Maximus. The emperor immediately interrupted his discourse, advanced to meet him, and after a tender embrace conducted him by the hand into the midst of the assembly, where he publicly acknowledged the benefits which he had derived from the instructions of the philosopher. Maximus, who soon acquired the confidence and influenced the counsels of Julian, was insensibly corrupted by the temptations of a court. His dress became more splendid, his demeanor more lofty, and he was exposed, under a succeeding reign, to a disgraceful inquiry into the means by which the disciple of Plato had accumulated in the short duration of his favor, a very scandalous proportion of wealth. Of the other philosophers and sophists who were invited to the imperial residence by the choice of Julian, or by the success of Maximus, few were able to preserve their innocence or their reputation. The liberal gifts of money, lands, and houses were insufficient to satiate their rapacious avarice, and the indignation of the people was justly excited by the remembrance of their abject poverty and disinterested professions. The penetration of Julian could not always be deceived, but he was unwilling to despise the characters of those men whose talents deserved his esteem. He desired to escape the double reproach of imprudence and inconstancy, and he was apprehensive of degrading, in the eyes of the profane, the honor of letters and of religion. The favor of Julian was almost equally divided between the pagans, who had firmly adhered to the worship of their ancestors, and the Christians who had prudently embraced the religion of their sovereign. The acquisition of new proselytes gratified the ruling passions of his soul, superstition and vanity, and he was heard to declare, with the enthusiasm of a missionary, that he could render each individual richer than Midas, and every city greater than Babylon. He should not esteem himself the benefactor of mankind, unless, at the same time, he could reclaim his subjects from the impious revolt against the immortal gods. A prince who had studied human nature, 
and who possessed the treasures of the Roman Empire, could adapt his arguments, his promises, and his rewards to every order of Christians, and the merit of a seasonable conversion was allowed to supply the defects of a candidate, or even to expiate the guilt of a criminal. As the army is the most forcible engine of absolute power, Julian applied himself with peculiar diligence to corrupt the religion of his troops, without whose hearty concurrence every measure must be dangerous and unsuccessful, and the natural temper of soldiers made this conquest as easy as it was important. The legions of Gaul devoted themselves to the faith, as well as to the fortunes of their victorious leader, and even before the death of Constantius he had the satisfaction of announcing to his friends that they assisted with fervent devotion and voracious appetite at the sacrifices, which were repeatedly offered in his camp, of whole hecatombs of fat oxen. The armies of the east, which had been trained under the standards of the cross and of Constantius, required a more artful and expensive mode of persuasion. On the days of solemn and public festivals, the emperor received the homage and rewarded the merit of his troops. His throne of state was encircled by the military ensigns of Rome and of the Republic. The holy name of Christ was erased from the labyrinth, and the symbols of war, of majesty, and of pagan superstition were so dexterously blended that the faithful subject incurred the guilt of idolatry when he respectfully saluted the person or the image of a sovereign. The soldiers passed successfully in review, and each of them, before he received from the hand of Julian a liberal donative, proportioned to his rank and services, was required to cast a few grains of incense into the flame, which burnt upon the altar. Some Christian confessors might resist, and others might repent, but the far greater number, allured by the prospect of gold and awed by the presence of the emperor, contracted the criminal engagement, and their future perseverance in the worship of the gods was enforced by every consideration of duty and of interest. By the frequent repetition of these arts, and at the expense of sums which would have purchased the service of half the nations of Scythia, Julian gradually adopted for his troops the imaginary protection of the gods, and for himself the firm and effectual support of the Roman legions. It is indeed more than probable that the restoration and encouragement of paganism revealed a multitude of pretended Christians, who, from motives of temporal advantage, had acquiesced in the religion of the former reign, and who afterwards returned with the same flexibility of conscience to the faith which was professed by the successors of Julian. While the devout monarch incessantly labored to restore and propagate the religion of his ancestors, he embraced the extraordinary design of rebuilding the temple of Jerusalem. In a public epistle to the nation or community of the Jews, dispersed throughout the provinces, he pities their misfortunes, condemns their oppressors, praises their constancy, declares himself their gracious protector, and expresses a pious hope that, After his return from the Persian War, he may be permitted to pay his grateful vows to the Almighty in his holy city of Jerusalem. The blind superstition and abject slavery of those unfortunate exiles must excite the contempt of a philosophic emperor, but they deserve the friendship of Julian by their implacable hatred of the Christian name. The barren synagogue abhorred and envied the fecundity of the rebellious church. The power of the Jews was not equal to their malice but their gravest rabbis approved the private murder of an apostate, and their seditious clamors had often awakened the indolence of the pagan magistrates. Under the reign of Constantine, the Jews became the subjects of the revolted children, nor was it long before they experienced the bitterness of domestic tyranny. The civil immunities which had been granted or confirmed by Severus were gradually repealed by the Christian princes, and a rash tumult excited by the Jews of Palestine seems to justify the lucrative modes of oppression which were invented by the bishops and eunuchs of the court of Constantius. The Christian patriarch, who was still permitted to exercise a precarious jurisdiction, held his residence at Tiberias, and the neighboring cities of Palestine were filled with the remains of a people who finally adhered to the promised land. But the edict of Hadrian was renewed and enforced, and they viewed from afar the walls of the holy city, which were profaned in their eyes by the triumph of the cross, and the devotion of the Christians. End of chapter 23, part 2
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the mists of a rocky and barren country, the walls of Jerusalem enclosed the two mountains of Sion and Ekra within an oval figure of about three English miles. Towards the south, the upper town and the fortress of David were erected on the lofty ascent of Mount Sion. On the north side, the buildings of the lower town covered the spacious summit of Mount Acre, and a part of the hill distinguished by the name of Moriah and leveled by human industry was crowned with the stately temple of the Jewish nation. After the final destruction of the temple by the arms of Titus and Hadrian, a plowshare was drawn over the consecrated ground as a sign of perpetual interdiction. Sion was deserted, and the vacant space of the lower city was filled with the public and private edifices of the Aelian colony, which spread themselves over the adjacent hill of Calvary. The holy places were polluted with monuments of idolatry, and either from design or accident, a chapel was dedicated to Venus on the spot which had been sanctified by the death and resurrection of Christ. Almost three hundred years after those stupendous events, the profane chapel of Venus was demolished by an order of Constantine, and the removal of the earth and stones revealed the holy sepulchre to the eyes of mankind. A magnificent church was erected on that mystic ground by the first Christian emperor, and the effects of his pious munificence were extended to every spot which had been consecrated by the footsteps of patriarchs, of prophets, and of the Son of God. The passionate desire of contemplating the original monuments of their redemption attracted to Jerusalem a successive crowd of pilgrims from the shores of the Atlantic Ocean and the most distant countries of the East. Their piety was authorized by the example of the Empress Helena, who appears to have united the credulity of age with the warm feelings of a recent conversion. Sages and heroes who have visited the memorable scenes of ancient wisdom or glory have confessed the inspiration of the genius of the place, and the Christian who knelt before the Holy Sepulchre ascribed his lively faith and his fervent devotion to the more immediate influence of the Divine Spirit. The zeal, perhaps the avarice of the clergy of Jerusalem, cherished and multiplied these beneficial visits. They fixed, by unquestionable tradition, the scene of each memorable event. They exhibited the instruments which had been used in the Passion of Christ, the nails and the lance that had pierced his hands, his feet, and his side, the crowd of thorns which was planted on his head, the pillar at which he was scourged, and, above all, they showed the cross on which he had suffered, and which was dug out of the earth in the reign of those princes who inserted the symbol of Christianity in the banners of the Roman legions. Such miracles as seemed necessary to account for its extraordinary preservation and seasonable discovery were gradually propagated without opposition. The custody of the true cross, which on Easter Sunday was solemnly exposed to the people, was entrusted to the bishop of Jerusalem, and he alone might gratify the curious devotion of the pilgrims by the gift of the small pieces, which they encased in gold or gems, and carried away in triumph to their respective countries. But, as this gainful branch of commerce must soon have been annihilated, it was found convenient to suppose that the marvelous wood possessed a secret power of vegetation, and that its substance, though continually diminished, still remained entire and unimpaired. It might perhaps have been expected that the influence of the place and the belief of a perpetual miracle should have produced some salutary effects on the morals as well as on the faith of the people. Yet, the most respectable of the ecclesiastical writers have been obliged to confess not only that the streets of Jerusalem were filled with the incessant tumult of business and pleasure, but that every species of vice, adultery, theft, idolatry, poisoning, murder, was familiar to the inhabitants of the holy city. The wealth and preeminence of the Church of Jerusalem excited the ambition of Arian as well as Orthodox candidates, and the virtues of Cyril, who, since his death, had been honored with the title of saint, were displayed in the exercise rather than in the acquisition of his episcopal dignity. The vain and ambitious mind of Julian might aspire to restore the ancient glory of the Temple of Jerusalem. As the Christians were firmly persuaded that a sentence of everlasting destruction had been pronounced against the whole fabric of the Mosaic Law, the imperial sophist, 
would have converted the success of his undertaking into a specious argument against the faith of prophecy and the truth of revelation. He was displeased with the spiritual worship of the synagogue, but he approved the institutions of Moses, who had not disdained to adopt many of the rites and ceremonies of Egypt. The local and national deity of the Jews was sincerely endured by a polytheist who desired only to multiply the number of the gods. And such was the appetite of Julian for bloody sacrifice that his emulation might be excited by the piety of Solomon, who had offered at the Feast of the Dedication 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. These considerations might influence his designs, but the prospect of an immediate and important advantage would not suffer the impatient monarch to expect the remote and uncertain event of the Persian War. He resolved to erect, without delay, on the commanding eminence of Moria, a stately temple, which might eclipse the splendor of the Church of the Resurrection on the adjacent hill of Calvary, and to establish an order of priests whose interested zeal would detect the arts and resist the ambition of their Christian rivals, and to invite a numerous colony of Jews whose stern fanaticism would always be prepared to second and even to anticipate the hostile measures of the pagan government. Among the friends of the emperor, if the names of emperor and a friend are not incompatible, the first place was assigned by Julian himself to the virtuous and learned Olypius. The humanity of Olypius was tempered by severe justice and manly fortitude, and while he exercised his abilities in the civil administration of Britain, he imitated in his poetical compositions the harmony and softness of the odes of Sappho. This minister, to whom Julian communicated without reserve his most careless levities and his most serious counsels, received an extraordinary commission to restore in its pristine beauty the temple of Jerusalem, and the diligence of Olypius required and obtained the strenuous support of the governor of Palestine. At the call of their great deliverer, the Jews from all the provinces of the empire were assembled on the holy mountain of their fathers, and their insolent triumph alarmed and exasperated the Christian inhabitants of Jerusalem. The desire of rebuilding the temple has, in every age, been the ruling passion of the children of Israel. In this propitious moment, the men forgot their avarice, and the women their delicacy. Spades and pickaxes of silver were provided by the vanity of the rich, and the rubbish was transported in mantles of silk and purple. Every purse was open in liberal contributions. Every hand claimed a share in the pious labor, and the commands of a great monarch were executed by the enthusiasm of a whole people. Yet, on this occasion, the joint efforts of power and enthusiasm were unsuccessful, and the ground of the Jewish temple, which is now covered by a Mahometan mosque, still continued to exhibit the same edifying spectacle of ruin and desolation. Perhaps the absence and death of the emperor and the new maxims of a Christian reign might explain the interruption of an arduous work, which was attempted only in the last six months of the life of Julian. But the Christians entertained a natural and pious expectation that in this memorial contest the honor of religion would be vindicated by some signal miracle. An earthquake, a whirlwind, and a fiery eruption, which overturned and scattered the new foundations of the temple, are attested with some variation by contemporary and respectable evidence. This public event is described by Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, in an epistle to the Emperor Theodosius which must provoke the severe amiadversion of the Jews. By the eloquent Chrysostom, who might appeal to the memory of the elder part of his congregation at Antioch, and by Gregory Nazianzen, who published his account of the miracle before the expiration of the same year. The last of these writers has boldly declared that this prenatural event was not disputed by the infidels, and his assertion, strange as it may seem, is confirmed by the unexceptionable testimony of Ammianus Marcellinus, the philosophic soldier who loved the virtues without adopting the prejudices of his master, has recorded in his judicious and candid history of his own times the extraordinary obstacles which interrupted the restoration of the temple of Jerusalem. Whilst Elipius, assisted by the governor of the province, urged with vigor and diligence the execution of the work, Horrible balls of fire, breaking out near the foundation with frequent and reiterated attacks, rendered the place, from time to time, inaccessible to the scorched and blasted workmen, 
and the victorious element continuing in this manner obstinately and resolutely bent, as it were, to drive them to a distance, the undertaking was soon abandoned. Such authority should satisfy a believing, and must astonish an incredulous mind. Yet a philosopher may still require the original evidence of impartial and intelligent spectators. At this important crisis, any singular accident of nature would assume the appearance and produce the effects of a real prodigy. This glorious deliverance would be speedily improved and magnified by the pious arts of the clergy of Jerusalem, and the active credulity of the Christian world, and at the distance of twenty years, a Roman historian, careless of theological disputes, might adorn his work with the specious and splendid miracle. End of chapter 23, part 3Chapter 23, Part 4 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The restoration of the Jewish temple was secretly connected with the ruin of the Christian church. Julian still continued to maintain the freedom of religious worship, without distinguishing whether this universal toleration proceeded from his justice or his clemency. He affected to pity the unhappy Christians, who were mistaken in the most important object of their lives. But his pity was degraded by contempt, his contempt was embittered by hatred, and the sentiments of Julian were expressed in a style of sarcastic wit, which inflicts a deep and deadly wound whenever it issues from the mouth of a sovereign. As he was sensible that the Christians gloried in the name of their Redeemer, he countenanced and perhaps enjoyed the use of the less honorable appellation of Galileans. He declared that, by the folly of the Galileans, whom he describes as a sect of fanatics, contemptible to men and odious to the gods, the empire had been reduced to the brink of destruction, and he insinuates in a public edict that a frantic patient might sometimes be cured by salutary violence. An ungenerous distinction was admitted into the mind and counsels of Julian, that, according to the difference of their religious sentiments, one part of his subjects deserved his favor and friendship, while the other part was entitled only to the common benefits that his justice could not refuse to an obedient people. According to a principle pregnant with mischief and oppression, the emperor transferred to the pontiffs of his own religion the management of the liberal allowances from the public revenue which had been granted to the church by the piety of Constantine and his sons. The proud system of clerical honors and immunities, which had been constructed with so much art and labor, was leveled to the ground. The hopes of testamentary donations were intercepted by the rigors of the laws, and the priests of the Christian sect were confounded with the last and most ignominious class of the people. Such of these regulations as appeared necessary to check the ambition and avarice of the ecclesiastics were soon afterwards imitated by the wisdom of an orthodox prince. The peculiar distinctions which policy has bestowed or superstition has lavished on the sacerdotal order must be confined to those priests who profess the religion of the state. But the will of the legislator was not exempt from prejudice and passion, and it was the object of the insidious policy of Julian to deprive the Christians of all the temporal honors and advantages which rendered them respectable in the eyes of the world. A just and severe censure has been inflicted on the law which prohibited the Christians from teaching the arts of grammar and rhetoric. The motives alleged by the emperor to justify this partial and oppressive measure might command, during his lifetime, the silence of slaves and the applause of flatterers. Julian abuses the ambiguous meaning of a word which might be indifferently applied to the language and the religion of the Greeks. He contemptuously observes that the men who exalt the merit of implicit faith are unfit to claim or to enjoy the advantages of science. He vainly contends that if they refuse to adore the gods of Homer and Demosthenes, they ought to content themselves with expounding Luke and Matthew in the churches of the Galileans. In all the cities of the Roman world, the education of the youth was entrusted to masters of grammar and rhetoric, who were elected by the magistrates, maintained at the public expense, and distinguished by many lucrative and honorable privileges. 
The edict of Julian appears to have included the physicians and professors of all the liberal arts, and the emperor, who reserved to himself the approbation of the candidates, was authorized by the laws to corrupt or to punish the religious constancy of the most learned of the Christians. As soon as the resignation of the more obstinate teachers had established the unrivaled dominion of the pagan sophists, Julian invited the rising generation to resort with freedom to the public schools in a just confidence that their tender minds would receive the impressions of literature and idolatry. If the greatest part of the Christian youth should be deterred by their own scruples or by those of their parents from accepting this dangerous mode of instruction, they must at the same time relinquish the benefits of a liberal education. Julian had reason to expect that, in the space of a few years, the church would relapse into its primeval simplicity, and that the theologians, who possessed an adequate share of the learning and eloquence of the age, would be succeeded by a generation of blind and ignorant fanatics, incapable of defending the truth of their own principles, or of exposing the various follies of polytheism. It was undoubtedly the wish and design of Julian to deprive the Christians of the advantages of wealth, of knowledge, and of power. But the injustice of excluding them from all offices of trust and profit seems to have been the result of his general policy, rather than the immediate consequence of any positive law. Superior merit might deserve and obtain some extraordinary exceptions, but the greater part of the Christian officers were gradually removed from their employments in the state, the army, and the provinces. The hopes of future candidates were extinguished by the declared partiality of a prince, who maliciously reminded them that, it was unlawful for a Christian to use the sword, either of justice or of war, and who studiously guarded the camp and tribunals with the ensigns of idolatry. The powers of government were entrusted to the pagans, who professed an ardent zeal for the religion of their ancestors, and as the choice of the emperor was often directed by the rules of divination, the favorites whom he preferred as the most agreeable to the gods did not always obtain the approbation of mankind. Under the administration of their enemies, the Christians had much to suffer and much to apprehend. The temper of Julian was adverse to cruelty, and the care of his reputation, which was exposed to the eyes of the universe, restrained the philosophic monarch from violating the laws of justice and toleration, which he himself had so recently established. But the provincial ministers of his authority were placed in a less conspicuous station. In the exercise of arbitrary power, they consulted the wishes rather than the commands of their sovereign, and ventured to exercise a secret and vexatious tyranny against the sectaries on whom they were not permitted to confer the honors of martyrdom. The emperor, who dissembled as long as possible his knowledge of the injustice which was exercised in his name, expressed his real sense of the conduct of his officers by gentle reproofs and substantial rewards. The most effectual instrument of oppression with which they were armed was the law that obliged the Christians to make full and ample satisfaction for the temples which they had destroyed under the preceding reign. The zeal of the triumphant church had not always expected the sanction of the public authority, and the bishops, who were secure of impunity, had often marched at the head of their congregations to attack and demolish the fortresses of the Prince of Darkness. The consecrated lands, which had increased the patrimony of the sovereign, or of the clergy, were clearly defined and easily restored. But on these lands, and on the ruins of pagan superstition, the Christians had frequently erected their own religious edifices, and as it was necessary to remove the church before the temple could be rebuilt, the justice and piety of the emperor were applauded by one party, while the other deplored and execrated his sacrilegious violence. After the ground was cleared, the restitution of those stately structures which had been leveled with the dust, and of the precious ornaments which had been converted to Christian uses, swelled into a very large account of damages and debt. The authors of the injury had neither the ability nor the inclination to discharge this accumulated demand, and the impartial wisdom of a legislator would have been displayed in balancing the adverse claims and complaints by an equitable and temperate arbitration. But the whole empire, and particularly the east, was thrown into confusion by the rash edicts of Julian, and the pagan magistrates, inflamed by zeal and revenge, abused the rigorous privilege of the Roman law, which substitutes, in the place of his inadequate property, the person of the insolvent debtor. Under the preceding reign, Mark, bishop of Arethusa, 
had labored in the conversion of his people with arms more effectual than those of persuasion. The magistrates required the full value of a temple which had been destroyed by his intolerant zeal, but as they were satisfied of his poverty, they desired only to bend his inflexible spirit to the promise of the slightest compensation. They apprehended the aged prelate. They inhumanly scourged him. They tore his beard, his naked body, anointed with honey, was suspended in a net between heaven and earth, and exposed to the stings of insects and the rays of a Syrian sun. From this lofty station, Mark still persisted to glory in his crime, and to insult the impotent range of his persecutors. He was at length rescued from their hands, and dismissed to enjoy the honor of his divine triumph. The Arians celebrated the virtue of their pious confessor. The Catholics ambitiously claimed his alliance, and the pagans, who might be susceptible of shame or remorse, were deterred from the repetition of such unavailing cruelty. Julian spared his life, but if the bishop of Arethusa had saved the infancy of Julian, posterity will condemn the ingratitude instead of praising the clemency of the emperor. At the distance of five miles from Antioch, the Macedonian kings of Syria had consecrated to Apollo one of the most elegant places of devotion in the pagan world. A magnificent temple rose in honor of the god of light, and his colossal figure almost filled the capacious sanctuary, which was enriched with gold and gems, and endured by the skill of the Grecian artists. The deity was represented in a bending attitude, with a golden cup in his hand, pouring out a libation on the earth, and if he supplicated the venerable mother to give to his arms the cold and beauteous Daphne, for the spot was ennobled by fiction, and the fancy of the Syrian poets had transported the amorous tales from the banks of the Peneus to those of the Orontes. The ancient rites of Greece were imitated by the royal colony of Antioch. A stream of prophecy, which rivaled the truth and reputation of the Delphic oracle, flowed from the Castilian fountain of Daphne. In the adjacent fields, a stadium was built by a special privilege, which had been purchased from Ellis. The Olympic Games were celebrated at the expense of the city, and a revenue of 30,000 pounds sterling was annually applied to the public pleasures. The perpetual resort of pilgrims and spectators insensibly formed, in the neighborhood of the temple, the stately and populous village of Daphne, which emulated the splendor without acquiring the title of a provincial city. The temple and the village were deeply bosomed in a thick grove of laurels and cypresses, which reached as far as the circumference of ten miles, and formed in the most sultry summers a cool and impenetrable shade. A thousand streams of the purest water, issuing from every hill, preserved the verdure of the earth and the temperature of the air. The senses were gratified with harmonious sounds and aromatic odors, and the peaceful grove was consecrated to health and joy, to luxury and love. The vigorous youth pursued, like Apollo, the object of his desires, and the blushing maid was warned by the fate of Daphne to shun the folly of unseasonable coyness. The soldier and the philosopher wisely avoided the temptation of this sensual paradise, where pleasure, assuming the character of religion, imperceptibly dissolved the firmness of manly virtue. But the groves of Daphne continued for many ages to enjoy the veneration of natives and strangers. The privileges of the holy ground were enlarged by the munificence of seceding emperors, and every generation added new ornaments to the splendor of the temple. When Julian, on the day of the annual festival, hastened to the door of the Apollo of Daphne, his devotion was raised to the highest pitch of eagerness and impatience. His lively imagination anticipated the grateful pomp of victims, of libations, of incense, a long procession of youths and virgins clothed in white robes, the symbol of their innocence, and the tumultual concourse of an innumerable people. But the zeal of Antioch was diverted since the reign of Christianity into a different channel. Instead of hecticombs of fat oxen sacrificed by the tribes of a wealthy city to their tutelar deity, the emperor complains that he found only a single goose provided at the expense of a priest, the pale and solitary inhabitant of this decayed temple. The altar was deserted, the oracle had been reduced to silence, and the holy ground was profaned by the introduction of Christian and funeral rites. After Babylas, bishop of Antioch, who died in prison in the persecution of Decius, had rested near a century in his grave, 
his body by the order of the Caesar Gallus was transported into the midst of the grove of Daphne. A magnificent church was erected over his remains. A portion of the sacred lands was usurped for the maintenance of the clergy, and for the burial of the Christians of Antioch, who were ambitious of lying at the feet of their bishop, and the priests of Apollo retired with their affrighted and indignant votaries. As soon as another revolution seemed to restore the favor of paganism, the church of St. Babylas was demolished, and new buildings were added to the moldering edifice which had been raised by the piety of Syrian kings. But the first and most serious care of Julian was to deliver his oppressed deity from the odious presence of the dead and living Christians, who had so effectually suppressed the voice of fraud and enthusiasm. The scene of infection was purified according to the forms of ancient rituals. The bodies were decently removed, and the ministers of the church were permitted to convey the remains of St. Babylas to their former habitation within the walls of Antioch. The modest behavior which might have assuaged the jealousy of a hostile government was neglected on this occasion by the zeal of the Christians. The lofty car that transported the relics of Babylas was followed and accompanied and received by an innumerable multitude who chanted with thundering acclamations the Psalms of David, the most expressive of their contempt for idols and idolaters. The return of the saint was a triumph, and the triumph was an insult on the religion of the emperor, who exerted his pride to dissemble his resentment. During the night which terminated this indiscreet procession, the temple of Daphne was in flames, the statue of Apollo was consumed, and the walls of the edifice were left a naked and awful monument of ruin. The Christians of Antioch asserted with religious confidence that the powerful intercession of St. Babylas had pointed the lightnings of heaven against the devoted roof. But as Julian was reduced to the alternative of believing either a crime or a miracle, he chose without hesitation, without evidence, but with some color of probability, to impute the fire of Daphne to the revenge of the Galileans. Their offense, had it been sufficiently proved, might have justified the retaliation which was immediately executed by the order of Julian, of shutting the doors and confiscating the wealth of the cathedral of Antioch. To discover the criminals who were guilty of the tumult, of the fire, or of secreting the riches of the church, several ecclesiastics were tortured, and a presbyter by the name of Theodoret was beheaded by the sentence of the Count of the East. But this hasty act was blamed by the emperor, who lamented with real or affected concern that the imprudent zeal of his ministers might tarnish his reign with the disgrace of persecution. End of chapter 23, part 4「Of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The zeal of the ministers of Julian was instantly checked by the frown of their sovereign. But when the father of his country declares himself the leader of a faction, the license of popular fury cannot easily be restrained, nor consistently punished. Julian, in a public composition, applauds the devotion and loyalty of the holy cities of Syria, whose pious inhabitants had destroyed, at the first signal, the sepulchres of the Galileans, and faintly complains that they had revenged the injuries of the gods with less moderation than he should have recommended. This imperfect and reluctant confession may appear to confirm the ecclesiastical narratives that in the cities of Gaza, Ascalon, Caesarea, Heliopolis, etc., the pagans abused, without prudence or remorse, the moment of their prosperity, that the unhappy objects of their cruelty were released from torture only by death, that, as their mangled bodies were dragged through the streets, they were pierced, such was the universal rage, by the spits of cooks and the distaffs of enraged women, and that the entrails of Christian priests and virgins, after they had been tasted by those bloody fanatics, were mixed with barley and contemptuously thrown to the unclean animals of the city. Such scenes of religious madness exhibit the most contemptible and odious picture of human nature. But the massacre of Alexandria attracts still more attention from the certainty of the fact, the rank of the victims, and the splendor of the capital of Egypt. George, from his parents or his education, surnamed the Cappadocian, 
was born at Epiphania, in Cilicia, in a fuller's shop. From this obscure and servile origin, he raised himself by the talents of a parasite, and the patrons whom he assiduously flattered procured for their worthless dependent a lucrative commission, or contract, to supply the army with bacon. His employment was mean. He rendered it infamous. He accumulated wealth by the basest arts of fraud and corruption, but his malaversions were so notorious that George was compelled to escape from the pursuits of justice. After this disgrace, in which he appears to have saved his fortune at the expense of his honor, he embraced with real or affected zeal the profession of Arianism. From the love or the ostentation of learning, he collected a valuable library of history, rhetoric, philosophy, and theology, and the choice of the prevailing faction promoted George of Cappadocia to the throne of Athanasius. The entrance of the new archbishop was that of a barbarian conqueror, and each moment of his reign was polluted by cruelty and avarice. The Catholics of Alexandria and Egypt were abandoned to a tyrant, qualified by nature and education to exercise the office of persecution. But he oppressed with an impartial hand the various inhabitants of his extensive diocese. The primate of Egypt assumed the pomp and insolence of his lofty station, but he still betrayed the vices of his base and servile extraction. The merchants of Alexandria were impoverished by the unjust and almost universal monopoly which he acquired of nitre, salt, paper, funerals, etc., and the spiritual father of a great people condescended to practice the vile and pernicious arts of an informer. The Alexandrians could never forget nor forgive the tax which he suggested on all the houses of the city under an obsolete claim that the royal founder had conveyed to his successors the Ptolemies and the Caesars, the perpetual property of the soil. The pagans, who had been flattered with the hopes of freedom and toleration, excited his devout avarice, and the rich temples of Alexandria were either pillaged or insulted by the haughty prelate, who exclaimed in a loud and threatening tone, How long will these sepulchres be permitted to stand? Under the reign of Constantius he was expelled by the fury, or rather by the justice of the people, and it was not without a violent struggle that the civil and military powers of the state could restore his authority and gratify his revenge. The messenger who proclaimed at Alexandria the accession of Julian announced the downfall of the archbishop. George, with two of his obsequious ministers, Count Diodorus and Dracontius, master of the mint, were ignominiously dragged in chains to the public prison. At the end of twenty-four days, the prison was forced open by the rage of a superstitious multitude, impatient of the tedious forms of judicial proceedings. The enemy of gods and men expired under their cruel insults. The lifeless bodies of the archbishop and his associates were carried in triumph through the streets on the back of a camel, and the inactivity of the Athanasian party was esteemed a shining example of evangelical patience. The remains of these guilty wretches were thrown into the sea, and the popular leaders of the tumult declared their resolution to disappoint the devotions of the Christians and to intercept the future honors of these martyrs who had been punished, like their predecessors, by the enemies of their religion. The fears of the pagans were just, their precautions ineffectual. The meritorious death of the archbishop obliterated the memory of his life. The rival of Athanasius was dear and sacred to the Arians, and the seeming conversion of those sectaries introduced his worship into the bosom of the Catholic Church. The odious stranger, disguising every circumstance of time and place, assumed the rank of a martyr, a saint, and a Christian hero, and the infamous George of Cappadocia has been transformed into the renowned St. George of England, the patron of arms, of chivalry, and of the garter. About the same time that Julian was informed of the tumult of Alexandria, he received intelligence from Edessa that the proud and wealthy faction of the Arians had insulted the weakness of the Valentinians and committed such disorders as ought not to be suffered with impunity in a well-regulated state. Without expecting the slow forms of justice, the exasperated prince directed his mandate to the magistrates of Edessa, by which he confiscated the whole property of the church. The money was distributed among the soldiers, the lands were added to the domain, and this act of oppression was aggravated by the most ungenerous irony. I show myself, says Julian, the true friend of the Galileans, their admirable law has promised the kingdom of heaven to the poor, and they will advance with more diligence in the paths of virtue and salvation when they are relieved by my assistance from the load of temporal possessions. Take care. 
pursued the monarch in a more serious tone. Take care how you provoke my patience and humanity. If these disorders continue, I will revenge on the magistrates the crimes of the people, and you will have a reason to dread not only confiscation and exile, but fire and the sword. The tumults of Alexandria were doubtless of a more bloody and dangerous nature. But a Christian bishop had fallen by the hands of the pagans, and the public epistle of Julian affords a very lively proof of the partial spirit of his administration. His reproaches to the citizens of Alexandria are mingled with expressions of esteem and tenderness, and he laments that, on this occasion, they should have departed from the gentle and generous manners which attested their Grecian extraction. He gravely censures the offense which they had committed against the laws of justice and humanity, but he recapitulates with visible complacency the intolerable provocations which they had so long endured from the impious tyranny of George of Cappadocia. Julian admits the principle that a wise and vigorous government should chastise the insolent of the people, yet in consideration of their founder, Alexander, and of Serapis, their tutelar deity, he grants a free and gracious pardon to the guilty city, for which he again feels the affection of a brother. After the tumult of Alexandria had subsided, Athanasius, amidst the public acclamations, seated himself on the throne from whence his unworthy competitor had been precipitated, and as the zeal of the archbishop was tempered with discretion, the exercise of his authority tended not to inflame, but to reconcile the minds of the people. His pastoral labors were not confined to the narrow limits of Egypt. The state of the Christian world was present to his active and capacious mind, and the age, the merit, the reputation of Athanasius enabled him to assume, in a moment of danger, the office of ecclesiastical dictator. Three years were not yet elapsed since the majority of the bishops of the West had, ignorantly or reluctantly, subscribed to the confession of Rimini. They repented, they believed, but they dreaded the unseasonable rigor of their orthodox brethren, and if their pride was stronger than their faith, they might throw themselves into the hands of the Arians to escape the indignity of a public penance, which must degrade them to the condition of obscure laymen. At the same time, the domestic differences concerning the union and the distinction of the divine persons were agitated with some heat among the Catholic doctors, and the progress of this metaphysical controversy seemed to threaten a public and lasting division of the Greek and Latin churches. By the wisdom of a select synod, to which the name and presence of Athanasius gave the authority of a general council, the bishops, who had unwarily deviated into air, were admitted to the communion of the church on the easy condition of subscribing the Nicene Creed without any formal acknowledgment of their past fault or any minute definition of their scholastic opinions. The advice of the primate of Egypt had already prepared the clergy of Gaul and Spain, of Italy and Greece, for the reception of this salutary measure and notwithstanding the oppression of some ardent spirits, the fear of the common enemy promoted the peace and harmony of the Christians. The skill and diligence of the primate of Egypt had improved the season of tranquility before it was interrupted by the hostile edicts of the emperor. Julian, who despised the Christians, honored Athanasius with his sincere and peculiar hatred. For his sake alone he introduced an arbitrary distinction, repugnant at least to the spirit of his former declarations. He maintained that the Galileans, whom he had recalled from exile, were not restored by that general indulgence to the possession of their respective churches. He expressed his astonishment that a criminal, who had been repeatedly condemned by the judgment of the emperors, should dare to insult the majesty of the laws and insolently usurp the archepiscopal throne of Alexandria, without expecting the orders of his sovereign. As a punishment for the imaginary offense, he again banished Athanasius from the city and he was pleased to suppose that this act of justice would be highly agreeable to his pious subjects. The pressing solicitations of the people soon convinced him that the majority of the Alexandrians were Christians, and that the greatest part of the Christians were firmly attached to the cause of their oppressed primate. But the knowledge of their sentiments, instead of persuading him to recall his decree, provoked him to extend to all of Egypt the term of the exile of Athanasius. The zeal of the multitude rendered Julian still more inexorable. He was alarmed by the danger of leaving at the head of a tumultuous city a daring and popular leader, and the language of his resentment discovers the opinion which he entertained of the courage and abilities of Athanasius. The execution of the sentence was still delayed by the caution or negligence of Atticius, 
the prefect of Egypt, who was at length awakened from his lethargy by a severe reprimand. Though you neglect, says Julian, to write me on any other subject, at least it is your duty to inform me of your conduct towards Athanasius, the enemy of the gods. My intentions have been long communicated to you. I swear by the great Serapis that unless, on the calends of December, Athanasius is departed from Alexandria, nay, from Egypt, the officers of your government shall pay a fine of one hundred pounds of gold. You know my temper. I am slow to condemn, but I am still slower to forgive. The epistle was enforced by a short postscript written with the emperor's own hand. The contempt that is shown for all the gods fills me with grief and indignation. There is nothing that I should see, nothing that I should hear, with more pleasure than the expulsion of Athanasius from all Egypt. The abominable wretch, under my reign, the baptism of several Grecian ladies of the highest rank, has been the effect of his persecutions. The death of Athanasius was not expressly commanded, but the prefect of Egypt understood that it was safer for him to accede than to neglect the orders of an irritated master. The archbishop prudently retired to the monasteries of the desert, eluded with his usual dexterity the snares of the enemy, and lived to triumph over the ashes of a prince, who, in the words a formidable import, had declared his wish that the whole venom of the Galilean school were contained in the single person of Athanasius. I have endeavored faithfully to represent the artful system by which Julian proposed to obtain the effects without incurring the guilt or reproach of persecution. But if the deadly spirit of fanaticism perverted the heart and the understanding of a virtuous prince, it must at the same time be confessed that the real sufferings of the Christians were inflamed and magnified by human passions and religious enthusiasm. The meekness and resignation which had distinguished the primitive disciples of the gospel was the object of the applause rather than of the imitation of their successors. The Christians who had now possessed above forty years the civil and ecclesiastical governments of the empire had contracted the insolent vices of prosperity and the habit of believing that the saints alone were entitled to reign over the earth. As soon as the enmity of Julian deprived the clergy of the privileges which had been conferred by the favor of Constantine, they complained of the most cruel oppression, and the free toleration of idolaters and heretics was the subject of grief and scandal to the orthodox party. The acts of violence which were no longer countenanced by the magistrates were still committed by the zeal of the people. At Pessinus, the altar of Sibele was overturned almost in the presence of the emperor, and in the city of Caesarea in Cappadocia, the Temple of Fortune, the sole place of worship which had been left to the pagans, was destroyed by the rage of a popular tumult. On these occasions a prince, who felt for the honor of the gods, was not disposed to interrupt the course of justice, and his mind was still more deeply exasperated when he found that the fanatics, who had deserved and suffered the punishment of incendiaries, were rewarded with the honors of martyrdom. The Christian subjects of Julian were assured of the hostile designs of their sovereign, and to their jealous apprehension every circumstance of his government might afford some grounds of discontent and suspicion. In the ordinary administration of the laws, the Christians, who formed so large a part of the people, must frequently be condemned, but their indigent brethren, without examining the merits of the cause, presumed their innocence, allowed their claims, and imputed with severity of their judge to the partial malice of religious persecution. These present hardships, intolerable as they might appear, were represented as a single prelude of the impending calamities. The Christians considered Julian as a cruel and crafty tyrant, who suspended the execution of his revenge till she returned victorious from the Persian War. They expected that, as soon as he had triumphed over the foreign enemies of Rome, he should lay aside the irksome mask of dissimulation that the amphitheaters would stream with the blood of hermits and bishops, that the Christians who still persevered in the profession of the faith would be deprived of the common benefits of nature and society. Every calumny that could wound the reputation of the apostate was credulously embraced by the fears and hatreds of his adversaries, and their industry clamors provoked the temper of a sovereign, who it was their duty to respect and their interest to flatter. They still protested that prayers and tears were their only weapons against the impious tyrant, whose head they devoted to the justice of offended heaven. But they insinuated with sullen resolution that their submission was no longer the effect of weakness, and that, in the imperfect state of human virtue, 
the patience which is founded on principle may be exhausted by persecution. It is impossible to determine how far the zeal of Julian would have prevailed over his good sense and humanity. But if we seriously reflect on the strength and spirit of the church, we shall be convinced that before the emperor could have extinguished the religion of Christ, he must have involved his country in the horrors of a civil war. End of chapter 23, part 5. Chapter 24, Part 1 of The Deline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monsbro, Helsingfors, Finland. Chapter 24, The Retreat and Death of Julian, Part 1. Residence of Julian at Antioch his successful expedition against the Persians, passage of the Tigris, the retreat and death of Julian, election of Jovian, he saves the Roman army by a disgraceful treaty. The philosophical fable which Julian composed under the name of the Caesars is one of the most agreeable and instructive productions of ancient wit. During the freedom and equality of the days of the Saturnalia, Romulus prepared a feast for the deities of Olympus, who had adopted him as a worthy associate, and for the Roman princes who had reigned over his martial people and the vanquished nations of the earth. The immortals were placed in just order on their thrones of state, and the table of the Caesars was spread below the moon in the upper region of the air. The tyrants, who would have disgraced the society of gods and men, were thrown headlong by the inexorable nemesis, into the Tartarian abyss. The rest of the Caesars successively advanced to their seats, and as they passed, the vices, the defects, the blemishes of their respective characters were maliciously noticed by old Silenus, a laughing moralist, who disguised the wisdom of a philosopher under the mask of a bacchanal. As soon as the feast was ended, the voice of Mercury proclaimed the will of Jupiter that a celestial crown should be the reward of superior merit. Julius Caesar, Augustus, Trajan, and Marcus Antoninus were selected as the most illustrious candidates. The effeminate Constantine was not excluded from this honorable competition, and the great Alexander was invited to dispute the prize of glory with the Roman heroes. Each of the candidates was allowed to display the merit of his own exploits, but in the judgment of the gods, the modest silence of Marcus pleaded more powerful than the elaborate orations of his haughty rivals. When the judges of this awful contest proceeded to examine the heart and to scrutinize the springs of action, the superiority of the imperial Stoic appeared still more decisive and conspicuous. Alexander and Caesar, Augustus, Trajan, and Constantine acknowledged with a blush that fame or power or pleasure had been the important object of their labors, but the gods themselves beheld, with reverence and love, a virtuous mortal who had practised on the throne the lessons of philosophy, and who, in a state of human imperfection, had aspired to imitate the moral attributes of the deity. The value of this agreeable composition, the Caesars of Julian, is enhanced by the rank of the author, a prince who delineates with freedom the vices and virtues of his predecessors, subscribes in every line the censure or approbation of his own conduct. In the cool moments of reflection, Julian preferred the useful and benevolent virtues of Antoninus, but his ambitious spirit was inflamed by the glory of Alexander, and he solicited, with equal ardor, the esteem of the wise and the applause of the multitude. In the season of life, when the powers of the mind and body enjoy the most active vigor, the emperor who was instructed by the experience and animated by the success of the German war, resolved to signalize his reign by some more splendid and memorable achievement. The ambassadors of the East, from the continent of India and the Isle of Salem, had respectfully saluted the Roman purple. The nations of the West esteemed and dreaded the personal virtues of Julian, both in peace and war. He despised the trophies of a Gothic victory, and was satisfied that the rapacious barbarians of the Danube would be restrained from any future violation of the faith of treaties by the terror of his name and the additional fortifications with which he strengthened the Thracian and Illyrian frontiers. The successor of Cyrus 
and Artaxerxes was the only rival whom he deemed worthy of his arms, and he resolved, by the final conquest of Persia, to chastise the naughty nation which had so long resisted and insulted the majesty of Rome. As soon as the Persian monarch was informed that the throne of Constantius was filled by a prince of a very different character, he condescended to make some artful, or perhaps sincere, overtures towards a negotiation of peace. But the pride of Sapor was astonished by the firmness of Julian, who sternly declared that he would never consent to hold a peaceful conference among the flames and ruins of the cities of Mesopotamia, and who added, with a smile of contempt, that it was needless to treat by ambassadors, as he himself had determined to visit speedily the court of Persia. The impatience of the emperor urged the diligence of the military preparations. The generals were named, and Julian, marching from Constantinople through the provinces of Asia Minor, arrived at Antioch about eight months after the death of his predecessor. His ardent desire to march into the heart of Persia was checked by the indispensable duty of regulating the state of the empire, by his zeal to revive the worship of the gods, and by the advice of his wisest friends, who represented the necessity of allowing the salutary interval of winter quarters to restore the exhausted strength of the legions of Gaul and the discipline and spirit of the eastern troops. Julian was persuaded to fix, till the ensuing spring, his residence at Antioch, among a people maliciously disposed to deride the haste and to censure the delays of their sovereign. If Julian had flattered himself that his personal connection with the capital of the East would be productive of mutual satisfaction to the prince and the people, he made a very false estimate of his own character, and of the manners of Antioch. The warmth of the climate disposed the natives to the most intemperate enjoyment of tranquillity and opulence, and the lively licentiousness of the Greeks was blended with the hereditary softness of the Syrians. Fashion was the only law, pleasure the only pursuit, and the splendor of dress and furniture was the only distinction of the citizens of Antioch. The arts of luxury were honored, the serious and manly virtues were the subject of ridicule, and the contempt for female modesty and reverent age announced the universal corruption of the capital of the East. The love of spectacles was the taste, or rather passion, of the Syrians. The most skillful artists were procured from the adjacent cities, a considerable share of their revenue was devoted to public amusements, and the magnificence of the games of the theatre and circus was considered as the happiness and the glory of Antioch. The rustic manners of a prince, who disdained such glory, and was insensible of such happiness, soon disgusted the delicacy of his subjects, and the effeminate Orientals could neither imitate nor admire the severe simplicity which Julian always maintained, and sometimes affected. The days of festivity, consecrated by ancient custom to the honor of the gods, were the only occasions in which Julian relaxed his philosophic severity, and those festivals were the only days in which the Syrians of Antioch could reject the allurements of pleasure. The majority of the people supported the glory of the Christian name, which had been first invented by their ancestors. They contented themselves with disobeying the moral precepts, but they were scrupulously attached to the speculative doctrines of their religion. The church of Antioch was distracted by heresy and schism, but the Arians and the Athanasians, the followers of Meletius and those of Paulinus, were actuated by the same pious hatred of their common adversary. The strongest prejudice was entertained against the character of an apostate, the enemy and successor of a prince who had engaged the affections of a very numerous sect, and the removal of St. Babylas excited an implacable opposition to the person of Julian. His subjects complained, with superstitious indignation, that famine had pursued the emperor's steps from Constantinople to Antioch, and the discontent of a hungry people was exasperated by the injudicious attempts to relieve their distress. The inclemency of the season had affected the harvest of Syria, and the price of bread in the markets of Antioch had naturally risen in proportion to the scarcity of corn. But the fair and reasonable proportion was soon violated by the rapacious art of monopoly. In this unequal contest, in which the produce of the land is claimed by one party as its exclusive property, is used by another as a lucrative object of trade, and is required by the third for the daily and necessary support of life, all the profits of the intermediate agents are accumulated on the head of the defenseless customers. The hardships of their situation 
were exaggerated and in increased by their own impatience and anxiety, and the apprehension of a scarce city gradually produced the appearances of a famine. When the luxurious citizens of Antioch complained of the high price of poultry and fish, Julian publicly declared that a frugal city ought to be satisfied with a regular supply of wine, oil, and bread, but he acknowledged that it was his duty as a sovereign to provide for the subsistence of his people. With this salutary view, the emperor ventured on a very dangerous and doubtful step of fixing, by legal authority, the value of corn. He enacted that, in a time of scarcity, it should be sold at a price which has seldom been known in the most plentiful years, and that his own example might strengthen the laws, he sent into the market 422,000 modi, or measures, which were drawn by his order from the granaries of Hierapolis, of Chalcis, and even of Egypt. The consequences might have been foreseen, and were soon felt. The imperial wet was purchased by the rich merchants, the proprietors of land, or of corn, withheld from the city the accustomed supply, and the small quantities that appeared in the market were secretly sold at an advanced and illegal price. Julian still continued to applaud his own policy, treated the complaints of the people as a vain and ungrateful murmur, and convinced Antioch that he had inherited the obstinacy, though not the cruelty, of his brother Gallus. The remonstrances of the municipal senate served only to exasperate his inflexible mind. He was persuaded, perhaps with truth, that the senators of Antioch who possessed lands or were concerned in trade had themselves contributed to the calamities of their country, and he imputed the disrespectful boldness which they assumed to the sense not of public duty but of private interest. The whole body, consisting of two hundred of the most noble and wealthy citizens, were sent under the guard from the palace to the prison, and though they were permitted before the close of evening to return to their respective houses, the emperor himself could not obtain the forgiveness which he had so easily granted. The same grievances were still the subject of the same complaints which were industriously circulated by the wit and levity of the Syrian Greeks. During the licentious days of the Saturnalia, the streets of the city resounded with insolent songs which derided the laws, the religion, the personal conduct, and even the beard of the emperor. The spirit of Antioch was manifested by the connivance of the magistrates and by the applause of the multitude. The disciple of Socrates was too deeply affected by these popular insults. But the monarch, endowed with a quick sensibility and possessed of absolute power, refused his passions the gratification of revenge. A tyrant might have proscribed without distinction the lives and fortunes of the citizens of Antioch and the unwarlike Syrians must have patiently submitted to the lust, the rapaciousness, and the cruelty of the faithful legions of Gaul. A milder sentence might have deprived the capital of the East of its honors and privileges, and the courtiers, perhaps the subjects of Julian, would have applauded an act of justice which asserted the dignity of the supreme magistrate of the Republic. But instead of abusing or exerting the authority of the state to revenge his personal injuries, Julian contented himself with an inoffensive mode of retaliation, which it would be in the power of few princes to employ. He had been insulted by satires and libels. In his turn, he composed, under the title of the Enemy of the Beard, an ironical confession of his own faults, and a severe satire on the licentious and effeminate manners of Antio. This imperial reply was publicly exposed before the gates of the palace, and the Misopogon still remains a singular monument of the resentment, the wit, the humanity, and the indiscretion of Julian. Though he affected to laugh, he could not forgive. His contempt was expressed, and his revenge might be gratified by the nomination of a governor worthy only of such subjects, and the emperor, forever renouncing the ungrateful city, proclaimed his resolution to pass the ensuing winter at Tarsus in Cilicia. Yet Antioch possessed one citizen whose genius and virtues might atone, in the opinion of Julian, for the vice and folly of his country. The sophist Libanius was born in the capital of the East. He publicly professed the arts of rhetoric and declamation at Nike, Nicomedia, Constantinople, Athens, and during the remainder of his life at Antioch. His school was assiduously frequented by the Grecian youth. His disciples, who sometimes exceeded the number of eighty, celebrated their incomparable master 
and the jealousy of his rivals, who persecuted him from one city to another, confirmed the favorable opinion which Libanius ostentiously displayed of his superior merit. The preceptors of Julian had exhorted a rash but solemn assurance that he would never attend the lectures of their adversary. The curiosity of the royal youth was checked and inflamed. He secretly procured the writings of this dangerous sophist, and gradually surpassed, in the perfect imitation of his style, the most laborious of his domestic pupils. When Julian ascended the throne, he declared his impatience to embrace and reward the Syrian sophist, who had preserved, in a degenerate age, the Grecian purity of taste, of manners, and of religion. The emperor's prepossession was increased and justified by this discreet pride of his favorite. Instead of pressing, with the foremost of the crowd, into the palace of Constantinople, Libanius calmly expected his arrival at Antioch, withdrew from court on the first symptoms of coldness and indifference, required a formal invitation for each visit, and taught his sovereign an important lesson, that he might command the obedience of a subject, but that he must deserve the attachment of a friend. The sophists of every age, despising or affecting to despise the accidental distinctions of birth and fortune, reserve their esteem for the superior qualities of the mind with which they themselves are so plentifully endowed. Julian might disdain the acclamations of a venal court, adore the imperial purple, but he was deeply flattered by the praise, the admonition, the freedom, and the envy of an independent philosopher, who refused his favors, loved his person, celebrated his fame, and protected his memory. The voluminous writings of Libanius still exist. For the most part, they are the vain and idle compositions of an orator who cultivated the science of words, the productions of a recluse student whose mind, regardless of his contemporaries, was incessantly fixed on the Trojan War and the Athenian Commonwealth. Yet the sophist of Antioch sometimes descended from this imaginary elevation. He entertained a various and elaborate correspondence. He praised the virtues of his own times. He boldly arranged the abuse of public and private life, and he eloquently pleaded the cause of Antioch against the just resentment of Julian and Theodosius. It is a common calamity of old age to lose whatever might have rendered it desirable, but Libanius experienced the peculiar misfortune of surviving the religion and the sciences to which he had consecrated his genius. The friend of Julian was an indignant spectator to the triumph of Christianity, and his bigotry, which darkened the prospect of the visible world, did not inspire Libanius with any lively hopes of celestial glory and happiness. End of chapter 24, part 1 Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors Finland. Chapter 24, Part 2 of the Deline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland. Chapter 24. The Retreat and Death of Julian, Part 2 The martial impatience of Julian urged him to take the field in the beginning of the spring, and he dismissed with contempt and reproach the Senate of Antioch, who accompanied the emperor beyond the limits of their own territory, to which he was resolved never to return. After a laborious march of two days, he halted at the third at Berea, or Aleppo, where he had the mortification of finding a senate almost entirely Christian, who received with cold and formal demonstrations of respect the eloquent sermon of the Apostle of Paganism, the son of one of the most illustrious citizens of Berea, who had embraced, either from interest or conscience, the religion of the emperor, was disinherited by his angry parent. The father and the son were invited to the imperial table. Julian, placing himself between them, attempted without success to inculcate the lesson and example of toleration, supported, with affected calmness, the indiscreet zeal of the aged Christian, who seemed to forget the sentiments of nature, and the duty of a subject, and at length, turning towards the afflicted youth, "'Since you have lost a father,' said he, "'for my sake, it is incumbent on me to supply his place.' The emperor was received in a manner much more agreeable to his wishes at Batne a small town pleasantly seated in a grove of cypresses, about twenty miles from the city of Hierapolis. 
The solemn rites of sacrifice were decently prepared by the inhabitants of Batne, who seemed attached to the worship of their tutelar deities, Apollo and Jupiter. But the serious piety of Julian was offended by the tumult of their applause, and he too clearly discerned that the smoke which arose from their altars was the incense of flattery rather than of devotion. The ancient and magnificent temple which had sanctified for so many ages the city of Hierapolis no longer subsisted, and the consecrated wealth, which afforded a liberal maintenance to more than three hundred priests, might hasten its downfall. Yet Julian enjoyed the satisfaction of embracing a philosopher and a friend, whose religious firmness had withstood the pressing and repeated solicitations of Constantius and Gallus, as often as those princes lodged at his house, in their passage through Hierapolis. In the hurry of military preparation, and the careless confidence of a familiar correspondence, the seal of Julian appears to have been lively and uniform. He had now undertaken an important and difficult war, and the anxiety of the event rendered him still more attentive to observe and register the most trifling presages, from which, according to the rules of divination, any knowledge of futurity could be derived. He informed Libanus of his progress as far as Hierapolis by an elegant epistle, which displays the faculty of his genius, and his tender friendship, for the sophist of Antioch. Hierapolis, situated almost on the banks of the Euphrates, had been appointed for the general rendezvous of the Roman troops, who immediately passed the great river on a bridge of boats, which was previously constructed. If the inclinations of Julian had been similar to those of his predecessor, he might have wasted this active and important season of the year in the circus of Samosa Tower in the churches of Edessa. But as the warlike emperor, instead of Constantius, had chosen Alexander for his model. He advanced without delay to Carhe, a very ancient city of Mesopotamia, at a distance of fourscore miles from Hierapolis. The Temple of the Moon attracted the devotion of Julian, but the halt of a few days was principally employed in completing the immense preparations of the Persian War. The secret of the expedition had hitherto remained in his own breast, but as Carhe is the point of separation of the two great roads, he could no longer conceal whether it was his design to attack the dominions of Sapor on the side of the Tigris, or on that of the Euphrates. The emperor detached an army of thirty thousand men under the command of his kinsman Procopius, and of Sebastian, who had been Duke of Egypt. They were ordered to direct their march towards Nisibis, and to secure the frontier from the desultory incursions of the enemy, before they attempted the passage of the Tigris. Their subsequent operations were left to the discretion of the generals, but Julian expected that after wasting with fire and sword the fertile districts of Media and Adiabene, they might arrive under the walls of Ctesiphon at the same time that he himself, advancing with equal steps along the banks of the Euphrates, should besiege the capital of the Persian monarchy. The success of this well-concerted plan depended, in a great measure, on the powerful and ready assistance of the king of Armenia, who, without exposing the safety of his own dominions, might detach an army of four thousand horse and twenty thousand foot to the assistance of the Romans. But the feeble Arsacesis Tyrannus, king of Armenia, had degenerated still more shamefully than his father Cosroes from the manly virtues of the great Tiridates. And as the pusillanimous monarch was averse to any enterprise of danger and glory, he could disguise his timid indolence by the more decent excuses of religion and gratitude. He expressed a pious attachment to the memory of Constantius, from whose hands he had received in marriage Olympias, the daughter of the prefect Ablavius, and the alliance of a female, who had been educated as the distant wife of the emperor Constans, exalted the dignity of a barbarian king. Tyrannus professed the Christian religion. He reigned over a nation of Christians, and he was restrained by every principle of conscience and interest from contributing to the victory, which would consummate the ruin of the church. The alienated mind of Tyrannus was exasperated by the indiscretion of Julian, who treated the king of Armenia as his slave, and as the enemy of the gods. The haughty and threatening style of the imperial mandates awakened the secret indignations of a prince, who, in the humiliating state of dependence, was still conscious of his royal descent from the Arsacides, the lords of the east, and the rivals of the Roman power. The military dispositions of Julian were skilfully contrived to deceive the spies and to divert the attention of Sapor, 
The legions appeared to direct their march towards Nisibis and the Tigris. On a sudden they wheeled to the right, traversed the level and naked plain of Karhe, and reached, on the third day, the banks of the Euphrates, where the strong town of Niseporium, or Kalinicum, had been founded by the Macedonian kings. From thence the emperor pursued his march, above ninety miles, along the winding stream of the Euphrates, till at last, about one month after his departure from Antioch, he discovered the towers of Circesium, the extreme limit of the Roman dominions. The army of Julian, the most numerous that any of the Caesars had ever led against Persia, consisted of sixty-five thousand effective and well-disciplined soldiers. The veteran bands of cavalry and infantry, of Romans and barbarians, had been selected from the different provinces, and a just pre-eminence of loyalty and valor was claimed by the hardy Gauls, who guarded the throne and person of their beloved prince. A formidable body of Scythian auxiliaries had been transported from another climate, and almost from another world, to invade a distant country, of whose name and situation they were ignorant. The love of rapine and war allured to the imperial standard several tribes of Saracens, or roving Arabs, whose service Julian had commanded, while he sternly refused the payment of their customary subsidies. The broad channel of the Euphrates was crowded by a fleet of eleven hundred ships, destined to attend the motions and to satisfy the wants of the Roman army. The military strength of the fleet was composed of fifty armed galleys, and these were accompanied by an equal number of flat-bottomed boats, which might occasionally be connected into the form of temporary bridges. The rest of the ships partly constructed of timber, and partly covered with raw hides, were laden with an almost inexhaustible supply of arms and engines, of utensils and provisions. The vigilant humanity of Julian had embarked a very large magazine of vinegar and biscuit for the use of the soldiers, but he prohibited the indulgence of wine, and rigorously stopped a long string of superfluous camels that attempted to follow the rear of the army. The river Caboras falls into the Euphrates at Circesium, and as soon as the trumpet gave the signal of march, the Romans passed the little stream which separated two mighty and hostile empires. The custom of ancient discipline required a military oration, and Julian embraced every opportunity of displaying his eloquence. He animated the impatient and attentive legions by the example of the inflexible courage and glorious triumph of their ancestors. He excited their resentment by a lively picture of the insolence of the Persians, and he exhorted them to imitate his firm resolution, either to extirpate that perfidious nation, or to devote his life in the cause of the Republic. The eloquence of Julian was enforced by a donative of one hundred and thirty pieces of silver to every soldier, and the bridge of the Caboras was instantly cut away, to convince the troops that they must place their hopes of safety in the success of their arms. Yet the prudence of the emperor induced him to secure a remote frontier, perpetually exposed to the inroads of the hostile Arabs. A detachment of four thousand men was left at Circesium, which completed, to the number of ten thousand, the regular garrison of that important fortress. From the moment that the Romans entered the enemy's country, the country of an active and artful enemy, the order of march was disposed in three columns. The strength of the infantry, and consequently of the whole army, was placed in the centre, under the peculiar command of their master-general Victor. On the right, the brave Nevita led a column of several legions along the banks of the Euphrates, and almost always in sight of the fleet. The left flank of the army was protected by the column of cavalry. Hormisdas and Arinteus were appointed generals of the horse, and the singular adventures of Hormisdas are not undeserving of an hour notice. He was a Persian prince of the royal race of the Sassanids, who, in the troubles of the minority of Sapor, had escaped from prison to the hospitable court of the great Constantine. Hormisdas at first excited the compassion, and at length acquired the esteem of his new masters. His valor and fidelity raised him to the military honors of the Roman service, and though a Christian, he might indulge the secret satisfaction of convincing his ungrateful country that an oppressed subject may prove the most dangerous enemy. Such was the disposition of the three principal columns. The front and flanks of the army were covered by Lucinianus, with a flying detachment of fifteen hundred light-armed soldiers, whose active vigilance observed the most distant signs and conveyed the earliest notice of any hostile approach. 
Dagalaipus and Secundinus, Duke of Osrohene, conducted the troops of the rear guard. The baggage securely proceeded in, in the intervals of the columns, and the ranks, from a motive either of use or ostentation, were formed in such open order that the whole line of march extended almost ten miles. The ordinary post of Julian was at the head of the centre column, but as he preferred the duties of a general to the state of a monarch, he rapidly moved, with a small escort of light cavalry, to the front, the rear, the flanks, wherever his presence could animate or protect the march of the Roman army. The country which they traversed from the Caboras to the cultivated lands of Assyria may be considered as a part of the desert of Arabia, a dry and barren waste, which could never be improved by the most powerful arts of human industry. Julian marched over the same ground which had been trod above seven hundred years before by the footsteps of the younger Cyrus, and which is described by one of the companions of his expedition, the sage and the heroic Xenophon. The country was a plain throughout, as even as the sea, and full of wormwood, and if any other kinds of shrubs or reeds grew there, they had all an aromatic smell, but no trees could be seen. Bustards and ostriches, antelopes and wild asses, appeared to be the only inhabitants of the desert, and the fatigues of the march were alleviated by the amusement of the chase. The loose sand of the desert was frequently raised by the wind into clouds of dust, and a great number of the soldiers of Julian, with their tents, were suddenly thrown to the ground by the violence of an unexpected hurricane. The sandy plains of Mesopotamia were abandoned to the antelopes and wild asses of the desert, but a variety of populous towns and villages were pleasantly situated on the banks of the Euphrates, and in the islands which are occasionally formed by that river. The city of Anna, or Anato, the actual residence of an Arabian emir, is composed of two long streets, which enclose, within a natural fortification, a small island in the midst, and two fruitful spots on either side of the Euphrates. The warlike inhabitants of Anato showed a disposition to stop the march of the Roman Empire, till they were diverted from such fatal presumption by the mild exhortations of Prince Hormistas, and the approaching terrors of the fleet and army. They implored, and experienced, the clemency of Julian, who transplanted the people to an advantageous settlement near Calchis in Syria, and admitted Puseus, the governor, to an honorable rank in his service and friendship. But the impregnable fortress of Tiluta could scorn the menace of a siege, and the emperor was obliged to content himself with an insulting promise that, when he had subdued the interior provinces of Persia, Tiluta would no longer refuse to grace the triumph of the emperor. The inhabitants of the open towns, unable to resist, and unwilling to yield, fled with precipitation, and their houses, filled with spoil and provisions, were occupied by the soldiers of Julian, who massacred, without remorse and without punishment, some defenseless women. During the march, the Surenas, or Persian general, and Malek Rodosaches, the renowned emir of the tribe of Gassan, incessantly hovered around the army. Every straggler was intercepted, every detachment was attacked, and the valiant Hormistas escaped with some difficulty from their hands. But the barbarians were finally repulsed, the country became every day less favorable to the operations of cavalry, and when the Romans arrived at Maceprecta, they perceived the ruins of the wall, which had been constructed by the ancient kings of Assyria, to secure their dominions from the incursions of the Medes. These preliminaries of the expedition of Julian appear to have employed about fifteen days, and we may compute near three hundred miles from the fortress of Circesium to the wall of Maceprecta. The fertile province of Assyria, which stretched beyond the Tigris as far as the mountains of Media, extended about four hundred miles from the ancient walls of Maceprecta, to the territory of Basra, where the united streams of the Euphrates and Tigris discharged themselves into the Persian Gulf. The whole country might have claimed the peculiar name of Mesopotamia, as the two rivers, which are never more distant than fifty, approach between Baghdad and Babylon within twenty-five miles of each other. A multitude of artificial canals, dug without much labor in a soft and yielding soil, connected the rivers, and they intersected the plain of Assyria. The uses of these artificial canals were various and important. They served to discharge the superfluous waters from one river into the other, at the season of their respective inundations, 
subdividing themselves into smaller and smaller branches. They refreshed the dry lands and supplied the deficiency of rain. They facilitated the intercourse of peace and commerce, and, as the dams could be speedily broken down, they armed the despair of the Assyrians with the means of opposing a sudden deluge to the progress of an invading army. To the soil and climate of Assyria, nature had denied some of her choicest gifts, the vine, the olive, and the fig tree, but the food which supports the life of a man, and particularly wheat and barley, were produced with inexhaustible fertility, and the husbandman, who committed his seeds to the earth, was frequently rewarded with an increase of two, or even of three hundred. The face of the country was interspersed with groves of innumerable palm trees, and the diligent natives celebrated, either in verse or prose, the three hundred and sixty uses to which the trunk, the branches, the leaves, the juice, and the fruit were skilfully applied. Several manufactures, especially those of leather and linen, employed the industry of a numerous people, and afforded valuable materials for foreign trade, which appears, however, to have been conducted by the hands of strangers. Babylon had been converted into a royal park, but near the ruins of the ancient capital, new cities had successively arisen, and the populousness of the country was displayed in the multitude of towns and villages, which were built of bricks dried in the sun, and strongly cemented with bitumen, the natural and peculiar production of the Babylonian soil. While the successors of Cyrus reigned over Asia, the province of Syria alone maintained, during a third part of the year, the luxurious plenty of the table and household of the great king. Four considerable villages were assigned for the subsistence of his Indian dogs. Eight hundred stallions and sixteen thousand mares were constantly kept at the expense of the country for the royal stables, and as the daily tribute, which was paid to the satrap, amounted to one English bushel of silver, we may compute the annual revenue of Assyria at more than twelve hundred thousand pounds sterling. End of chapter 24, part 2 A Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland Chapter 24, part 3 Of the Deline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland. Chapter 24. The Retreat and Death of Julian. Part 3. The fields of Assyria were devoted by Julian to the calamities of war, and the philosopher retaliated on a guiltless people the acts of rapine and cruelty which had been committed by their haughty master in the Roman provinces. The trembling Assyrians summoned the rivers to their assistance, and completed, with their own hands, the ruin of their country. The roads were rendered impracticable, a flood of waters was poured into the camp, and, during several days, the troops of Julian were obliged to contend with the most discouraging hardships. But every obstacle was surmounted by the perseverance of the legionaries, who were inured to toil as well as to danger, and who felt themselves animated by the spirit of their leader. The damage was gradually repaired, the waters were restored to their proper channels, whole groves of palm trees were cut down and placed along the broken parts of the road, and the army passed over the broad and deeper canals, on bridges of floating rafts, which were supported by the help of bladders. Two cities of Assyria presumed to resist the arms of Roman Empire, and they both paid the severe penalty of their rashness. At the distance of fifty miles from the royal residence of Tesiphon, Perisabor, or Anbar, held the second rank in the province, a city, large, populous, and well fortified, surrounded with a double wall, almost encompassed by a branch of the Euphrates, and defended by the valor of a numerous garrison. The exhortations of Hormistas were repulsed with contempt, and the ears of the Persian prince were wounded by a just reproach, that, unmindful of his royal birth, he conducted an army of strangers against his king and country. The Assyrians maintained their loyalty by a skilful as well as vigorous defense, till the lucky stroke of a battering ram, having opened a large breach by shattering one of the angles of the wall, they hastily retired into the fortifications of the interior citadel. The soldiers of Julian rushed impetuously into the town, and after the full gratification of every military appetite, Perisabor was reduced to ashes, and the engines which assaulted the citadel were planted in the ruins of the smoking houses. 
The contest was continued by an incessant and mutual discharge of missile weapons, and the superiority which the Romans might derive from the mechanical powers of the balliste and catapulte was counterbalanced by the advantage of the ground on the side of the besieged. But as soon as an heliopolis had been constructed, which could engage on equal terms with the loftiest ramparts, the tremendous aspect of a moving turret that would leave no hope of resistance or mercy terrified the defenders of the citadel into a humble submission, and the place was surrendered only two days after Julian first appeared under the walls of Perisabor. Two thousand five hundred persons of both sexes, the feeble remnant of a flourishing people, were permitted to retire. The plentiful magazines of corn, of arms, and of splendid furniture were partly distributed among the troops, and partly reserved for the public service. The useless stores were destroyed by fire, or thrown into the stream of the Euphrates, and the fate of Amida was revenged by the total ruin of Perisabor. The city, or rather fortress, of Maugamalcha, which was defended by sixteen large towers, a deep ditch, and two strong and solid walls of brick and bitumen, appears to have been constructed at the distance of eleven miles, as the safeguard of the capital of Persia. The emperor, apprehensive of leaving such an important fortress in his rear, immediately formed the siege of Maugamalcha, and the Roman army was distributed for that purpose into three divisions. Victor, at the head of the cavalry, and a detachment of heavy armed foot, was ordered to clear the country, as far as the banks of the Tigris, and the suburbs of Ctesiphon. The conduct of the attack was assumed by Julian himself, who seemed to place his whole dependence in the military engines which he erected against the walls, while he secretly contrived a more efficacious method of introducing his troops into the heart of the city. Under the direction of Nevita and Dagalaipus, the trenches were opened at a considerable distance and gradually prolonged as far as the edge of the ditch. The ditch was speedily filled with earth, and by the incessant labor of the troops, a mine was carried under the foundations of the walls, and sustained at sufficient intervals by props of timber. Three chosen cohorts, advancing in single file, silently explored the dark and dangerous passage, till their intrepid leader whispered back the intelligence that he was ready to issue from his confinement into the streets of the hostile city. Julian checked their ardor that he might ensure their success, and immediately diverted the attention of the garrison by the tumult and clamor of a general assault. The Persians, who, from their walls, contemptuously beheld the progress of an impotent attack, celebrated with songs of triumph the glory of Sapor, and ventured to assure the emperor that he might ascend the starry mansion of Ormuzd before he could hope to take the impregnable city of Maugamalcha. The city was already taken, History has recorded the name of a private soldier, the first who ascended from the mine into a deserted tower. The passage was widened by his companions, who pressed forward with impatient valor. Fifteen hundred enemies were already in the midst of the city. The astonished garrison abandoned the walls, and their only hope of safety. The gates were instantly burst open, and the revenge of the soldier, unless it were suspended by lust or avarice, was satiated by an undistinguishing massacre. The governor, who had yielded on a premise of mercy, was burnt alive a few days afterwards, on a charge of having uttered some disrespectful words against the honor of Prince Hormistus. The fortifications were razed to the ground, and not a vestige was left that the city of Maugamalcha had ever existed. The neighborhood of the capital of Persia was adorned with three stately palaces, laboriously enriched with every production that could gratify the luxury and pride of an eastern monarch. The pleasant situation of the gardens along the banks of the Tigris was improved, according to the Persian taste, by the symmetry of flowers, fountains, and shady walks, and spacious parks were enclosed for the reception of the bears, lions, and wild boars, which were maintained at a considerable expense for the pleasure of the royal chase. The park walls were broken down, the savage game was abandoned to the darts of the soldiers, and the palaces of Sapor were reduced to ashes by the command of the Roman emperor. Julian, on this occasion, showed himself ignorant or careless of the laws of civility, which the prudence and refinement of polished ages have established between hostile princes. Yet these wanton ravages need not excite in our breasts any vehement emotions of pity or resentment. A simple naked statue, finished by the hand of a Grecian artist, 
is of more genuine value than all these rude and costly monuments of barbaric labor. And, if we are more deeply affected by the ruin of a palace than by the conflagration of a cottage, our humanity must have formed a very erroneous estimate of the miseries of human life. Julian was an object of hatred and terror to the Persian, and the painters of that nation represented the invader of their country under the emblem of a furious lion who vomited from his mouth a consuming fire. To his friends and soldiers the philosophic hero appeared in a more amiable light, and his virtues were never more conspicuously displayed than in the last and most active period of his life. He practiced, without effort, and almost without merit, the habitual qualities of temperance and sobriety, according to the dictates of that artificial wisdom which assumes an absolute dominion of the mind and body, he sternly refused himself the indulgence of the most natural appetites. In the warm climate of Assyria, which solicited a luxurious people to the gratification of every sensual desire, a youthful conqueror preserved his chastity pure and inviolate. Nor was Julian ever tempted, even by a motive of curiosity, to visit his female captives of exquisite beauty, who, instead of resisting his power, would have disputed with each other the honor of his embraces. With the same firmness that he resisted the allurements of love, he sustained the hardships of war. When the Romans marched through the flat and flooded country, their sovereign on foot, at the head of his legions, shared their fatigues and animated their diligence. In every useful labor, the hand of Julian was prompt and stenuous, and the imperial purple was wet and dirty as the coarse garment of the meanest soldier. The two sieges allowed him some remarkable opportunities of signalizing his personal valor, which, in the improved state of the military art, can seldom be exerted by a prudent general. The emperor stood before the citadel of Perisabor, insensible of his extreme danger, and encouraged his troops to burst open the gates of iron, till he was almost overwhelmed under the cloud of missile weapons and huge stones that were directed against his person. As he examined the exterior fortifications of Mao Gamalcha, two persons, devoting themselves for their country, suddenly rushed upon him with drawn scimitars. The emperor dexterously received their blows on his uplifted shield, and, with a steady and well-aimed thrust, led one of his adversaries dead at his feet. The esteem of a prince who possesses the virtues which he approves is the noblest recompense of a deserving subject, and the authority which Julian derived from his personal merit enabled him to revive and enforce the rigor of ancient discipline. He punished with death or ignominy the misbehavior of three troops of horse, who, in a skirmish with the Surenas, had lost their honor and one of their standards, and he distinguished with obsidional crowns the valor of the foremost soldiers who had ascended into the city of Mao Gamalcha. After the siege of Perisabur, the firmness of the emperor was exercised by the insolent avarice of the army, who loudly complained that their services were rewarded by a trifling donative of one hundred pieces of silver. His just indignation was expressed in the grave and manly language of a Roman. Riches are the objects of your desires. Those riches are in the hands of the Persians, and the spoils of this fruitful country are proposed as the price of your valor and discipline. Believe me, added Julian, the Roman Republic, which formerly possessed such immense treasures, is now reduced to want and wretchedness once our princes have been persuaded by weak and interested ministers to purchase with gold the tranquillity of the barbarians. The revenue is exhausted, the cities are ruined, the provinces are dispeopled. For myself, the only inheritance that I have received from my royal ancestors is a soul incapable of fear, and as long as I am convinced that every real advantage is seated in the mind, I shall not blush to acknowledge an honorable poverty, which in the days of ancient virtue was considered as the glory of Fabricius. That glory and that virtue may be your own, you will listen to the voice of heaven and your leader. But if you will rashly persist, if you are determined to renew the shameful and mischievous examples of old seditions, proceed. As it becomes an emperor who has filled the first rank among men, I am prepared to die standing and to despise a precarious life, which every hour may depend on an accidental fever. If I have been found unworthy of the command, there are now among you, I speak it with pride and pleasure, there are many chiefs whose merit and experience are equal to the conduct of the most important war. 
Such has been the temper of my reign, that I can retire without regret and without apprehension to the obscurity of a private station. The modest resolution of Julian was answered by the unanimous applause and cheerful obedience of the Romans, who declared their confidence of victory, while they fought under the banners of their heroic prince. Their courage was kindled by his frequent and familiar recitations, for such wishes were the oaths of Julian. So may I reduce the Persians under the yoke. Thus may I restore the strength and splendor of the Republic. The love of fame was the ardent passion of his soul, but it was not before he trampled on the ruins of Mao Gamalcha that he allowed himself to say, We have now provided some materials for the sophist of Antioch. The successful valor of Julian had triumphed over all the obstacles that opposed his march to the gates of Ptesiphon, but the reduction, or even the siege, of the capital of Persia was still at a distance, nor can the military conduct of the emperor be clearly apprehended without a knowledge of the country, which was the theatre of his bold and skilful operations. Twenty miles to the south of Baghdad, and on the eastern banks of the Tigris, the curiosity of travellers has observed some ruins of the palaces of Ctesiphon, which in the time of Julian was a great and populous city. The name and glory of the adjacent Seleucia were forever extinguished, and the only remaining quarter of that Greek colony had resumed, with the Assyrian language and manners, the primitive appellation of Okoche. Kochi was situated on the western side of the Tigris, but it was naturally considered as a suburb of Ctesiphon, with which we may suppose it to have been connected by a permanent bridge of boats. The united parts contribute to form the common epithet of Almodain, the cities, which the Orientals have bestowed on the winter residence of the Sassanids, and the whole circumference of the Persian capital was strongly fortified by the waters of the river, by lofty walls, and by impracticable morasses. Near the ruins of Seleucia, the camp of Julian was fixed, and secured by a ditch and rampart, against the sallies of the numerous and enterprising garrison of Coche. In this fruitful and pleasant country, the Romans were plentifully supplied with water and forage, and several forts, which might have embarrassed the motions of the army, submitted, after some resistance, to the efforts of their valor. The fleet passed from the Euphrates into an artificial derivation of that river, which pours a copious and navigable stream into the Tigris, the small distance below the great city. If they had followed this royal canal, which bore the name of Nahar Malcha, the intermediate situation of Koche would have separated the fleet and army of Julian, and the rash attempt of steering against the current of the Tigris, and forcing their way through the midst of a hostile capital, must have been attended with the total destruction of the Roman navy. The prudence of the emperor foresaw the danger, and provided the remedy. As he had minutely studied the operations of Trajan in the same country, he soon recollected that his warlike predecessor had dug a new and navigable canal, which, leaving Kochi on the right hand, conveyed the waters of the Nahar Malcha into the river Tigris, at some distance above the cities. From the information of the peasants, Julian ascertained the vestiges of this ancient work, which were almost obliterated by design or accident. By the indefatigable labor of the soldiers, a broad and deep channel was speedily prepared for the reception of the Euphrates. A strong dike was constructed to interrupt the ordinary current of the Nahar Malcha. A flood of waters rushed impetuously into the new bed, and the Roman fleet, steering their triumphant course into the Tigris, derided the vain and ineffectual barriers which the persons of Ctesiphon had erected to oppose their passage. As it became necessary to transport the Roman army over the Tigris, another labor presented itself, of less toil, but of more danger than the preceding expedition. The stream was broad and rapid, the ascent steep and difficult, and the entrenchments which had been formed on the ridge of the opposite bank were lined with a numerous army of heavy cuirassiers, dexterous archers, and huge elephants, who, according to the extravagant hyperbole of Libanius, could trample with the same ease a field of corn or a legion of Romans. In the presence of such an army, the construction of a bridge was impracticable, and the intrepid prince, who instantly seized the only possible expedient, concealed his design, till the moment of execution, from the knowledge of the barbarians, of his own troops, and even of his generals themselves. Under the specious pretense of examining the state of the magazines, fourscore vessels were gradually unladen, and a select detachment, apparently destined for some secret expedition, was ordered to stand to their arms on the first signal. 
Julian disguised the silent anxiety of his own mind with smiles of confidence and joy, and amused the hostile nations with the spectacle of military games, which he insultingly celebrated under the walls of Coche. The day was consecrated to pleasure, but, as soon as the hour of supper was passed, the emperor summoned the generals to his tent, and acquainted them that he had fixed the night for the passage of the Tigris. They stood in silent and respectful astonishment, but when the venerable Sallust assumed the privilege of his age and experience, the rest of the chiefs supported with freedom the weight of his prudent remonstrances. Julian contented himself with observing that conquest and safety depended on the attempt that instead of diminishing the number of their enemies would be increased by successive reinforcements, and that a longer delay would neither contract the breadth of the stream nor level the heights of the bank. The signal was instantly given, and obeyed. The most impatient of the legionaries leaped into five vessels that lay nearest to the bank, and as they plied their oars with intrepid diligence, they were lost after a few moments in the darkness of the night. A flame arose on the opposite side, and Julian, who too clearly understood that his foremost vessels, in attempting to land, had been fired by the enemy, dexterously converted their extreme danger into a presage of victory. "'Our fellow soldiers!' he eagerly exclaimed. "'Are already masters of the bank. See, they make the appointed signal. Let us hasten to emulate and assist their courage.' The united and rapid motion of a great fleet broke the violence of the current, and they reached the eastern shore of the Tigris with sufficient speed to extinguish the flames and rescue their adventurous companions. The difficulties of a steep and lofty ascent were increased by the weight of armor and the darkness of the night. A shower of stones, darts, and fire was incessantly discharged on the heads of the assailants, who, after an arduous struggle, climbed the bank and stood victorious upon the rampart. As soon as they possessed a more equal field, Julian, who with his light infantry had led the attack, darted through the ranks a skilful and experienced eye. His bravest soldiers, according to the precepts of Homer, were distributed in the front and rear, and all the trumpets of the imperial army sounded to battle. The Romans, after sending up a military shout, advanced in measured steps to the animating notes of martial music, launched their formidable javelins, and rushed forwards with drawn swords to deprive the barbarians by a closer onset of the advantage of their missile weapons. The whole engagement lasted above twelve hours, till the gradual retreat of the Persians was changed into a disorderly flight, of which the shameful example was given by the principal leader, and the Surinas himself. They were pursued to the gates of Ctesiphon, and the conquerors might have entered the dismayed city, if their general Victor, who was dangerously wounded with an arrow, had not conjured them to desist from a rash attempt, which must be fatal, if it were not successful. On their side, the Romans acknowledged the loss of only seventy-five men, while they affirmed that the barbarians had left on the field of battle two thousand five hundred or even six thousand of their bravest soldiers. The spoil was such as might be expected from the riches and luxury of an oriental camp. Large qualities of silver and gold, splendid arms and trappings, and beds and tables of massy silver. The victorious emperor distributed, as the rewards of valor, some honorable gifts, civic and mural, and naval crowns, which he, and perhaps he alone, esteemed more precious than the wealth of Asia. A solemn sacrifice was offered to the god of war, but the appearances of the victims threatened the most inauspicious events, and Julian soon discovered, by less ambiguous signs, that he had now reached the term of his prosperity. On the second day after the battle, the domestic guards, the Jovans and Herculeans, and the remaining troops, which composed near two-thirds of the whole army, were securely wafted over the Tigris, while the Persians beheld from the walls of Ctesiphon the desolation of the adjacent country, Julian cast many an anxious look towards the north, in full expectation that as he himself had victoriously penetrated to the capital of Sapur, the march and junction of his lieutenants, Sebastian and Procopius, would be executed with the same courage and diligence. His expectations were disappointed by the treachery of the Armenian king, who permitted, and most probably directed, the desertion of his auxiliary troops from the camp of the Romans, and by the dissensions of the two generals, who were incapable of forming or executing any plan for the public service. When the emperor had relinquished the hope of this important reinforcement, 
he condescended to hold a council of war, and approved, after a full debate, the sentiments of those generals who dissuaded the siege of Ctesiphon as a fruitless and pernicious undertaking. It is not easy for us to conceive by what arts of fortification a city thrice besieged and taken by the predecessors of Julian could be rendered impregnable against an army of sixty thousand Romans, commanded by a brave and experienced general, and abundantly supplied with ships, provisions, battering engines, and military stores. But we may rest assured that the love of glory and contempt of danger, which formed the character of Julian, that he was not discouraged by any trivial or imaginary obstacles. At the very time when he declined the siege of Ctesiphon, he rejected with obstinacy and disdain the most flattering offers of negotiation of peace. Sapor, who had been so long accustomed to the tardy ostentations of Constantius, was surprised by the intrepid diligence of his successor. As far as the confines of India and Scythia, the satraps of the distant provinces were ordered to assemble their troops, and to march without delay to the assistance of their monarch. But their preparations were dilatory, their motions slow, and before Sapor could lead an army into the field, he received the melancholy intelligence of the devastation of Assyria, the ruin of his palaces, and the slaughter of his bravest troops, who defended the passage of the Tigris. The pride of royalty was humbled in the dust. He took his repast on the ground, and the disorder of his hair expressed the grief and anxiety of his mind. Perhaps he would not have refused to purchase, with one half of his kingdom, the safety of the remainder, and he would have gladly subscribed himself in a treaty of peace, the faithful and dependent ally of the Roman conqueror. Under the pretense of private business, a minister of rank and confidence was secretly dispatched to embrace the niece of Horemistas, and to request, in the language of a suppliant, that he might be introduced into the presence of the emperor. The Sassanian prince, whether he listened to the voice of pride or humanity, whether he consulted the sentiments of his birth or the duties of his situation, was equally inclined to promote a salutary measure, which would terminate the calamities of Persia, and secure the triumph of Rome. He was astonished by the inflexible firmness of a hero, who remembered, most unfortunately for himself and for his country, that Alexander had uniformly rejected the propositions of Darius. But as Julian was sensible, that the hope of a safe and honorable peace might cool the ardor of his troops, he earnestly requested that Hormisdas would privately dismiss the meeting of Sapor, and conceal this dangerous temptation from the knowledge of the camp. End of chapter 24, part 3 Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland Chapter 24, part 4 of The Deline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland. Chapter 24. The Retreat and Death of Julian, Part 4. The honor, as well as intent, of Julian forbade him to consume his tide under the impregnable walls of Ctesiphon, and as often as he defied the barbarians who defended the city to meet him on the open plain, they prudently replied that if he desired to exercise his valor, he might seek the army of the great king. He felt the insult, and he accepted the advice. Instead of confining his servile march to the banks of the Euphrates and Tigris, he resolved to imitate the adventurous spirit of Alexander, and boldly to advance into the inland provinces, till he forced his rival to contend with him, perhaps in the plains of Arbela, for the empire of Asia. The magnanimity of Julian was applauded and betrayed by the arts of a noble Persian, who, in the cause of his country, had generously submitted to act a part full of danger, of falsehood, and of shame. With a train of faithful followers, he deserted to the imperial camp, exposed in a specious tale the injuries which he had sustained, exaggerated the cruelty of Sapor, the discontent of the people, and the weakness of the monarchy, and confidently offered himself as the hostage and guide of the Roman march. The most rational grounds of suspicion were urged, without effect, by the wisdom and experience of Hormistas, and the credulous Julian, receiving the traitor into his bosom, was persuaded to issue a hasty order, which, in the opinion of mankind, appeared to arraign his prudence and to endanger his safety. He destroyed, in a single hour, 
the whole navy which had been transported about five hundred miles at so great an expense of toil of treasure and of blood twelve or at the most twenty-two small vessels were saved to accompany on carriages the march of the army and to form occasional bridges for the passage of the rivers a supply of twenty days provisions was reserved for the use of the soldiers and the rest of the magazines with a fleet of eleven hundred vessels which rode at anchor in the tigris were abandoned to the flames by the absolute command of the emperor the christian bishops gregory and augustine insult the madness of the apostate who executed with his own hands the sentence of divine justice their authority of less weight perhaps in a military question is confirmed by the cool judgment of an experienced soldier who was himself spectator of the conflagration and who could not disapprove the reluctant murmurs of the troops yet there are not wanting some specious and perhaps solid reasons which might justify the resolution of julian the navigation of the euphrates never ascended above babylon nor that of the tigris above opis the distance of the last mentioned city from the roman camp was not very considerable and julian must soon have renounced the vain and impracticable attempt of forcing upward a great fleet against the stream of a rapid river which in several places was embarrassed by natural or artificial cataracts the power of sails and oars was insufficient it became necessary to tow the ships against the current of the river the strength of twenty thousand soldiers was exhausted in this tedious and servile labour and if the romans continued to march along the banks of the tigris they could only expect to return home without achieving any enterprise worthy of the genius or fortune of their leader if on the contrary it was advisable to advance into the inland country the destruction of the fleet and magazines was the only measure which could save that valuable prize from the hands of the numerous and active troops which might suddenly be poured from the gates of ctesiphon had the arms of julian been victorious we should now admire the conduct as well as the courage of a hero who depriving his soldiers of the hopes of retreat left them only the alternative of death or conquest the cumbersome train of artillery and wagons which retards the operations of a modern army were in a great measure unknown in the camps of the romans yet in every age the subsistence of sixty thousand men must have been one of the most important cares of a prudent general and that subsistence could only be drawn from his own or from the enemy's country had it been possible for julian to maintain a bridge for communication on the tigris and to preserve the conquered places of assyria a desolated province could not afford any large or regular supplies in a season of the year when the lands were covered by the inundation of the euphrates and the unwholesome air was darkened with swarms of innumerable insects the appearance of the hostile country was far more inviting the extensive region that lies between the river tigris and the mountains of media was filled with villages and towns and the fertile soil for the most part was in a very improved state of cultivation julian might expect that a conqueror who possessed the two forcible instruments of persuasion steel and gold would easily procure a plentiful subsistence from the fears or avarice of the natives but on the approach of the romans the rich and smiling prospect was instantly blasted wherever they moved the inhabitants deserted the open villages and took shelter in the fortified towns the cattle was driven away the grass and ripe corn were consumed with fire and as soon as the flames had subsided which interrupted the march of julian he beheld the melancholy face of a smoking and naked desert this desperate but effectual method of defence can only be executed by the enthusiasm of a people who prefer their independence to their property or by the rigour of an arbitrary government who consults the public safety without submitting to their inclinations the liberty of choice on the present occasion the zeal and obedience of the persians seconded the commands of sapor and the emperor was soon reduced to the scanty stock of provisions which continually wasted in his hands before they were entirely consumed he might still have reached the wealthy and unwarlike cities of ecbatana or susa by the effort of a rapid and well-directed march but he was deprived of this last resource by his ignorance of the roads and by the perfidy of his guides the romans wandered several days in the country to the eastward of baghdad the persian deserted who had artfully led them into despair escaped from their resentment and his followers as soon as they were put to the torture confessed the secret of the conspiracy the visionary conquest of hyrcania and india which had so long amused now tormented the mind of julian conscious that his own imprudence was the cause of the public distress 
he anxiously balanced the hopes of safety or success, without obtaining a satisfactory answer, either from gods or men. At length, at length, as the only practicable measure, he embraced the resolution of directing his steps towards the banks of the Tigris, with the design of saving the army by a hasty march to the confines of Corduene, a fertile and friendly province, which acknowledged the sovereignty of Rome. The desponding troops obeyed the signal of the retreat, only seventy days after they had passed the Chaboras, of the sanguine expectation of subverting the throne of Persia. As long as the Romans seemed to advance into the country, their march was observed and insulted from a distance by several bodies of Persian cavalry, who, showing themselves sometimes in loose and sometimes in close order, faintly skirmished with the advanced guards. These detachments were, however, supported by a much greater force, and the heads of the columns were no sooner pointed towards the Tigris than a cloud of dust arose on the plain. The Romans, who now aspired only to the permission of a safe and speedy retreat, endeavoured to persuade themselves that this formidable appearance was occasioned by a troop of wild asses, or perhaps by the approach of some friendly Arabs. They halted, pitched their tents, fortified their camp, passed the whole night in continual alarms, and discovered, at the dawn of day, that they were surrounded by an army of Persians. This army, which might be considered only as the van of the barbarians, was soon followed by the main body of cuirassiers, archers and elephants, commanded by Miranes, a general of rank and reputation. He was accompanied by two of the king's sons, and many of the principal satraps, and fame and expectation exaggerated the strength of the remaining powers, which slowly advanced under the conduct of Sapor himself. As the Romans continued their march, their long array, which was forced to bend or divide, according to the varieties of the ground, afforded frequent and favorable opportunities to their vigilant enemies. The Persians repeatedly charged with fury, they were repeatedly repulsed with firmness, and the action at Maronga, which almost deserved the name of a battle, was marked by a considerable loss of satraps and elephants, perhaps of equal value in the eyes of their monarch. These splendid advantages were not obtained without an adequate slaughter on the side of the Romans. Several officers of distinction were either killed or wounded, and the emperor himself, who, on all occasions of danger, inspired and guided the valor of his troops, was obliged to expose his person and exert his abilities. The weight of offensive and defensive arms, which still constituted the strength and safety of the Romans, disabled them from making any long or effectual pursuit and as the horsemen of the east were trained to dart their javelins and shoot their arrows at full speed and in every possible direction, the cavalry of Persia was never more formidable than in the moment of a rapid and disorderly flight. But the most certain and irreparable loss of the Romans was that of time. The hardy veterans, accustomed to the cold climate of Gaul and Germany, fainted under the sultry heat of an Assyrian summer. Their vigor was exhausted by the incessant repetition of march and combat, and the progress of the army was suspended by the precautions of a slow and dangerous retreat in the presence of an active enemy. Every day, every hour, as the supply diminished, the value and price of subsistence increased in the Roman camp. Julian, who always contented himself with such food as a hungry soldier would have disdained, distributed for the use of the troops the provisions of the imperial household, and whatever could be spared from the sumpter horses of the tribunes and generals. But this feeble relief served only to aggravate the sense of the public distress, and the Romans began to entertain the most gloomy apprehensions that, before they could reach the frontiers of the empire, they should all perish, either by famine or by the sword of the barbarians. While Julian struggled with the almost insuperable difficulties of his situation, the silent hours of the night were still devoted to study and contemplation. Whenever he closed his eyes in short and interrupted slumbers, his mind was agitated with painful anxiety, nor can it be thought surprising that the genius of the empire should once more appear before him, covering with a funeral veil his head and his horn of abundance, and slowly retiring from the imperial tent. The monarch started from his couch, and stepping forth to refresh his wearied spirits with the coolness of the midnight air, he beheld a fiery meteor which shot toward the sky and suddenly vanished. Julian was convinced that he had seen the menacing countenance of the god of war, the council which he summoned of Tuscan Haru species, unanimously pronounced that he should abstain from action. But on this occasion, 
Necessity and reason were more prevalent than superstition, and the trumpets sounded at the break of day. The army marched through a hilly country, and the hills had been secretly occupied by the Persians. Julian led the van with the skill and attention of a consummate general. He was alarmed by the intelligence that his rear was suddenly attacked. The heat of the weather had tempted him to lay aside his cuirass, but he snatched the shield from one of his attendants, and hastened with sufficient reinforcement to the relief of the rear guard. A similar danger recalled the intrepid prince to the defend of the front, and as he galloped through the columns, the centre of the left was attacked, and almost overpowered by the furious charge of the Persian cavalry and elephants. This huge body was soon defeated by the well-timed evolutions of the light infantry, who aimed their weapons with dexterity and effect against the backs of the horsemen and the legs of the elephants. The barbarians fled, and Julian, who was foremost in every danger, animated the pursuit with his voice and gestures. His trembling guards, scattered and oppressed by the disorderly throng of friends and enemies, reminded their fearless sovereign that he was without armor, and conjured him to decline the fall of the impending ruin. As they exclaimed, a cloud of darts and arrows was discharged from the flying squadrons, and a javelin, after raising the skin of his arm, transpierced the ribs, and fixed in the inferior part of the liver. Julian attempted to draw the deadly weapon from his side, but his fingers were cut by the sharpness of the steel, and he fell senseless from his horse. His guards flew to his relief, and the wounded emperor was gently raised from the ground and conveyed out of the tumult of the battle into an adjacent tent. The report of the melancholy event passed from rank to rank, but the grief of the Romans inspired them with invincible valor and the desire of revenge. The bloody and obstinate conflict was maintained by the two armies till they were separated by the total darkness of the night. The Persians derived some honor from the advantage which they obtained against the left wing, where Anatolius, master of the offices, was slain, and the prefect Sallus very narrowly escaped. But the event of the day was adverse to the barbarians. They abandoned the field, the two generals, Miranes and Nohordates, fifty nobles or satraps, and a multitude of their bravest soldiers, and the success of the Romans, if Julian had survived, might have been improved into a decisive and useful victory. The first words that Julian uttered, after his recovery from the fainting fit into which he had been thrown by loss of blood, were expressive of his martial spirit. He called for his horse and arms, and was impatient to rush into the battle. His remaining strength was exhausted by the painful effort, and the surgeons, who examined his wound, discovered the symptoms of approaching death. He employed the awful moments with the firm temper of a hero and a sage. The philosophers who had accompanied him in this fatal expedition compared the tent of Julian with the prison of Socrates, and the spectators, whom duty or friendship or curiosity had assembled round his couch, listened with respectful grief to the funeral oration of their dying emperor. Friends and fellow soldiers, the seasonable period of my departure is now arrived, and I discharge, with the cheerfulness of a ready debtor, the demands of nature. I have learned from philosophy how much the soul is more excellent than the body, and that the separation of the nobler substance should be the subject of joy rather than of affliction. I have learned from religion that an early death has always been the reward of piety, and I accept as a favor of the gods the mortal stroke that secures me from the danger of disgracing a character which has hitherto been supported by virtue and fortitude. I die without remorse, as I have lived without guilt. I am pleased to reflect on the innocence of my private life, and I can affirm with confidence that the supreme authority, that emanation of the divine power, has been preserved in my hands, pure and immaculate. Detesting the corrupt and destructive maxims of despotism, I have considered the happiness of the people as the end of government. Submitting my actions to the laws of prudence, of justice, and of moderation, I have trusted the event to the care of providence. Peace was the object of my counsels, as long as peace was consistent with the public welfare. But when the imperious voice of my country summoned me to arms, I exposed my person to the dangers of war, with the clear foreknowledge, which I had acquired from the art of divination, that I was destined to fall by the sword. I now offer my tribute of gratitude to the Eternal Being, who has not suffered me to perish by the cruelty of a tyrant, by the secret dagger of conspiracy, or by the slow tortures of lingering disease. He has given me, in the midst of an honorable career, a splendid and glorious departure from this world, and I hold it equally absurd, equally base, to solicit or to decline the stroke of fate. 
This much I have attempted to say, but my strength fails me, and I feel the approach of death. I shall cautiously refrain from any word that may tend to influence your suffrages in the election of an emperor. My choice might be imprudent or injudicious, and if it should not be ratified by the consent of the army, it might be fatal to the person whom I should recommend. I shall only, as a good citizen, express my hopes that the Romans may be blessed with the government of a virtuous sovereign. After this discourse, which Julian pronounced in a firm and gentle tone of voice, he distributed, by a military testament, the remains of his private fortune, and making some inquiry why Anatolius was not present, he understood from the answer of Sallust that Anatolius was killed, and bewailed, with amiable inconsistency, the loss of his friend. At the same time he reproved the immoderate grief of the spectators, and conjured them not to disgrace, by unmanly tears, the fate of a prince, who in a few moments would be united with heaven and with the stars. The spectators were silent, and Julian entered into a metaphysical argument with the philosophers Priscus and Maximus on the nature of the soul. The efforts which he made, of mind as well as body, most probably hastened his death. His wound began to bleed with fresh violence. His respiration was embarrassed by the swelling of the veins. He called for a draught of cold water, and as soon as he had drank it, expired without pain, about the hour of midnight. Such was the end of this extraordinary man, in the thirty-second year of his age, after a reign of one year and about eight months from the death of Constantius. In his last moments he displayed, perhaps with some ostentation, the love of virtue and of fame, which had been the ruling passions of his life. The triumph of Christianity and the calamities of the empire may, in some measure, be ascribed to Julian himself, who had neglected to secure the future execution of his designs by the timely and judicious nomination of an associate and successor. But the royal race of Constantius Chlorus was reduced to his own person, and if he entertained any serious thought of investing with the purple the most worthy among the Romans, he was diverted from his resolution by the difficulty of the choice, the jealousy of power, the fear of ingratitude, and the natural presumption of health, of youth, and of prosperity. His unexpected death left the empire without a master, and without an heir, in a state of perplexity and danger, which in the space of fourscore years had never been experienced since the election of Diocletian. In a government which had almost forgotten the distinction of pure and noble blood, the superiority of birth was of little moment, the claims of official rank were accidental and precarious, and the candidates who might aspire to ascend the vacant throne could be supported only by the consciousness of personal merit, or by the hopes of popular favour. But the situation of a famished army, encompassed on all sides by a host of barbarians, shortened the moments of grief and deliberation. In this scene of terror and distress, the body of the deceased prince, according to his own directions, was decently embalmed, and, at the dawn of day, the generals convened a military senate, at which the commanders of the legions, and the officers, both of cavalry and infantry, were invited to assist. Three or four hours of the night had not passed away without some secret cabals, and, well, <clears throat> and when the election of an emperor was proposed, the spirit of faction began to agitate the assembly. Victor and Arintheus collected the remains of the court of Constantius, the friends of Julian attached themselves to the Gallic chiefs, the Galaipus and Nevita, and the most fatal consequences might be apprehended from the discord of the two factions, so opposite in their character and interest, in their maxims of government, and perhaps in their religious principles. The superior virtues of Sallust could alone reconcile their divisions and unite their suffrages, and the venerable prefect would immediately have been declared the successor of Julian, if he himself, with sincere and modest firmness, had not alleged his age and infirmities so unequal to the weight of the diadem. The generals, who were surprised and perplexed by his refusal, showed some disposition to adopt the salutary advice of an inferior officer, that they should act as they would have acted in the absence of the emperor, that they should exert their abilities to extricate the army from the present distress, and if they were fortunate enough to reach the confines of Mesopotamia, they should proceed with united and deliberate counsels in the election of a lawful sovereign. While they debated, a few voices saluted Jovian, who was no more than first of the domestics, with the names of Emperor and Augustus. The tumultuary acclamation was instantly repeated by the guards who surrounded the tent, and passed in a few minutes to the extremities of the line. 
The new prince, astonished with his own fortune, was hastily invested with the imperial ornaments, and received a note of fidelity from the generals, whose favor and protection he so lately solicited. The strongest recommendation of Jovian was the merit of his father, Count Veronian, who enjoyed in honorable retirement the fruit of his long services. In the obscure freedom of a private station, the son indulged his taste for wine and women, yet he supported with credit the character of a Christian and a soldier, without being conspicuous for any of the ambitious qualifications which excite the admiration and envy of mankind. The comely person of Jovian, his cheerful temper and familiar wit, had gained the affection of his fellow soldiers, and the generals of both parties acquiesced in a popular election, which had not been conducted by the arts of their enemies. The pride of this unexpected elevation was moderated by the just apprehension that the same day might terminate the life and reign of the new emperor. The pressing voice of necessity was obeyed without delay, and the first orders issued by Jovian, a few hours after his predecessor had expired, were to prosecute a march, which could alone extricate the Romans from their actual distress. End of chapter 24, part 4 Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland Chapter 24, part 5 of The Deline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information... Or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland. Chapter 24 The Retreat and Death of Julian, Part 5. The esteem of an enemy is most sincerely expressed by his fears, and the degree of fear may be accurately measured by the joy with which he celebrates his deliverance. The welcome news of the death of Julian, which a deserter revealed to the camp of Sapor, inspired the desponding monarch with a sudden confidence of victory. He immediately detached the royal cavalry, perhaps the ten thousand immortals, to second and support the pursuit, and discharged the whole weight of his united forces on the rear guard of the Romans. The rear guard was thrown into disorder. The renowned legions, which derived their titles from Diocletian and his warlike colleague, were broken and trampled down by the elephants, and three tribunes lost their lives in attempting to stop the flight of the soldiers. The battle was at length restored by the persevering valor of the Romans, the Persians were repulsed with a great slaughter of men and elephants, and the army, after marching and fighting a long summer's day, arrived in the evening at Samara on the banks of the Tigris, about one hundred miles above Ctesiphon. On the ensuing day, the barbarians, instead of harassing the march, attacked the camp of Jovian, which had been seated in a deep and sequestered valley. From the hills, the archers of Persia insulted and annoyed the weary legionaries, and a body of cavalry, which had penetrated with desperate courage through the Praetorian gate, was cut in pieces after a doubtful conflict near the imperial tent. In the succeeding night, the camp of Carci was protected by the lofty dikes of the river, and the Roman army, though incessantly exposed to the vexatious pursuit of the Saracens, pitched their tents near the city of Dura, four days after the death of Julian. The Tigris was still on their left, their hopes and provisions were almost consumed, and the impatient soldiers, who had fondly persuaded themselves that the frontiers of the empire were not far distant, requested their new sovereign, that they might be permitted to hazard the passage of the river. With the assistance of his wisest officers, Jovian endeavored to check their rashness, by representing that if they possessed sufficient skill and vigor to stem the torrent of a deep and rapid stream, they would only deliver themselves naked and defenseless to the barbarians who had occupied the opposite banks. Yielding at length to their clamorous importunities, he consented, with reluctance, that five hundred Gauls and Germans, accustomed from their infancy to the waters of the Rhine and Danube, should attempt the bold adventure, which might serve either as an encouragement or as a warning for the rest of the army. In the silence of the night, they swam the Tigris, surprised an unguarded post of the enemy, and displayed at the dawn of the day the signal of their resolution and fortune. The success of this trial disposed the emperor to listen to the promises of his architects, who proposed to construct a floating bridge of the inflated skins of sheep, oxen, and goats, covered with a floor of earth and fascines. Two important days were spent in the ineffectual labor, and the Romans, who already endured the miseries of famine, 
cast a look of despair on the Tigris and upon the barbarians, whose numbers and obstinacy increased with the distress of the imperial army. In this hopeless condition, the fainting spirits of the Romans were revived by the sound of peace. The transient presumptions of Sapor had vanished. He observed with serious concern that, in the repetition of doubtful combats, he had lost his most faithful and intrepid nobles, his bravest troops, and the greatest part of his train of elephants, and the experienced monarch feared to provoke the resistance of despair, the vicissitudes of fortune, and the unexhausted powers of the Roman Empire, which might soon advance to relieve or to revenge the successor of Julian. The Surenas himself, accompanied by another satrap, appeared in the camp of Jovian, and declared that the clemency of his sovereign was not averse to signify the conditions on which he would consent to spare and to dismiss the Caesar with the relics of his captive army. The hopes of safety subdued the firmness of the Romans. The emperor was compelled by the advice of his council and the cries of his soldiers to embrace the offer of peace, and the prefect Sallust was immediately sent with the general Arinteus to understand the pleasure of the great king. The crafty Persian delayed, under various pretenses, the conclusion of the agreement, started difficulties, required explanations, suggested expedients, receded from his concessions, increased his demands, and wasted four days in the arts of negotiation, till he had consumed the stock of provisions, which yet remained in the camp of the Romans. Had Jovin been capable of executing a bold and prudent measure, he would have continued his march with unremitting diligence, the progress of the treaty would have suspended the attacks of the barbarians, and before the expiration of the fourth day, he might have safely reached the fruitful province of Corduene, at the distance only of one hundred miles. The irresolute emperor, instead of breaking through the toils of the enemy, expected his fate with patient resignation, and accepted the humiliating conditions of peace, which it was no longer in his power to refuse. The five provinces beyond the Tigris, which had been ceded by the grandfather of Sapor, were restored to the Persian monarchy. He acquired, by a single article, the impenetrable city of Nisibis, which had sustained, in three successive sieges, the effort of his arms, Singara, and the castle of the Moors, one of the strongest places of Mesopotamia, were likewise dismembered from the empire. It was considered as an indulgence that the inhabitants of those fortresses were permitted to retire with their effects, but the conqueror rigorously insisted that the Romans should forever abandon the king and kingdom of Armenia. A peace, or rather a long truce of thirty years, was stipulated between the hostile nations, and the faith of the treaty was ratified by solemn notes and religious ceremonies, and hostages of distinguished rank were reciprocally delivered to secure the performance of the conditions. The sophist of Antioch, who saw with indignation the scepter of his hero in the feeble hand of a Christian successor, professes to admire the moderation of Sapor in contenting himself with so small a portion of the Roman Empire. If he had stretched as far as the Euphrates the claims of his ambition, he might have been secure, says Libanius, of not meeting with a refusal. If he had fixed, as the boundary of Persia, the Orontes, the Sidnus, the Sangarius, or even the Thracian Bosporus, flatterers would not have been wanting in the court of Jovin to convince the timid monarch that his remaining provinces would still afford the most ample gratification of power and luxury. Without adopting in its full force this malicious insinuation, we must acknowledge that the conclusion of so ignominious a treaty was facilitated by the private ambition of Jovian. The obscure domestic, exalted to the throne by fortune rather than by merit, was impatient to escape from the hands of the Persians, that he might prevent the designs of Procopius, who commanded the army of Mesopotamia, and establishes doubtful reign over the legions and provinces which were still ignorant of the hasty and tumultuous choice of the camp beyond the Tigris. In the neighborhood of the same river, at no very considerable distance from the fatal station of Dura, the ten thousand Greeks, without generals or guides or provisions, were abandoned, above twelve hundred miles from their native country, to the resentment of a victorious monarch. The difference of their conduct and success depended much more on their character than on their situation. Instead of tamely resigning themselves to the secret deliberations and private views of a single person, the united councils of the Greeks were inspired by the generous enthusiasm of a popular assembly, where the mind of each citizen is filled with the love of glory, the pride of freedom, and the contempt of death. Conscious of their superiority over the barbarians in arms and discipline, they disdained to yield, they refused to capitulate, 
Every obstacle was surmounted by their patience, courage, and military skill, and the memorable retreat of the ten thousand exposed and insulted the weakness of the Persian monarchy. As the price of his disgraceful concessions, the emperor might perhaps have stipulated that the camp of the hungry Romans should be plentifully supplied, and that they should be permitted to pass the Tigris on the bridge which was constructed by the hands of the Persians. But if Jovian presumed to solicit those equitable terms, they were sternly refused by the haughty tyrant of the East, whose clemency had pardoned the invaders of his country. The Saracens sometimes intercepted the stragglers of the march, but the generals and troops of Sapo respected the cessation of arms, and Jovian was suffered to explore the most convenient place for the passage of the river. The small vessels, which had been saved from the conflagration of the fleet, performed the most essential service. They first conveyed the emperor and his favorites, and afterwards transported, in many successive voyages, a great part of the army. But, as every man was anxious for his personal safety, and apprehensive of being left on the hostile shore, the soldiers, who were too impatient to wait the slow returns of the boat, boldly ventured themselves on light hurdles or inflated skins, and, drawing after them their horses, attempted with various success to swim across the river. Many of these daring adventurers were swallowed by the waves. Many others, who were carried along by the violence of the stream, fell an easy prey to the avarice or cruelty of the wild Arabs, and the loss which the army sustained in the passage of the Tigris was not inferior to the carnage of a day of battle. As soon as the Romans were landed on the western bank, they were delivered from the hostile pursuit of the barbarians. But in a laborious march of two hundred miles over the plains of Mesopotamia, they endured the last extremities of thirst and hunger. They were obliged to traverse the sandy desert, which, in the extent of seventy miles, did not afford a single blade of sweet grass, nor a single spring of fresh water, and the rest of the inhospitable waste was untrod by the footsteps either of friends or enemies. Whenever a small measure of flour could be discovered in the camp, twenty pounds weight were greedily purchased with ten pieces of gold. The beasts of burden were slaughtered and devoured, and the desert was strewed with the arms and baggage of the Roman soldiers, whose tattered garments and meagre countenances displayed their past sufferings and actual misery. A small convoy of provisions advanced to meet the army as far as the castle of Ur, and the supply was the more grateful, since it declared the fidelity of Sebastian and Procopius. At Tilsapata, the emperor most graciously received the generals of Mesopotamia, and the remains of a once flourishing army at length reposed themselves under the walls of Nisibis. The messengers of Jovian had already proclaimed, in the language of flattery, his election, his treaty, and his return, and the new prince had taken the most effectual measures to secure the allegiance of the armies and provinces of Europe, by placing the military command in the hands of those officers who, from motives of interest or inclination, would firmly support the cause of their benefit. The friends of Julian had confidently announced the success of his expedition. They entertained a fond persuasion that the temples of the gods would be enriched with the spoils of the East, that Persia would be reduced to the humble state of a tributary province governed by the laws and magistrates of Rome, that the barbarians would adopt the dress and manners and language of their conquerors, and that the youth of Ecbatana and Susa would study the art of rhetoric under Grecian masters. The progress of the arms of Julian interrupted his communication with the empire, and from the moment that he passed the Tigris, his affectionate subjects were ignorant of the fate and fortunes of their prince. The contemplation of fancied triumph was disturbed by the melancholy rumor of his death, and they persisted to doubt after they could no longer deny the truth of that fatal event. The messengers of Jovian promulgated the specious tale of a prudent and necessary peace. The voice of fame, louder and more sincere, revealed the disgrace of the emperor and the conditions of the ignominious treaty. The minds of the people were filled with astonishment and grief, with indignation and terror when they were informed that the unworthy successor of Julian relinquished the five provinces which had been acquired by the victory of Galerius, and that he shamefully surrendered to the barbarians the important city of Nibisibis, the firmest bulwark of the provinces of the east. The deep and dangerous question, how far as the public faith should be observed, when it becomes incompatible with the public safety, was freely agitated in popular conversation, and some hopes were entertained that the emperor would redeem his pusillanimous behavior by a splendid act of patriotic perfidy. The inflexible spirit of the Roman Senate had always disclaimed the unequal conditions which were exhorted from the distress of their captive armies, 
and, if it was necessary to satisfy the national honor by delivering the guilty general into the hands of the barbarians, the greatest part of the subjects of Jovin would have cheerfully acquiesced in the precedent of ancient times. But the emperor, whatever might be the limits of his constitutional authority, was the absolute master of the laws and arms of the state, and the same motives which had forced him to subscribe now pressed him to execute the treaty of peace. He was impatient to secure an empire at the expense of a few provinces, and the respect all names of religion and honor concealed the personal fears and ambition of Jovian. Notwithstanding the dutiful solicitations of the inhabitants, decency as well as prudence forbade the emperor to lodge in the palace of Nisibis. But the next morning, after his arrival, Binesis, the ambassador of Persia, entered the place, displayed from the citadel the standard of the great king, and proclaimed in his name the cruel alternative of exile or servitude. The principal citizens of Nisibis, who, till that fatal moment, had confided in the protection of their sovereign, threw themselves at his feet. They conjured him not to abandon, or at least not to deliver, a faithful colony to the rage of a barbarian tyrant, exasperated by the three successive defeats which he had experienced under the walls of Nisibis. They still possessed arms and courage to repel the invaders of their country. They requested only the permission of using them in their own defense, and as soon as they had asserted their independence, they should implore the favor of being again admitted into the ranks of his subjects. Their arguments, their eloquence, their tears, were ineffectual. Jovian alleged, with some confusion, the sanctity of oaths, and, as the reluctance with which he accepted the present of a crown of gold, convinced the citizens of their hopeless condition, the advocate Silvanus was provoked to exclaim, O Emperor, may you thus be crowned by all the cities of your dominions. Jovian, who in a few weeks had assumed the habits of a prince, was displeased with freedom, and offended with truth, and as he reasonably supposed that the discontent of the people might incline them to submit to the Persian government, he published an edict, under pain of death, that they should leave the city within the term of three days. Ammianus has delivered in lively colors the scene of universal despair, which he seems to have viewed with an eye of compassion. The martial youth deserted, with indignant grief, the walls which they had so gloriously defended. The disconsolate mourner dropped the last tear over a tomb of a son or husband, which must soon be profaned by the rude hand of a barbarian master. And the aged citizen kissed the threshold and clung to the doors of the house where he had passed the cheerful and careless hours of infancy. The highways were crowned with a trembling multitude. The distinctions of rank and sex and age were lost in a general calamity. Everyone strove to bear away some fragment from the wreck of his fortunes. And as they could not command the immediate service of an adequate number of horses or wagons, they were obliged to leave behind them the greatest part of their valuable effects. The savage insensibility of Jovian appears to have exaggerated the hardships of these unhappy fugitives. They were seated, however, in a newly built quarter of Amida, and that rising city, with the reinforcement of a very considerable colony, soon recovered its former splendor and became the capital of Mesopotamia. Similar orders were dispatched by the emperor for the evacuation of Singara and the castle of the Moors, and for the restitution of the five provinces beyond the Tigris. Sapor enjoyed the glory and the fruits of his victory, and this ignominious peace has justly been considered as a memorable era in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The predecessors of Jovian had sometimes relinquished the dominion of distant and unprofitable provinces, but since the foundation of the city, the genius of Rome, the god Terminus, who guarded the boundaries of the Republic, had never retired before the sword of a victorious enemy. After Jovian had performed those engagements, which the voice of his people might have tempted him to violate, he hastened away from the scene of his disgrace, and proceeded with his whole court to enjoy the luxury of Antioch. Without consulting the dictates of religious zeal, he was prompted by humanity and gratitude to bestow the last honors of the remains of his deceased sovereign, and Procopius, who sincerely bewailed the loss of his kinsman, was removed from the command of the army under the decent pretense of conducting the funeral. The corpse of Julian was transported from Nisibis to Tarsus in a slow march of fifteen days, and as it passed through the cities of the east, was saluted by the hostile factions with mournful lamentations and clamorous insults. The pagans all replaced their beloved hero in the rank of the gods whose worship he had restored, 
while the invectives of the Christians pursued the soul of the apostate to hell and his body to the grave. One party lamented the approaching ruin of their altars, the other celebrated the marvellous deliverance of their church. The Christians applauded in lofty and ambiguous strains the stroke of divine vengeance which had been so long suspended over the guilty head of Julian. They acknowledged that the death of the tyrant, at the instant he expired beyond the Tigris, was revealed to the saints of Egypt, Syria, and Cappadocia, and instead of suffering him to fall by the Persian darts, their indiscretion ascribed the heroic deed to the obscure hand of some mortal, immortal champion of the faith. Such imprudent declarations were eagerly adopted by the malice or credulity of their adversaries, who darkly insinuated or confidently asserted that the governors of the church had instigated and directed the fanaticism of a domestic assassin. Above sixteen years after the death of Julian, the charge was solemnly and vehemently urged in a public oration addressed by Libanius to the emperor Theodosius. His suspicions are unsupported by fact or argument, and we can only esteem the generous zeal of the sophist of Antioch for the cold and neglected ashes of his friend. It was an ancient custom in the funerals, as well as in the triumphs of the Romans, that the voice of praise should be corrected by that of satire and ridicule, and that in the midst of the splendid pageants which displayed the glory of the living or of the dead, their imperfections should not be concealed from the eyes of the world. This custom was practiced in the funeral of Julian. The comedians, who resented his contempt and aversion for the theatre, exhibited with the applause of a Christian audience the lively and exaggerated representation of the faults and follies of the deceased emperor. His various character and singular manners afforded an ample scope for the pleasantry and ridicule. In the exercise of his uncommon talents, he often descended below the majesty of his rank. Alexander was transformed into Diogenes, the philosopher was degraded into a priest, the purity of his virtue was sullied by excessive vanity, his superstition disturbed the peace and endangered the safety of a mighty empire, and his irregular sallies were the less entitled to indulgence, as they appeared to be the laborious efforts of art or even of affection. The remains of Julian were interred at Tarsus in Cilicia, but his stately tomb, which arose in that city on the banks of the cold and limpid Sydnus, was displeasing to the faithful friends, who loved and revered the memory of that extraordinary man. The philosopher expressed a very reasonable wish that the disciple of Plato might have reposed amidst the groves of the academy, while the soldier exclaimed in bolder accents that the ashes of Julian should have been mingled with those of Caesar in the field of Mars and among the ancient monuments of Roman virtue. The history of princes does not very frequently renew the examples of a similar competition. End of chapter 24, part 5. Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland. Chapter 15, part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 25. Reigns of Jovian and Valentinian, Division of the Empire. Part 1. The Government and Death of Jovian. Election of Valentinian, who associates his brother Valenus, and makes the final division of the Eastern and Western Empires. Revolt of Procopius civil and ecclesiastical administration, Germany, Britain, Africa, the East, the Danube, death of Valentinian, his two sons, Gratian and Valentinian II, succeed to the Western Empire. The death of Julian had left the public affairs of the empire in a very doubtful and dangerous situation. The Roman army was saved by an inglorious perhaps a necessary treaty, and the first moments of peace were consecrated by the pious Jovian to restore the domestic tranquillity of the church and state. The indiscretion of his predecessor, instead of reconciling, had artfully fomented the religious war. 
and the balance which he affected to preserve between the hostile factions served only to perpetuate the contest by the vicissitudes of hope and fear, by the rival claims of ancient possession and actual favor. The Christians had forgotten the spirit of the gospel, and the pagans had imbued the spirit of the church. In private families, the sentiments of nature were exaggerated by the blind fury of zeal and revenge. The majesty of the laws was violated or abused. The citizens of the East were sustained with blood, and most implacable enemies of the Romans were in the bosom of their country. Jovian was educated in the profession of Christianity, and as he marched from Nisibis to Antioch, the banner of the cross, the Labrarium of Constantine, which was again displayed at the head of the legions, announced to the people the faith of their new emperor. As soon as he ascended the throne, he transmitted a circular epistle to all the governors of provinces, in which he confessed the divine truth and secured the legal establishment of the Christian religion. The insidious edicts of Julian were abolished, the ecclesiastical immunities were restored and enlarged, and Jovian condescended to lament that the distress of the times obliged him to diminish the measure of charitable distributions. The Christians were unanimous in the loud and sincere applause which they bestowed on the pious successor of Julian, but they were still ignorant what creed or what synod he would choose for the standard of orthodoxy, and the peace of the church immediately revived those eager disputes which had been suspended during the season of persecution. The episcopal leaders of the contending sects convinced from experience how much their fate would depend on the earliest impressions that were made on the mind of an untutored soldier hastened to the court of Edessa or Antioch. The highways of the east were crowded with Homoousian and Arian and Semi-Arian and Eniomian bishops who struggled to outstrip each other in the holy race. The apartments of the palace surrounded with their clamors and the ears of the prince were assaulted and perhaps astonished by the singular mixture of metaphysical argument and passionate invective. The moderation of Jovian who recommended concord and charity, and referred the disputants to the sentence of a future council, was interpreted as a symptom of indifference. But his attachment to the Nicene Creed was at length discovered and declared by the reverence which he expressed for the celestial virtues of the great Athanasius. The intrepid veteran of the faith, at the age of seventy, had issued from his retreat on the first intelligence of the tyrant's death. The acclamations of the people seated him once more on the archiepiscopal throne, and he wisely accepted or anticipated the invitation of Jovian. The venerable figure of Athanasius, his calm courage and insinuating eloquence, sustained the reputation which he had already acquired in the courts of four successive princes. As soon as he had gained the confidence and secured the faith of the Christian emperor, he returned in triumph to his diocese, and continued, with mature counsels and undiminished vigor, to direct, ten years longer, the ecclesiastical government of Alexandria, Egypt, and the Catholic Church. Before his departure from Antioch, he assured Jovian that his orthodox devotion would be rewarded with a long and peaceful reign. Athanasius had reason to hope that he should be allowed either the merit of a successful prediction or the exercise of a grateful, though ineffectual, prayer. The slightest force, when it is applied to assist and guide the natural descent of its object, operates with irresistible weight, and Jovian had the good fortune to embrace the religious opinions which were supported by the spirit of the times and the zeal and numbers of the most powerful sect under his reign, Christianity obtained an easy and lasting victory, and as soon as the smile of royal patronage was withdrawn, the genius of paganism, which had been fondly raised and cherished by the arts of Julian, sunk 
irrevocably. In many cities, the temples were shut or deserted. The philosophers who had abused their transient favor thought it prudent to shave their beards and disguise their profession. Christians rejoiced that they were now in a condition to forgive or to revenge the injuries which they had suffered under the preceding reign. The consternation of the pagan world was dispelled by a wise and gracious edict of toleration, in which Jovian explicitly declared that although he should severely punish the sacrilegious rite of magic, his subjects might exercise with freedom and safety the ceremonies of the ancient worship. The memory of this law has been preserved by the orator Themistius, who was deputed by the Senate of Constantinople to express their royal devotion to the new emperor. Themistius expatriates on the clemency of the divine nature, the facility of human error, the rights of conscience, and the independence of the mind, and, in some eloquence, inculcates the principles of philosophical toleration, whose aid superstition herself, in the hour of her distress, is not ashamed to implore. He justly observes that in the recent changes both religions had been alternately disgraced by the seeming acquisition of worthless proselytes, of whose votaries of the reigning purple, who could pass without reason and without a blush from the church to the temple and from the altars of Jupiter to the sacred table of the Christians. In the space of seven months, the Roman troops, who were now returned to Antioch, had performed a march of fifteen hundred miles, in which they had endured all the hardships of war, of famine, and of climate. Notwithstanding their services, their fatigues, and the approach of winter, the timid and impatient Jovian allowed only, to the men and horses, a respite of six weeks. The emperor could not sustain the indiscreet and malicious raillery of the Pope of Antioch. He was impatient to possess the palace of Constantinople, and to prevent the ambition of some competitor who might occupy the vacant allegiance of Europe. But he soon received the grateful intelligence that his authority was acknowledged from the Thracian Bosphorus to the Atlantic Ocean. By the first letters which he dispatched from the camp of Mesopotamia, he had delegated the military command of Gaul and Ilysium to Malarich, a brave and faithful officer of the nation of the Franks, and to his father-in-law, Count Lucian, who had formerly distinguished his courage and conduct in the defense of Nisbis. Malarich had declined an office to which he thought himself unequal, and Lucian was massacred at Reims, in an accidental mutiny of the Bavarian cohort. But the moderation of Jovinus, master-general of the cavalry, who forgave the intention of his disgrace, soon appeased the tumult and confirmed the uncertain minds of the soldiers. The oath of fidelity was administered and taken with loyal acclamations, and the deputies of the western armies saluted their sovereign as he descended from Mount Taurus to the city of Tyana in Cappadocia. From Tyana he continued his hasty march to Ancyra, capital of the province of Galata, where Jovian assumed with his infant son the name and ensigns of the consulship. Datastana, an obscure town almost at an equal distance between Ancyria and Nice, was marked for the fatal term of his journey and life. After indulging himself with a plentiful, perhaps an intemperate, supper, he retired to rest, and the next morning the Emperor Jovian was found dead in his bed. The cause of his sudden death was variously understood. By some it was ascribed to the consequences of an indigestion, occasioned either by the quantity of the wine or the quality of the mushrooms, which he had swallowed in the evening. According to others, he was suffocated in his sleep by the vapor of charcoal, which extracted from the walls of the apartment the unwholesome moisture of the fresh plaster. But the want of a regular inquiry into the death of a prince, whose reign and person were soon forgotten, appears to have been the only circumstance which countenanced the malicious whispers of poison and domestic guilt. 
the body of Jovian was sent to Constantinople to be interned with his predecessors, and the sad procession was met on the road by his wife Chorito, the daughter of Count Lucian, who still wept the recent death of her father, and was hastening to dry her tears in the embraces of an imperial husband. Her disappointment and grief were embittered by the anxiety of maternal tenderness. Six weeks before the death of Jovian, his infant son had been placed in the curial chair, adorned with the title of nobilissimus and the vain ensigns of the counselorship. Unconscious of his fortune, the royal youth who from his grandfather assumed the name of Veronian was reminded only by the jealousy of the government that he was the son of an emperor. Sixteen years afterwards he was still alive, but had already been deprived of an eye, and his afflicted mother expected every hour that the innocent victim would be torn from her arms to appease with his blood the suspicions of the reigning prince. After the death of Jovian, the throne of Rome would remain ten days without a master. The ministers and generals still continued to meet in council to exercise their respective functions, to maintain the public order, and peaceably to conduct the army to the city of Nice in Bithynia, which was chosen for the place of the election. In a solemn assembly of the civil and military powers of the empire, the diadem, was again unanimously offered to the prefect Salas. He enjoyed the glory of a second refusal, and when the virtues of the father were alleged in favor of his son, the prefect, with the firmness of a distinguished patriot, declared to the electors that the feeble age of the one and the inexperienced youth of the other were equally incapable of the laborious duties of government. Several candidates were proposed, and, after weighing the objections of character or situation, they were successively rejected. But as soon as the name of Valentinian was pronounced, the merit of that office united the suffrages of the whole assembly, and obtained the sincere approbation of Sallust himself. Valentinian was the son of Count Gratian, a native of Sibylus in Pannonia, who from an obscure condition had raised himself by matchless strength and dexterity to the military commands of Africa and Britain, from which he retired with an ample fortune and suspicious integrity. The rank and services of Gratian contributed, however, to smooth the first steps of the promotion of his son, and afforded him an early opportunity of displaying those solid and useful qualifications which raised his character above the ordinary level of his fellow citizens. The person of Valentinian was tall, graceful, and majestic. His manly countenance, deeply marked with the impression of sense and spirit, inspired his friends with awe and his enemies with fear, and to second the efforts of his undaunted courage, the son of Gratian had inherited the advantages of a strong and healthy constitution by the habits of chastity and temperance which restrain the appetites and invigorate the facilities, Valentinian preserved his own and the public esteem. The avocations of a military life had diverted his youth from the elegant pursuits of literature. He was ignorant of the Greek language and the arts of rhetoric, but as the mind of the orator was never discorded by timid perplexity, he was able, as often as the occasion prompted him, to deliver his decided sentiments with bold and ready elocution. The laws of martial discipline were the only laws that he had studied, and he was soon distinguished by the laborious diligence and inflexible severity with which he discharged and enforced the duties of the camp. In the time of Julian he provoked the danger of disgrace by the contempt which he publicly expressed for the reigning religion, and it should seem from his subsequent conduct that the indiscreet and unseasonable freedom of Valentinian was the effect of military spirit rather than of Christian zeal. He was pardoned, however, and still employed by a prince who esteemed his merit, and in the various events of the Persian War he improved the reputation which he had already acquired on the banks of the Rhine. The celerity and success with which he executed an important commission recommended him to the favor of Jovian, and to the honorable command of the second school or company of Targeteers, 
of the domestic guards. In the march from Antioch, he had reached his quarters at Ancyra when he was unexpectedly summoned, without guilt and without intrigue, to assume, in the forty-third year of his age, the absolute government of the Roman Empire. The invitation of ministers and generals at Nice was of little moment unless it were confirmed by the voice of the army. The aged Sallust, who had long observed the irregular fluctuations of popular assemblies, proposed under pain of death that none of those persons whose rank in the service might excite a party in their favor should appear in public on the day of the inauguration. Yet such was the prevalence of ancient superstition that a whole day was voluntarily added to this dangerous interval, because it happened to be the intercalculation of the bisextil. At length, when the hour was supposed to be propitious, Valentinian showed himself from a lofty tribunal, the judicious choice was applauded, and the new prince was solemnly invested with the diadem and the purple. Amidst the acclamation of the troops who were disposed in martial order around the tribunal, but when he stretched forth his hand to address the armed multitude, a busy whisper was accidentally started in the ranks, and insensibly swelled into a loud and imperious clamor, that he should name, without delay, a colleague in the empire. The intrepid calmness of Valentinian attained silence, and commanded respect, and he thus addressed the assembly. A few minutes since it was in your power, fellow soldiers, to have me in the obscurity of a private station. Judging from the testimony of my past life that I deserve to reign, you have placed me on the throne. It is now my duty to consult the safety and interest of the Republic. The weight of the universe is undoubtedly too great for the hands of a feeble mortal. I am conscious of the limits of my ability, and uncertain of my life, and far from declining, I am anxious to solicit the assistance of a worthy colleague. But where discord may be fatal, the choice of a faithful friend requires mature and serious deliberation. That deliberation shall be my care. Let your conduct be dutiful and consistent. Retire to your quarters, refresh your minds and bodies, and expect the accustomed donative on the ascension of a new emperor. The astonished troops, with a mixture of pride, of satisfaction, and of terror, confessed the voice of their master. Their angry clamors subsided into silent reverence, and Valentinian encompassed with the eagles of the legions and the various banners of the cavalry and infantry, was conducted in a warlike pomp to the palace of Nice. As he was sensible, however, of the importance of preventing some rash declaration of the soldiers, he consulted the assembly of chiefs, and their real sentiments were concisely expressed by the generous freedom of Dagaphilus. Most excellent prince, said that officer, if you consider only your family, you have a brother, if you love the republic, look around for the most deserving of the Romans. The emperor, who suppressed his displeasure without altering his intention, slowly proceeded from Nice to Nicomedia and Constantinople. In one of the suburbs of that capital, thirty days after his own elevation, he bestowed the title of Augustus on his brother Valens, and as the boldest patriots were convinced that their opposition without being serviceable to their country would be fatal to themselves, the declaration of his absolute will was received with silent submission. Valens was now in the thirty-sixth year of his age, but his abilities had never been exercised in any employment, military or civil, and his character had not inspired the world with any sanguine expectations. He possessed, however, one quality which recommended him to Valentinium, and preserved the domestic peace of the empire, devout and grateful attachment to his benefactor, whose superiority of genius, as well as of authority, Valens humbly and cheerfully acknowledged in every action of his life. End of chapter 25, part 1 Chapter 25, part 2 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Chapter 25 Reigns of Jovian and Valentinian, Division of the Empire Part 2 Before Valentinian divided the provinces, he reformed the administration of the empire. All ranks of subjects, who had been injured or oppressed under the reign of Julian, were invited to support their public accusations. The silence of mankind attested the spotless integrity of the prefect Salust, and his own pressing solicitations that he might be permitted to retire from the business of the state were rejected by Valentinian with the most honorable expressions of friendship and esteem. But among the favorites of the late emperor, there were many who had abused his credulity or superstition, and who could no longer hope to be protected either by favor or justice. The greater part of the ministers of the palace and the governors of the provinces were removed from their respective stations, yet the eminent merit of some officers was distinguished from the obnoxious crowd, and, notwithstanding the opposite clamors of zeal and resentment, the whole proceedings of this delicate inquiry appeared to have been conducted with a reasonable share of wisdom and moderation. The festivities of a new reign received a short and suspicious interruption from the sudden illness of the two princes. But as soon as their health was restored, they left Constantinople in the beginning of the spring. In the castle or palace of Medina, only three miles from Naissus, they executed the solemn and final division of the Roman Empire. Valentinian bestowed on his brother the rich prefecture of the east from the lower Danube to the confines of Persia, whilst he reserved for his immediate government the warlike prefectures of Illyricum, Italy, and Gaul. From the extremity of Greece to the Caledonian rampart, and from the rampart of Caledonia to the foot of Mount Atlas, the provincial administration remained on its former basis, but a double supply of generals and magistrates was required for two councils and two courts. The division was made with a just regard to their peculiar merit and situation, and seven master generals were soon created, either of the cavalry or infantry. When this important business had been amicably transacted, Valentinian and Valens embraced for the last time. The Emperor of the West established his temporary residence at Milan, and the Emperor of the East returned to Constantinople to assume the dominion of fifty provinces, of whose language he was totally ignorant. The tranquility of the East was soon disturbed by rebellion, and the throne of Valens was threatened by the daring attempts of a rival whose affinity to the Emperor Julian was his sole merit, and had been his only crime. Procopius had been hastily promoted from the obscure station of a tribune and a notary to the joint command of the army of Mesopotamia. The public opinion already named him as the successor of a prince who was destitute of natural heirs, and a vain rumor was propagated by his friends, or his enemies, that Julian, before the altar of the moon at Carhe, had privately invested Procopius with the imperial purple. He endeavored, by his dutiful and submissive behavior, to disarm the jealousy of Jovian, resigned, without a contest, his military command, and retired, with his wife and family, to cultivate the ample patrimony which he possessed in the province of Cappadocia. These useful and innocent occupations were interrupted by the appearance of an officer with a band of soldiers who, in the name of his new sovereigns, Valentinian and Valens, was dispatched to conduct the unfortunate Procopius either to a perpetual prison or an ignominious death. His presence of mind procured him a longer respite and more splendid fate. Without presuming to dispute the royal mandate, he requested the indulgence of a few moments to embrace his weeping family, and while the vigilance of his guards was relaxed by a plentiful entertainment, he dexterously escaped to the sea coast of the Euxine, from whence he passed over to the country of Bosporus. In that sequestered region he remained many months, exposed to the hardships of exile, of solitude, and of want. 
his melancholy temper brooded over his misfortunes, and his mind agitated by the just apprehension that, if any accident should discover his name, the faithless barbarians would violate, without much scruple, the laws of hospitality. In a moment of impatience and despair, Procopius embarked in a merchant vessel and made sail for Constantinople, and boldly aspired to the rank of a sovereign, because he was not allowed to enjoy the security of a subject. At first he lurked in the villages of Bithynia, continually changing his habitation and his disguise. By degrees he ventured into the capital, trusted his life and fortune to the fidelity of two friends, a senator and a eunuch, and conceived some hopes of success from the intelligence which he obtained from the actual state of public affairs. The body of the people was infected with a spirit of discontent. They regretted the justice and the abilities of Salust, who had been imprudently dismissed from the prefecture of the East. They despised the character of Valens, which was rude without vigor and feeble without mildness. They dreaded the influence of his father-in-law, the patrician Petronius, a cruel and rapacious minister, who rigorously exacted all the arrears of tribute that might remain unpaid since the reign of the emperor Aurelian. The circumstances were propitious to the designs of a usurper. The hostile measures of the Persians required the presence of Valens in Syria. From the Danube to the Euphrates the troops were in motion, and the capital was occasionally filled with the soldiers who passed or repassed the Thracian Bosporus. Two cohorts of Gaul were persuaded to listen to the secret proposals of the conspirators, which were recommended by the promise of a liberal donative, and, as they still revered the memory of Julian, they easily consented to support the hereditary claim of his proscribed kinsmen. At the dawn of the day they were drawn up near the baths of Anastasia, and Procopius, clothed in a purple garment, more suitable to a player than to a monarch, appeared, as if he rose from the dead, in the midst of Constantinople. The soldiers, who were prepared for his reception, saluted their trembling prince with shouts of joy and vows of fidelity. Their numbers were soon increased by a band of sturdy peasants collected from the adjacent country, and Procopius, shielded by the arms of his adherents, was successfully conducted to the tribunal, the senate, and the palace. During the first moments of his tumultuous reign, he was astonished and terrified by the gloomy silence of the people, who were either ignorant of the cause or apprehensive of the event. But his military strength was superior to any actual resistance. The malcontents flocked to the standard of rebellion, the poor were excited by the hopes, and the rich were intimidated by the fear of a general pillage, and the obstinate credulity of the multitude was once more deceived by the promised advantages of a revolution. The magistrates were seized, the prisons and arsenals broke open, the gates and the entrance of the harbor were diligently occupied, and in a few hours Procopius became the absolute, though precarious, master of the imperial city. The usurper improved his unexpected success with some degree of courage and dexterity. He artfully propagated the rumors and opinions the most favorable to his interest, while he deluded the populace by giving audience to the frequent but imaginary ambassadors of distant nations. The large body of troops stationed in the cities of Thrace and the fortress of the Lower Danube were gradually involved in the guilt of rebellion, and the Gothic princes consented to supply the sovereign of Constantinople with the formidable strength of several thousand auxiliaries. His generals passed the Bosporus and subdued without an effort the unarmed but wealthy provinces of Bithynia and Asia. After an honorable defense, the city and island of Caesarus yielded to his power. The renowned legions of the Jovians and Hercleans embraced the cause of the usurper, whom they were ordered to crush, and as the veterans were continually augmented with new levies, he soon appeared at the head of an army whose valor, as well as numbers, was not unequal to the greatness of the contest. The son of Hormistus, a youth of spirit and ability, condescended to draw his sword against the lawful emperor of the East, 
and the Persian prince was immediately invested with the ancient and extraordinary powers of a Roman proconsul. The alliance of Faustina, the widow of the emperor Constantinus, who entrusted herself and her daughter to the hands of the usurper, added dignity and reputation to his cause. The princess Constia, who was then about five years of age, accompanied in a litter the march of the army. She was shown to the multitude in the arms of her adopted father, and, as often as she passed through the ranks, the tenderness of the soldiers was inflamed into martial fury. They recollected the glories of the house of Constantine, and they declared, with loyal acclamation, that they would shed the last drop of their blood in defense of the royal infant. In the meanwhile, Valentinian was alarmed and perplexed by the doubtful intelligence of the revolt of the East. The difficulties of a German forced him to confine his immediate care to the safety of his own dominions, and, as every channel of communication was stopped or corrupted, he listened with doubtful anxiety to the rumors which were industriously spread that the defeat and death of Valens had left Procopius sole master of the eastern provinces. Valens was not dead, but on the news of the rebellion which he received at Caesarea, he basely despaired of his life and fortune, proposed to negotiate with the usurper, and discovered his secret inclination to abdicate the imperial purple. The timid monarch was saved from disgrace and ruin by a firmness of his ministers, and their abilities soon decided in his favor the event of the civil war. In a season of tranquility, Saliust had resigned without a murmur, but as soon as the public safety was attacked, he ambitiously solicited the preeminence of toil and danger, and the restoration of that virtuous minister to the prefecture of the East was the first step which indicated the repentance of Valens and satisfied the minds of the people. The reign of Procopius was apparently supported by a powerful army and obedient provinces, but many of the principal officers, military as well as civil, had been urged either by motives of duty or interest to withdraw themselves from the guilty scene, or to watch the moment of betraying and deserting the cause of the usurper. Lupincius advanced by hasty marches to bring the legions of Syria to the aid of Valens. Erinthius, who in strength, beauty, and valor excelled all the heroes of the age, attacked with a small troop a superior body of the rebels. When he beheld the faces of the soldiers who had served under his banner, he commanded them, with a loud voice, to seize and deliver up their pretended leader. And such was the ascendant of his genius, that this extraordinary order was instantly obeyed. Arbito, a respectable veteran of the great Constantine, who had been distinguished by the honors of the consulorship, was persuaded to leave his retirement, and once more to conduct an army into the field. In the heat of action, calmly taking off his helmet, he showed his gray hairs and venerable countenance, saluted the soldiers of Procopius by the enduring names of children and companions, and exhorted them no longer to support the desperate cause of a contemptible tyrant, but to follow their old commander, who had so often led them to honor and victory. In the two engagements of Theatira and Nacolia, the unfortunate Procopius was deserted by his troops who were seduced by the instructions and example of their perdiferous officers. After wandering some time among the woods and mountains of Phygia, he was betrayed by his desponding followers, conducted to the imperial camp, and immediately beheaded. He suffered the ordinary fate of an unsuccessful usurper. But the acts of cruelty which were exercised by the conqueror under the forms of legal justice excited the pity and indignation of mankind. Such, indeed, are the common and natural fruits of despotism and rebellion. But the inquisition into the crime of magic, which, under the reign of the two brothers, was so rigorously prosecuted, both at Rome and Antioch, was interpreted as the fatal symptom, either of the displeasures of heaven or of the depravity of mankind. Let us not hesitate to indulge a liberal pride that, in the present age, the enlightened part of Europe has abolished a cruel and odious prejudice, which reigned in every climate of the globe, and adhered to every system of religious opinions. The nations and the sects 
of the Roman world admitted with equal credulity and similar abhorrence the reality of that infernal art which was able to control the eternal order of the planets and the voluntary operations of the human mind. They dreaded the mysterious power of spells and incantations, of potent herbs and execrable rites, which could extinguish or recall life, inflame the passions of the soul, blast the works of creation, or exhort from the reluctant demons the secret of futurity. They believed, with the wildest inconsistency, that this preternatural dominion of air, of earth, and of hell was exercised from the vilest motives of malice or gain by some wrinkled hags and itinerant sorcerers, who passed their obscure lives in penury and contempt. The arts of magic were equally condemned by the public opinion and by the laws of Rome, but as they tended to gratify the most imperious passions of the heart of man, they were continually proscribed and continually practiced. An imaginary cause as capable of producing the most serious and mischievous effects. The dark predictions of the death of an emperor or the success of a conspiracy were calculated only to stimulate the hopes of ambition and to dissolve the ties of fidelity. And the intentional guilt of magic was aggravated by the actual crimes of treason and sacrilege. Such vain terrors disturbed the peace of society and the happiness of individuals, and the harmless flame which insensibly melted a waxen image might derive a powerful and pernicious energy from the affrighted fancy of the person whom it was maliciously designed to represent, from the infusion of those herbs which were supposed to possess a supernatural influence, it was an easy step to the use of more substantial poison, and the folly of mankind sometimes became the instrument and the mask of the most atrocious crimes. As soon as the zeal of the informers was encouraged by the ministers of Valens and Valentinian, they could not refuse to listen to another charge, to frequently mingled in the scene of domestic guilt, a charge of a softer and less malignant nature, for which the pious, though excessive, rigor of Constantine had recently decreed the punishment of death. This deadly and incoherent mixture of treason and magic, of poison and adultery, afforded infinite gradations of guilt and innocence, of excuse and aggravation, which these proceedings appear to have been confounded by the angry or corrupt passions of the judges. They easily discovered that the degree of their industry and discernment was estimated by the imperial court according to the number of executions that were furnished from their respective tribunals. It was not without extreme reluctance that they pronounced a sentence of acquittal, but they eagerly admitted such evidence as was stated with perjury or procured by torture to prove the most improbable charges against the most respectable characters. The progress of the inquiry continually opened new subjects of criminal prosecution. The audacious informer, whose falsehood was detected, retired with impunity, but the wretched victim, who discovered his real or pretended accomplices, were seldom permitted to receive the price of his infamy. From the extremity of Italy and Asia, the young and the aged were dragged in chains to the tribunals of Rome and Antioch. Senators, matrons, and philosophers expired in ignominious and cruel tortures. The soldiers, who were appointed to guard the prisons, declared with a murmur of pity and indignation that their numbers were insufficient to oppose the flight or resistance of the multitude of captives. The wealthiest families were ruined by fines and confiscations. The most innocent citizens trembled for their safety, and we may form some notion of the magnitude of the evil from the extravagant assertion of an ancient writer that, in the obnoxious provinces, the prisoners, the exiles, and the fugitives formed the greatest part of the inhabitants. When Tacitus describes the deaths of the innocent and illustrious Romans, who were sacrificed to the cruelty of the first Caesars, the art of the historian, or the merit of the sufferers, excites in our breast the most lively sensations of terror, of admiration, and of pity. The coarse and undistinguishing pencil of Ammianus has delineated his bloody figures with tedious and disgusting accuracy. But our attention is no longer engaged in the contrast of freedom and servitude, 
of recent greatness and of actual misery. We should turn with horror from the frequent executions which disgraced both at Rome and Antioch the reign of the two brothers. Valens was of a timid and Valentinian of a choleric disposition. An anxious regard to his personal safety was the ruling principle of the administration of Valens. In the condition of a subject he had kissed with trembling awe the hand of the oppressor, and when he ascended to the throne he reasonably expected that the same fears which had subdued his own mind would secure the patient submission of his people. The favorites of Valens obtained, by the privilege of rapine and confiscation, the wealth which his economy would have refused. They urged, with persuasive eloquence, that in all cases of treason, suspicion is equivalent to proof, that the power supposes the intention of mischief, that the intention is not less criminal than the act, and that a subject no longer deserves to live if his daily life may threaten the safety or disturb the repose of the sovereign. The judgment of Valentinian was sometimes deceived and his confidence abused, but he would have silenced the informers with a contemptuous smile had they presumed to alarm his fortitude by the sound of danger. They praised his inflexible love of justice, and, in the pursuit of justice, the emperor was easily tempted to consider clemency as a weakness and passion as a virtue. As long as he wrestled with his equals, in the bold competition of an active and ambitious life, Valentinian was seldom injured and never insulted with impunity. If his prudence was arraigned, his spirit was applauded, and the proudest and most powerful generals were apprehensive of provoking the resentment of a fearless soldier. After he became master of the world, he unfortunately forgot that where no resistance can be made, no courage can be exerted. And instead of consulting the dictates of reason and magnanimity, he indulged the furious emotions of his temper at a time when they were disgraceful to himself and fatal to the defenseless objects of his displeasure. In the government of his household, or of his empire, slight or even imaginary offenses, a hasty word, a casual omission, an involuntary delay, were chastised by a sentence of immediate death. The expressions which issued most readily from the mouth of the emperor of the West were, Strike off his head, burn him alive, let him be beaten with clubs until he expires. And his most famous ministers understood that, by a rash attempt to dispute or suspend the execution of his sanguinary commands, they might involve themselves in the guilt and punishment of disobedience. The repeated gratification of this savage justice hardened the mind of Valentinian against pity and remorse, and the sallies of passion were confirmed by the habits of cruelty. He could behold with calm satisfaction the convulsive agonies of torture and death. He reserved his friendship for those faithful servants whose temper was the most congenial to his own. The merit of Maximin, who had slaughtered the noblest families of Rome, was rewarded with the royal approbation and the prefecture of Gaul. Two fierce and enormous bears, distinguished by the appellations of Innocence and Mica Aurea, could alone deserve to share the favor of Maximin. The cages of those trusty guards were always placed near the bedchamber of Valentinian, who frequently amused his eyes with the grateful spectacle of seeing them tear and devour the bleeding limbs of the malefactors who were abandoned to their rage. Their diet and exercises were carefully inspected by the Roman emperor, and when innocence had earned her discharge by a long course of meritorious service, the faithful animal was again restored to the freedom of her native woods. End of section 49「Chapter 25, Part 3 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 25, Reigns of Jovian and Valentinian, Division of the Empire, Part 3. But in the calmer moments of reflection, when the mind of Valens was not agitated by fear, or that of Valentinian by rage, the tyrant resumed the sentiments, or at least the conduct, of the father of his country. 
the dispassionate judgment of the Western Emperor could clearly perceive and accurately peruse his own and the public interest, and the sovereign of the East, who imitated with equal docility the various examples which he received from his elder brother, was sometimes guided by the wisdom and virtue of the prefect Salust. Both princes invariably retained, in the purple, the chaste and temperate simplicity which had adorned their private life, and under their reign the pleasures of the court never cost the people a blush or a sigh. They gradually reformed many of the abuses of the times of Constantius, judiciously adopted and improved the designs of Julian and his successor, and displayed a style and spirit of legislation which might inspire posterity with the most favorable opinion of their character and government. It is not from the master of innocence that we should expect the tender regard for the welfare of his subjects, which prompted Valentinian to condemn the exposition of newborn infants and to establish fourteen skillful physicians with stipends and privileges in the fourteen quarters of Rome. The good sense of an illiterate soldier founded a useful and liberal institution for the education of youth and the support of declining science. It was his intention that the arts of rhetoric and grammar should be taught in the Greek and Latin languages, in the metropolis of every province, and as the size and dignity of the school was usually proportioned to the importance of the city, the academies of Rome and Constantinople claimed a just and singular preeminence. The fragments of the literary edicts of Valentinian imperfectly represent the school of Constantinople, which was gradually improved by subsequent regulations. That school consisted of thirty-one professors in different branches of learning, one philosopher and two lawyers, five sophists and ten grammarians for the Greek, and three orators and ten grammarians for the Latin tongue, besides seven scribes, or as they were styled antiquarians, whose laborious pens supplied the public library with fair and correct copies of the classic writers. The rule of conduct which was prescribed to the students is the more curious as it affords the first outlines of the form and discipline of a modern university. It was required that they should bring proper certificates from the magistrates of their native province. Their names, professions, and places of abode were regularly entered into a public register. The studious youth were severely prohibited from wasting their time in feasts or in the theater, and the term of their education was limited to the age of twenty. The prefect of the city was empowered to chastise the idle and refractory by stripes or expulsion, and he was directed to make an annual report to the masters of the offices, that the knowledge and abilities of the scholars might be usefully applied to the public service. The institutions of Valentinian contributed to secure the benefits of peace and plenty, and the cities were guarded by the establishment of the defenders freely elected as the tributes and advocates of the people to support their rights and to expose their grievances before the tribunals of the civil magistrates or even at the foot of the imperial throne. The finances were diligently administered by two princes who had been so long accustomed to the rigid economy of a private fortune, but in the receipt and application of the revenue a discerning eye might observe some differences between the government of the East and of the West. Valens was persuaded that royal liberality can be supplied only by public oppression, and his ambition never aspired to secure, by their actual distress, the future strength and prosperity of his people. Instead of increasing the weight of taxes, which, in the space of forty years, had gradually doubled, he reduced, in the first years of his reign, one-fourth of the tribute of the East. Valentinian appears to have been less attentive and less anxious to relieve the burden of his people. He might reform the abuses of the fiscal administration, but he exacted without scruple a very large share of the private property. He was convinced that the revenues which supported the luxury of individuals would be much more advantageously employed for the defense and improvement of the state. The subjects of the East, who enjoyed the present benefit, applauded the indulgence of their prince. 
the solid but less splendid merit of Valentinian was felt and acknowledged by the subsequent generation. But the most honorable circumstance of the character of Valentinian is the firm and temperate impartiality which he uniformly preserved in an age of religious contention. His strong sense, unenlightened, but uncorrupted by study, declined with respectful indifference the subtle questions of theological debate. The government of the earth claimed his vigilance and satisfied his ambition, and while he remembered that he was the disciple of the church, he never forgot that he was the sovereign of the clergy. Under the reign of an apostate, he had signalized his zeal for the honor of Christianity. He allowed to his subjects the privilege which he had assured for himself that they might accept with gratitude and confidence the general toleration which was granted by a prince addicted to passion, but incapable of fear or disguise. The pagans, the Jews, and all the various sects which acknowledged the divine authority of Christ were protected by the laws from arbitrary power or popular insult. Nor was any mode of worship prohibited by Valentinian, except those secret and criminal practices which abused the name of religion for the dark purposes of vice and disorder. The art of magic, as it was more cruelly punished, was more strictly proscribed. But the emperor admitted a formal distinction to protect the ancient methods of divination, which were approved by the Senate and exercised by the Tuscan Harupsis. He had condemned, with the consent of the most rational pagans, the license of nocturnal sacrifices, but he immediately admitted the petition of Protexatus, proconsul of Achaea, who represented that the life of the Greeks would become dreary and comfortless if they were deprived of the invaluable blessings of the Eleusian mysteries. Philosophy alone can boast, and perhaps it is no more than the boast of philosophy, that her gentle hand is able to eradicate from the human mind the latent and deadly principle of fanaticism. But this truce of twelve years, which was enforced by the wise and vigorous government of Valentinian, by suspending the repetition of mutual injuries, contributed to soften the manners and abate the prejudices of the religious factions. A friend of toleration was unfortunately placed at a distance from the scene of the fiercest controversies. As soon as the Christians of the West had extricated themselves from the snares of the creed of Rimini, they happily relapsed to the slumber of orthodoxy, and the small remains of the Arian party that still subsisted at Sirminium or Milan might be considered rather as objects of contempt than of resentment. But in the provinces of the East, from Eusene to the extremities of Thebaeus, the strength and numbers of the hostile factions were more equally balanced, and this equality, instead of recommending the counsels of peace, served only to perpetuate the horrors of religious war. The monks and bishops supported their arguments by invectives, and their invectives were sometimes followed by blows. Athanasius still reigned at Alexandria. The thrones of Constantinople and Antioch were occupied by Arian prelates and every episcopal vacancy was the occasion of a popular tumult. The Homoousians were fortified by the reconciliation of fifty-nine Macedonian or semi-Arian bishops, but their secret reluctance to embrace the divinity of the Holy Ghost clouded the splendor of the triumph and the declaration of Valens, who, in the first years of his reign, had imitated the impartial conduct of his brother, was an important victory on the side of Arianism. The two brothers had passed their private life in the condition of catechumens, but the piety of Valens prompted him to solicit the sacrament of baptism before he exposed his person to the dangers of a Gothic war. He naturally addressed himself to Eudoxus, bishop of the imperial city, and if the ignorant monarch was instructed by that Arian pastor in the principles of heterodox theology, his misfortune, rather than his guilt, was the inevitable consequence of his erroneous choice. Whatever had been the determination of the emperor, he must have offended a numerous party of his Christian subjects, as the leaders of both the Homoousians and of the Arians believed that, if they were not suffered to reign, they were most cruelly injured and oppressed. 
After he had taken this decisive step, it was extremely difficult for him to preserve either the virtue or the reputation of impartiality. He never aspired, like Constantius, to the fame of a profound theologian, but as he received with simplicity and respect the tenets of Eudoxus, Valens resigned his conscience to the direction of his ecclesiastical guides, and promoted, by the influence of his authority, the reunion of the Athanasian heretics to the body of the Catholic Church. At first he pitied their blindness, by degrees he was provoked at their obstinacy, and he insensibly hated those sectaries to whom he was an object of hatred. The feeble mind of Valens was always swayed by the persons with whom he familiarly conversed, and the exile or imprisonment of a private citizen are the favors most readily granted in a despotic court. Such punishments were frequently inflicted on the leaders of the Homoousian party, and the misfortune of fourscore ecclesiastics of Constantinople, who, perhaps accidentally, were burned on shipboard, was imputed to the cruel and premeditated malice of the emperor and his Arian ministers. In every contest, the Catholics, if we may anticipate that name, were obliged to pay the penalty of their own faults, and of those of their adversaries. In every election, the claims of the Arian candidate obtained the preference, and if they were opposed by the majority of the people, he was usually supported by the authority of the civil magistrate, or even by the terrors of a military force. The enemies of Athanasius attempted to disrupt the last years of his venerable age, and his temporary retreat to his father's sepulchre has been celebrated as a fifth exile. But the zeal of a great people, who instantly flew to arms, intimidated the prefect, and the archbishop was permitted to end his life in peace and in glory, after a reign of forty-seven years. The death of Athanasius was the signal of the persecution of Egypt, and the pagan minister of Valens, who forcibly seated the worthless Lucius on the archiepiscopal throne, purchased the favor of the reigning party by the blood and sufferings of their Christian brethren. The free toleration of the heathen and Jewish worship was bitterly lamented. As a circumstance which aggravated the misery of the Catholics, and the guilt of the impious tyrant of the East. The triumph of the Orthodox party has left a deep stain of persecution on the memory of Valens, and the character of a prince who derived his virtues, as well as his vices, from a feeble understanding and pulsimonious temper, scarcely deserves the labor of an apology. Yet candor may discover some reasons to suspect that the ecclesiastical ministers of Valens often exceeded the orders, or even the intentions, of their master. And the real measure of facts has been very liberally magnified by the vehement declamation and easy credulity of his antagonists. The silence of Valentinian may suggest a probable argument that the partial severities which were exercised in the name and provinces of his colleague amounted only to some obscure and inconsiderable deviations from the established system of religious toleration. And the judicious historian, who has praised with equal temper of the elder brother, has not thought himself obliged to contrast the tranquility of the West with the cruel persecution of the East. Whatever credit may be allowed to vague and distant reports, the character, or at least the behavior, of Valens may be most frequently seen in his personal transactions with the eloquent Basil, Archbishop of Caesarea, who had succeeded Athanasius in the management of the Trinitarian cause. The circumstantial narrative has been composed by the friends and admirers of Basil, and as soon as we have stripped away a thick coat of rhetoric and miracle, we shall be astonished by the unexpected mildness of the Arian tyrant, who admired the firmness of his character, or was apprehensive, if he employed violence, of a general revolt in the province of Cappadocia. The archbishop, who asserted with inflexible pride the truth of his opinions and the dignity of his rank, was left in the free possession of his conscience and his throne. The emperor devoutly assisted at the solemn service of the cathedral, and, instead of a sentence of banishment, subscribed the donation of a valuable estate for the use of a hospital, which Basil had lately founded in the neighborhood of Caesarea. 
I am not able to discover that any law, such as Theodosius afterwards enacted against the Arians, was published by Valens against the Athanasian sectaries, and the edict which excited the most violent clamors may not appear so extremely reprehensible. The emperor had observed that several of his subjects, gratifying their lazy disposition under the pretense of religion, had associated themselves with the monks of Egypt, and he directed the count of the east to drag them from their solitude and to compel these deserters of society to accept the fair alternative of renouncing their temporal possessions or of discharging the public duties of men and citizens. The ministers of Valens seemed to have extended the sense of this penal statute, since they claimed a right of enlisting the young and able-bodied monks in the imperial armies. A detachment of cavalry and infantry, consisting of three thousand men, marched from Alexandria to the adjacent desert of Nitria, which was peopled by five thousand monks. The soldiers were conducted by Arian priests, and it is reported that a considerable slaughter was made in the monasteries which disobeyed the commands of their sovereign. The strict regulations which have been framed by the wisdom of modern legislators to restrain the wealth and avarice of the clergy may be originally deduced from the example of the Emperor Valentinian. His edict, addressed to Damascus, Bishop of Rome, was publicly read in the churches of the city. He admonished the ecclesiastics and monks not to frequent the houses of widows and virgins, and menaced their disobedience with the animadversion of the civil judge. The director was no longer permitted to receive any gift or legacy or inheritance from the liberality of his spiritual daughter. Every testament contrary to this edict was declared null and void, and the illegal donation was confiscated for the use of the treasury. By a subsequent regulation, it should seem, that the same provisions were extended to nuns and bishops, and that all persons of the ecclesiastical order were rendered incapable of receiving any testamentary gifts, and strictly confined to the natural and legal rights of inheritance. As the guardian of domestic happiness and virtue, Valentinian applied his severe remedy to the growing evil. In the capital of the empire, the females of noble and opulent houses possessed a very ample share of independent property, and many of those devout females had embraced the doctrines of Christianity, not only with the cold assent of the understanding, but with the warmth of affection, and perhaps the eagerness of fashion. They sacrificed the pleasures of dress and luxury, and renounced for the praise of chastity the soft endearments of conjugal society. Some ecclesiastics, of real or apparent sanctity, were chosen to direct their timorous conscience, and to amuse the vacant tenderness of their hearts, and the unbounded confidence with which they hastily bestowed was often abused by knaves and enthusiasts, who hastened from the extremities of the East to enjoy, on a splendid theater, the privileges of the monastic profession. By the contempt of the world, they insensibly acquired its most desirable advantages. The lively attachment, perhaps, of a young and beautiful woman, the delicate plenty of an opulent household, and the respectful homage of the slaves, the freedmen, and the clients of a senatorial family. The immense portions of the Roman ladies were gradually consumed in lavish alms and expensive pilgrimages, and the artful monk who had assigned himself the first, or possibly the sole, place in the testament of his spiritual daughter, still presumed to declare, with the smooth face of hypocrisy, that he was only the instrument of charity and the steward of the poor. The lucrative but disgraceful trade which was exercised by the clergy to defraud the expectations of the natural heirs had provoked the indignation of a superstitious age, and two of the most respectable of the Latin fathers very honestly confess that the ignominious edict of Valentinian was just and necessary, and that the Christian priests had deserved to lose a privilege which was still enjoyed by comedians, charioteers, and the ministers of idols. But the wisdom and authority of the legislator are seldom victorious in a contest with the vigilant dexterity of private interests, and Jerome or Ambrose might patiently acquiesce in the justice of an ineffectual or salutary law. 
If the ecclesiastics were checked in the pursuit of personal emollient, they would exert a more laudable industry to increase the wealth of the church, and dignify their covetousness with the specious names of piety and patriotism. Damasus, bishop of Rome, who was constrained to stigmatize the avarice of his clergy by the publication of the law of Valentinian, had the good sense, or the good fortune, to engage in his service the zeal and abilities of the learned Jerome, and the grateful saint has celebrated the merit and purity of a very ambitious character. But the splendid vices of the Church of Rome, under the reign of Valentinian and Damasus, have been curiously observed by the historian Ammianus, who delivers his impartial sense in these expressive words. The prefecture of Juventius was accomplished with peace and plenty, but the tranquillity of his government was soon disturbed by a bloody sedition of the distracted people. The ardor of Damascus and Ursinus to seize the episcopal seat surpassed the ordinary measure of human ambition. They contended with the rage of party, the quarrel was maintained by the wounds and death of their followers, and the prefect, unable to resist or appease the tumult, was constrained, by superior violence, to retire into the suburbs. Damascus prevailed, the well-disputed victory remained on the side of his faction. One hundred and thirty-seven dead bodies were found at the Basilica of Sicinius, where the Christians hold their religious assemblies. It was long before the angry minds of the people redeemed their accustomed tranquillity. When I consider the splendor of the capital, I am not astonished that so valuable a prize should inflame the desires of ambitious men, and produce the fiercest and most obstinate contests. The successful candidate is secure that he will be enriched by the offerings of matrons, that, as soon as his dress is composed with becoming care and elegance, he may proceed in his chariot through the streets of Rome, and that the sumptuousness of the imperial table will not equal the profuse and delicate entertainments provided by the taste, and at the expense of the Roman pontiffs. How much more rationally continues the honest pagan, would those pontiffs consult their true happiness, if instead of alleging the greatness of the city as an excuse for their manners, they would imitate the exemplary life of some provincial bishops, whose temperance and sobriety, whose mean apparel and downcast looks, recommended their pure and modest virtue to the deity and his true worshippers. The schism of Damascus and Ursinus was extinguished by the exile of the latter, and the wisdom of the prefect Praetextatus restored the tranquillity of the city. Praetextatus was a philosophic pagan, a man of learning, of taste, and politeness, who disguised a reproach in the form of a jest, when he assured Damachus that if he could obtain the bishopric of Rome, he himself would immediately embrace the Christian religion. This lively picture of the wealth and luxury of the popes in the fourth century becomes the more curious as it represents the intermediate degree between the humble poverty of the apostolic fisherman and the royal state of a temporal prince, whose dominions extended from the confines of Naples to the banks of the Po. End of Part 3 Chapter 25, Part 4 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 25, Reigns of Jovian and Valentinian, Division of the Empire. Part 4. When the suffrage of the generals and of the army committed the scepter of the Roman Empire to the hands of Valentinian, his reputation in arms, his military skill and experience, and his rigid attachment to the forms, as well as spirit, of ancient discipline, were the principal motives of their judicious choice. The eagerness of the troops who pressed him to nominate his colleague was justified by the dangerous situation of public affairs, and Valentinian himself was conscious that the abilities of the most active mind were unequal to the defense of the distant frontiers of an invaded monarchy. As soon as the death of Julian had 
relieved the barbarians from the terror of his name, the most sanguine hopes of rapine and conquest excited the nations of the east, of the north, and of the south. Their inroads were often vexatious, and sometimes formidable. But during the twelve years of the reign of Valentinian, his firmness and vigilance protected his own domains, and his powerful genius seemed to inspire and direct the feeble counsels of his brother. Perhaps the method of annals would more forcibly express the urgent and divided cares of the two emperors. But the attention of the reader, likewise, would be distracted by a tedious and dulcetory narrative. A separate view of the five great theaters of war. 1. Germany. 2. Britain. 3. Africa. 4. The East. And 5. The Danube will impress a more distinct image of the military state of the empire under the reigns of Valentinian and Valens. 1. The ambassadors of the Alemanni had been offended by the harsh and haughty behavior of Ursasius, master of the offices, who by an act of unseasonable parsimony had diminished the value as well as the quantity of the presents to which they were entitled, either from custom or treaty, on the ascension of a new emperor. They expressed and they communicated to their countrymen their strong sense of the national affront. The irascible minds of the chiefs were exasperated by the suspicion of contempt, and the martial youth crowded to their standard. Before Valentinian could pass the Alps, the villages of Gaul were in flames. Before his general, de Galafius, could encounter the Alemanni, they had secured the captives and the spoil in the forests of Germany. In the beginning of the ensuing year, the military forces of the whole nation, in deep and solid columns, broke through the barrier of the Rhine, during the severity of a northern winter. Two Roman counts were defeated and mortally wounded, and the standard of the Heruli and Batavians fell into the hands of the conquerors, who displayed, with insulting shouts and menaces, the trophy of their victory. The standard was recovered, but the Batavians had not redeemed the shame of their disgrace and flight in the eyes of their severe judge. It was the opinion of Valentinian that his soldiers must learn to fear their commander before they could cease to fear the enemy. The troops were solemnly assembled, and the trembling Batavians were enclosed within the circle of the imperial army. Valentinian then ascended his tribunal, and, as if he disdained to punish cowardice with death, he inflicted a stain of indelible ignominy on the officers whose misconduct and pulsimony were found to be the first occasion of the defeat. The Batavians were degraded from their rank, stripped of their arms, and condemned to be sold for slaves to the highest bidder. At this tremendous sentence, the troops fell prostrate on the ground, deprecated the indignation of their sovereign, and protested that, if he should indulge them in another trial, they would approve themselves not unworthy of the name of Romans and of his soldiers. Valentinian, with affected reluctance, yielded to their entreaties. The Batavians resumed their arms, and with their arms the invincible resolution of wiping away their disgrace in the blood of the Alemanni. The principal command was declined by Dagalaiphus and that experienced general who had represented, perhaps with too much prudence, the extreme difficulties of the undertaking, had the mortification before the end of the campaign of seeing his rival, Jovinius, convert those difficulties into a decisive advantage over the scattered forces of the barbarians. At the head of a well-disciplined army of cavalry, infantry, and light troops, Jovinus advanced with cautious and rapid steps to Scarpona, in the territory of Metz, where he surprised a large division of the Alemanni before they had time to run to their arms, and flushed his soldiers with the confidence of an easy and bloodless victory. Another division, or rather army, of the enemy, after the cruel and wanton devastation of the adjacent country, reposed themselves on the shady banks of the Moselle. Jovinus, who had viewed the ground with the eye of a general, made a silent approach through a deep and woody vale, till he could distinctly perceive the indolent security of the Germans. Some were bathing their huge limbs in the river, others were combing their long and flaxen hair, others again were swallowing large draughts of rich and delicious wine. On a sudden they heard the sound of a Roman trumpet. 
they saw the enemy in their camp. Astonishment produced disorder. Disorder was followed by flight and dismay, and the confused multitude of the bravest warriors was pierced by the swords and javelins of the legionaries and auxiliaries. The fugitives escaped to the third and most considerable camp in the Catalonian plains near Chalons in Champagne. The straggling detachments were hastily recalled to their standard, and the barbarian chiefs, alarmed and admonished by the fate of their companions, prepared to encounter in a decisive battle the victorious forces of the lieutenant of Valentinian. The bloody and obstinate conflict lasted a whole summer's day, with equal valor and with alternate success. The Romans at length prevailed, with the loss of about twelve hundred men. Six thousand of the Alemanni were slain, four thousand were wounded, and the brave Jovinius, after chasing the flying remnant of their host as far as the banks of the Rhine, returned to Paris to receive the applause of his sovereign and the ensigns of the consulship for the ensuing year. The triumph of the Romans was indeed sullied by their treatment of the captive king, whom they hung on a gibbet, without the knowledge of their indignant general. This disgraceful act of cruelty, which might be imputed to the fury of the troops, was followed by the deliberate murder of Withicab, the son of Vladimir, a German prince, of a weak and sickly constitution, but of a daring and formidable spirit. The domestic assassin was instigated and protected by the Romans, and the violation of the laws of humanity and justice betrayed their secret apprehension of the weakness of the declining empire. The use of the dagger is seldom adopted in public councils, as long as there remain any confidence in the power of the sword. While the Alemanni appeared to be humbled by their recent calamities, the pride of Valentinian was mortified by the unexpected surprisal of Mugantiasm, or Mentz, the principal city of the Upper Germany. In the unsuspicious moment of a Christian festival, Rando, a bold and artful chieftain who had long mediated his attempt, suddenly passed the Rhine, entered the defenseless town, and retired with a multitude of captives of either sex. Valentinian resolved to execute severe vengeance on the whole body of the nation. Count Sebastian, with the bands of Italy and Illyricum, was ordered to invade their country, most probably on the side of Raetia. The emperor in person, accompanied by his son Gratian, passed the Rhine at the head of a formidable army, which was supported on both flanks by Jovinesus and Severus, the two masters general of the cavalry and infantry of the West. The Alemanni, unable to prevent the devastation of their villages, fixed their camp on a lofty and almost inaccessible mountain in the modern duchy of Wittenberg, and resolutely expected the approach of the Romans. The life of Valentinian was exposed to imminent danger by the intrepid curiosity with which he persisted to explore some secret and unguarded path. A troop of barbarians suddenly rose from their ambuscade, and the emperor, who vigorously spurred his horse down a steep and slippery descent, was obliged to leave behind him his armor-bearer and his helmet, magnificently enriched with gold and precious stones. At the signal of a general assault, the Roman troops encompassed and ascended the mountains of Solicinium on three different sides. Every step they gained increased their ardor, and abated the resistance of the enemy. And after their united forces had occupied the summit of the hill, they impetuously urged the barbarians down the northern descent, where Count Sebastian was posted to intercept their retreat. After his signal victory, Valentinian returned to his winter quarters at Trevers, where he indulged the public joy by the exhibition of splendid and triumphal games. But the wise monarch, instead of aspiring to the conquest of Germany, confined his attention to the important and laborious defense of the Gallic frontier, against an enemy whose strength was renewed by a stream of daring volunteers, which incessantly flowed from the most distant tribes of the north. The banks of the Rhine, from its source to the straits of the ocean, were closely planted with strong castles and convenient towers. New works and new arms were invented by the ingenuity of a prince who was skilled in the mechanical arts, 
and his numerous levies of Roman and barbarian youth were severely trained in all the exercises of war. The progress of the work, which was sometimes opposed by modest representations and sometimes by hostile attempts, secured the tranquillity of Gaul during the nine subsequent years of the administration of Valentinian. That prudent emperor who diligently practiced the wise maxims of Diocletian was studious to foment and excite the intestine divisions of the tribes of Germany. About the middle of the fourth century, the countries, perhaps of Lucene and Thuringia, on either side of the Elbe, were occupied by the vague dominion of the Burgundians, a warlike and numerous people of the Vandal race, whose obscure name insensibly swelled into a powerful kingdom, and was finally settled on a flourishing province. The most remarkable circumstance in the ancient manners of the Burgundians appears to have been the difference of their civil and ecclesiastical constitution. The appellation of Hendenos was given to the king or general, and the title of Sisistus to the high priest of the nation. The person of the priest was sacred, and his dignity perpetual, but the temporal government was held by a very precarious tenure. If the events of war accuses the courage or conduct of the king, he was immediately deposed, and the injustice of his subjects made him responsible for the fertility of the earth and the regularity of the seasons, which seemed to fall more properly within the sacerdotal department. The disputed possession of some salt pits engaged the Alemanni and the Burgundians in frequent contests. The latter were easily tempted by the secret solicitations and liberal offers of the emperor, and their fabulous descent from the Roman soldiers, who had formerly been left to garrison the fortress of Drusus, was admitted with mutual credulity, as it was conductive to mutual interest. An army of fourscore thousand Burgundians soon appeared on the banks of the Rhine, and impatiently required the support and subsidies which Valentinian had promised. But they were amused with excuses and delays, till at length, after a fruitless expectation, they were compelled to retire. The arms and fortifications of the Gallic frontier checked the fury of their best resentment, and their massacre of the captives served to embitter the hereditary feud of the Burgundians and the Alemanni. The inconsistency of a wise prince may, perhaps, be explained by some alteration of circumstances, and perhaps it was the original design of Valentinian to intimidate rather than to destroy, as the balance of power would have been equally overturned by the extirpation of either of the German nations. Among the princes of the Alemanni, Macrianus, who, with a Roman name, had assumed the arts of a soldier and statesman, deserved his hatred and esteem. The emperor himself, with a light and unencumbered band, condescended to pass the Rhine, march fifty miles into the country, and would infallibly have seized the object of his pursuit if his judicious measures had not been defeated by the impatience of the troops. Marcianus was afterwards admitted to the honor of a personal conference with the emperor and the favors which he received fixed him, till the hour of his death, a steady and sincere friend of the Republic. The land was covered by the fortifications of Valentinian, but the sea-coast of Gaul and Britain was exposed to the depredations of the Saxons. That celebrated name, in which we have a dear and domestic interest, escaped the notice of Tacitus and the maps of Ptolemy. It fairly marks the narrow neck of the Cimbric Peninsula, and three small islands toward the mouth of the Elbe. This contracted territory, the present duchy of Schleswig, or perhaps Holstein, was incapable of pouring forth the inexhaustible swarms of Saxons who reigned over the ocean, who filled the British island with their language, their laws, and their colonies, and who so long defended the liberty of the north against the arms of Charlemagne. The solution of this difficulty is easily derived from the similar manners and loose constitution of the tribes of Germany, which were blended with each other by the slightest accidents of war or friendship. 
the situation of the native Saxons disposed them to embrace the hazardous professions of fishermen and pirates, and the success of their first adventures would naturally excite the emulation of their bravest countrymen, who were impatient of the gloomy solitude of their woods and mountains. Every tide might float down the Elbe whole fleets of canoes, filled with hardy and intrepid associates, who aspired to behold the unbounded prospect of the ocean, and to taste the wealth and luxury of unknown worlds. It should seem possible, however, that the most numerous auxiliaries of the Saxons were furnished by the nations who dwelt along the shores of the Baltic. They possessed arms and ships, the art of navigation, and the habits of naval war. But the difficulty of issuing through the northern columns of Hercules, which during several months of the year are obstructed with ice, confined their skills and courage within the limits of a spacious lake. The rumor of the successful armaments which sailed from the mouth of the Elbe would soon provoke them to cross the narrow isthmus of Schleswig and to launch their vessels on the great sea. The various troops of pirates and adventurers who fought under the same standard were insensibly united in a permanent society, at first of rapine and afterwards of government. A military confederation was gradually molded into a national body by the gentle operation of marriage and consanguinity, and the adjacent tribes who solicited the alliance accepted the name and laws of the Saxons. If the fact were not established by the most unquestionable evidence, we should appear to abuse the credulity of our readers by the description of the vessels in which the Saxon pirates ventured to sport in the waves of the German Ocean, the British Channel, and the Bay of Biscay. The keel of their large flat-bottomed boats was framed of light timber, but the sides and upper works consisted only of wicker, with a covering of strong hides. In the course of their slow and distant navigations, they must always have been exposed to the danger, and very frequently to the misfortune, of shipwreck, and the naval annals of the Saxons were undoubtedly filled with the accounts of the losses which they sustained on the coasts of Britain and Gaul. But the daring spirit of the pirates braved the perils both of the sea and of the shore. Their skill was confirmed by the habits of enterprise. The meanest of their mariners was alike capable of handling an oar, of rearing a sail, or of conducting a vessel, and the Saxons rejoiced in the appearance of a tempest, which concealed their design and dispersed the fleets of the enemy. After they had acquired an accurate knowledge of the maritime provinces of the West, they extended the scene of their depredations, and the most sequestered places had no reason to presume on their security. The Saxon boats drew so little water that they could easily proceed fourscore or a hundred miles up the great rivers. Their weight was so inconsiderable that they were transported on wagons from one river to another, and the pirates who entered the mouth of the Seine or of the Rhine might descend with the rapid stream of the Rhone into the Mediterranean. Under the reign of Valentinian, the maritime provinces of Gaul were afflicted by the Saxons. A military count was stationed for the defense of the seacoast, or American limit, and that officer, who found his strength or his abilities unequal to the task, implored the assistance of Severus, master general of the infantry. The Saxons, surrounded and outnumbered, were forced to relinquish their spoil and to yield a select band of their tall and robust youth to serve in the imperial armies. They stipulated only a safe and honorable retreat, and the condition was readily granted by the Roman general, who mediated an act of perfidy, imprudent as it was inhuman, while a Saxon remained alive and in arms to revenge the fate of their countrymen. The premature eagerness of the infantry, who were secretly posted in a deep valley, betrayed the ambuscade, and they would perhaps have fallen the victims of their own treachery if a large body of cuirassiers, alarmed by the noise of the combat, had not hastily advanced to extricate their companions, and to overwhelm the undaunted valor of the Saxons. Some of the prisoners were saved from the edge of the sword to shed their blood in the amphitheater, and the orator Simatius complains that twenty-nine of those desperate savages, by strangling themselves with their own hands, had disappointed the amusement of the public. Yet the polite and philosophic citizens of Rome were impressed with the deepest honor, 
when they were informed that the Saxons consecrated to the gods the tithe of their human spoil, and they ascertained by lot the objects of the barbarous sacrifice. 2. The fabulous colonies of the Egyptians and Trojans, of Scandinavians and Spaniards, which flattered the pride and amused the credulity of our rude ancestors, have insensibly vanished in the light of science and philosophy. The present age is satisfied with the simple and rational opinion that the islands of Great Britain and Ireland were gradually peopled from the adjacent continent of Gaul, from the coast of Kent to the extremity of Caithness and Ulster. The memory of a Celtic origin was distinctly preserved in the perpetual resemblance of language, of religion, and of manners, and the peculiar characters of the British tribes might be naturally ascribed to the influence of accidental and local circumstances. The Roman province was reduced to the state of civilized and peaceful servitude. The rights of savage freedom were contracted to the narrow limits of Caledonia. The inhabitants of that northern region were divided, as early as the reign of Constantine, between two great tribes of the Scots and of the Picts, who have since experienced a very different fortune. The power and almost the memory of the Picts have been extinguished by their successful rivals, the Scots, after maintaining for ages the dignity of an independent kingdom, have multiplied by an equal and voluntary union the honors of the English name. The hand of nature had contributed to mark the ancient distinctions of the Scots and Picts. The former were the men of the hills, the latter those of the plain. The eastern coast of Caledonia may be considered as a level and fertile country, which, even with a rude state of tillage, was capable of producing a considerable quantity of corn, and the epithet of Kruichnich, or wheat-eaters, expressed the contempt or envy of the carnivorous highlander. The cultivation of the earth might introduce a more accurate separation of property and the habits of a sedentary life. But the love of arms and rapine was still the ruling passion of the Picts, and their warriors, who stripped themselves for a day of battle, were distinguished in the eyes of Romans by the strange fashion of painting their naked bodies with gaudy colors and fantastic figures. The western part of Caledonia irregularly rises into wild and barren hills, which scarcely repay the toil of the husbandmen, and are most profitably used for the pasture of cattle. The Highlanders are condemned to the occupations of shepherds and hunters, and, as they seldom are fixed to any permanent habitation, they acquired the expressive name of Scots, which, in the Celtic tongue, is said to be equivalent to that of wanderers or vagrants. The inhabitants of a barren land were urged to seek a fresh supply of food in the waters. The deep lakes and bays which intersect their country are plentifully supplied with fish, and they gradually ventured to cast their nets in the waves of the ocean. The vicinity of the Hebrides, so profusely scattered along the western coast of Scotland, tempted their curiosity and improved their skill, and they acquired, by slow degrees, the art, or rather the habit, of managing their boats in a tempestuous sea, and of steering their nocturnal course by the light of the well-known stars. The two bold headlands of Caledonia almost touched the shores of a spacious island, which obtained from its luxuriant vegetation the epithet of green, and has preserved, with a slight alteration, the name of Erin, or Arena, or Ireland. It is probable that in some remote period of antiquity the fertile plains of Ulster received a colony of hungry Scots, and that the strangers of the north, who had dared to encounter the arms of the legions, spread their conquests over the savage and unwarlike natives of a solitary island. It is certain that, in the declining age of the Roman Empire, Caledonia, Ireland, and the Isle of Man were inhabited by the Scots, and that the kindred tribes who were often associated with military enterprise were deeply affected by the various accidents of their mutual fortunes. They long cherished a lively tradition of their common name and origin, and the missionaries of the Isle of Saints, who diffused the light of Christianity over northern Britain, established the vain opinion that their Irish countrymen were the natural as well as spiritual fathers of the Scottish race. 
The loose and obscure tradition has been preserved by the venerable Bede, who scattered some rays of light over the darkness of the eighth century. On this slight foundation, a huge superstructure of fable has gradually reared, by the bards and the monks, two orders of men who equally abused the privilege of fiction. The Scottish nation, with mistaken pride, adopted their Irish genealogy, and the annals of a long line of imaginary kings have been adorned by the fancy of Boethus and the classic elegance of Buchanan. End of Part 51、Chapter、25 Chapter Part five of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twenty Five Reigns of Jovian and Valentinian, Division of the Empire. Part five. Six years after the death of Constantine, the destructive inroads of the Scots and Picts required the presence of his youngest son, who reigned in the Western Empire. Constans visited his British dominions, but we may form some estimate of the importance of his achievements by the language of panegyric, which celebrates only his triumph over the elements, or, in other words, the good fortune of a safe and easy passage from the port of Boulogne to the harbor of Sandwich. The calamities which the afflicted provincials continued to experience from foreign war and domestic tyranny were aggravated by the feeble and corrupt administration of the eunuchs of Constantinus, and the transient relief which they might obtain from the virtues of Julian was soon lost by the absence and death of their benefactor. The sums of gold and silver which had been painfully collected or liberally transmitted for the payment of the troops. Were intercepted by the avarice of the commanders, discharges or at least exemptions from the military service were publicly sold. The distress of the soldiers, who were injuriously deprived of their legal and scanty subsistence, provoked them to frequent desertion. The nerves of discipline were relaxed, and the highways were infested with robbers. The oppression of the good and the impunity of the wicked equally contributed. To diffuse through the island a spirit of discontent and revolt, and every ambitious subject, every desperate exile, might entertain a reasonable hope of subverting the weak and distracting the government of Britain. The hostile tribes of the north, who detested the pride and power of the king of the world, suspended their domestic feuds, and the barbarians of the land and sea, the Scots, the Picts, and the Saxons. Spread themselves with rapid and irresistible fury from the wall of Antoninus to the shores of Kent. Every production of art and nature, every object of convenience and luxury, which they were incapable of creating by labor or procuring by trade, was accumulated in the rich and fruitful province of Britain. A philosopher may deplore the eternal discords of the human race, but he will confess. That the desire of spoil is a more rational provocation than the vanity of conquest. From the age of Constantine to the Plantagenets, this rapacious spirit continued to instigate the poor and hardy Caledonians. But the same people, whose generous humanity seems to inspire the songs of Ossian, was disgraced by a savage ignorance of the virtues of peace and the laws of war. Their southern neighbors have felt. And perhaps exaggerated the cruel depredations of the Scots and Picts, and the valiant tribe of Caledonia, the Atticoti, the enemies, and afterwards the soldiers of Valentinian, are accused by an eye witness of delighting in the taste of human flesh when they hunted the woods for prey. It is said that they attacked the shepherd rather than his flock, and that they curiously selected the most delicate and brawny parts. Both of males and females, which they prepared for their horrid repasts. If in the neighborhood of the commercial and literary town of Glasgow a race of cannibals has really existed, we may contemplate in the period of the Scottish history the opposite extremes of savage and civilized life. Such reflections tend to enlarge the circle of our ideas and to encourage the pleasing hope that New Zealand may produce in some future age the Hume of the Southern Hemisphere. 
Every messenger who escaped across the British Channel conveyed the most melancholy and alarming tidings to the ears of Valentinian, and the Emperor was soon informed that the two military commanders of the province had been surprised and cut off by the barbarians. Severus, Count of the Domestics, was hastily dispatched and as suddenly recalled by the court of Trevis. The representations of Jovius served only to indicate the greatness of the evil, and, after a long and serious consultation, the defense, or rather the recovery, of Britain was entrusted to the abilities of the brave Theodosius. The exploits of that general, the father of a line of emperors, have been celebrated with peculiar complacency by the writers of the age, but his real merit deserves their applause, and his nomination was received by the army and province as a sure presage of approaching victory. He seized the favorable moment of navigation and securely landed the numerous and veteran bands of the Heruli and Batavians, the Jovians and the victors. In his march from Sandwich to London, Theodosius defeated several parties of the barbarians, released a multitude of captives, and, after distributing to his soldiers a small portion of the spoil, established the fame of disinterested justice by restitution of the remainder to the rightful proprietors. The citizens of London, who had almost despaired of their safety, threw open their gates, and as soon as Theodosius had obtained from the court of Trevors the important aid of a military lieutenant and a civil governor, he executed, with wisdom and vigor, the laborious task of the deliverance of Britain. The vagrant soldiers were recalled to their standard, an edict of amnesty dispelled the public apprehensions, and his cheerful example alleviated the rigor of martial discipline. The scattered and desultory warfare of the barbarians, who infested the land and sea, deprived him of the glory of a signal victory. But the prudent spirit and consummate art of the Roman general were displayed in the operations of two campaigns which successively rescued every part of the province from the hands of a cruel and rapacious enemy. The splendor of the cities and the security of the fortifications were diligently restored by the paternal care of Theodosius, who, with a strong hand, confined the trembling Caledonians to the northern angle of the island, and perpetuated by the name and settlement of the new province of Valentina, the glories of the reign of Valentian. The voice of poetry and panegyric may add, perhaps with some degree of truth, that the unknown regions of Thule were stained with the blood of the Picts, that the oars of Theodosius dashed the waves of the Hyperborean ocean, and that the distant Orkneys were the scene of his naval victory over the Saxon pirates. He left the province with a fair as well as splendid reputation, and was immediately promoted to the rank of Master General of the Cavalry, by a prince who could applaud, without envy, the merit of his servants in the important station of the Upper Danube. The conqueror of Britain checked and defeated the armies of the Almani, before he was chosen to suppress the revolt of Africa. 3. The prince who refuses to be the judge instructs the people to consider him as the accomplice of his ministers. The military command of Africa had been long exercised by Count Romanus, and his abilities were not inadequate to this station, but, as sordid interest was the sole motive of his conduct, he acted on most occasions as if he had been the enemy of the province and the friend of the barbarians of the desert. The three flourishing cities of Oia, Leptis, and Sabrata, which, under the name of Tripoli, had long constituted a federal union, were obliged, for the first time, to shut their gates against a hostile invasion. Several of their most honorable citizens were surprised and massacred. The villages, and even the suburbs, were pillaged, and the vines and fruit trees of that rich territory were extirpated, the malicious savages of Getulia. The unhappy provincials implored the protection of Romanus, but they soon found that their military governor was not less cruel and rapacious than the barbarians, 
as they were incapable of furnishing the four thousand camels and the exorbitant present which he required before he would march to the assistance of Tripoli. His demand was equivalent to a refusal, and he might justly be accused as the author of the public calamity. In the annual assembly of the three cities, they nominated two deputies to lay at the feet of Valentinian the customary offering of a gold victory, and to accompany this tribute of duty, rather than of gratitude, with their humble complaint that they were ruined by the enemy and betrayed by their governor. If the severity of Valtilian had been rightly directed, it would have fallen on the guilty head of Romanus. But the Count, long exercised in the art of corruption, had dispatched a swift and trusty messenger to secure the venial friendship of Romigius, master of the offices. The wisdom of the imperial council was deceived by artifice, and the honest indignation was cooled by delay. At length, when the repetition of complaint had been justified by the repetition of public misfortunes, the notary Palladius was sent from the court of Trevis to examine the state of Africa and the conduct of Romanus. The rigid impartiality of Palladius was easily disarmed. He was tempted to reserve for himself a part of the public treasure, which he brought with him for the payment of the troops, and from the moment that he was conscious of his own guilt, he could no longer refuse to attest the innocence and merit of the Count. The charge of the Tripoleans was declared to be false and frivolous, and Palladius himself was sent back from Trevis to Africa with a special commission to discover and prosecute the authors of this imperious conspiracy against the representatives of the sovereign. His inquiries were managed with so much dexterity and success that he compelled the citizens of Leptis, who had sustained a recent siege of eight days, to contradict the truth of their own decrees and to censor the behavior of their own deputies. A bloody sentence was pronounced, without hesitation, by the rash and headstrong cruelty of Valentinian. The president of Tripoli, who had presumed to pity the distress of the province, was publicly executed at Utica. Four distinguished citizens were put to death, as the accomplices of the imaginary fraud, and the tongues of two others were cut out, by the express order of the emperor. Romanus, elated by impunity, and irritated by resistance, was still continued in the military command, till the Africans were provoked by his avarice to join the rebellious standard of Firmus the Moor. His father, Nabal, was one of the richest and most powerful of the Moorish princes who acknowledged the supremacy of Rome. But as he left, either by his wives or concubines, a very numerous posterity, the wealthy inheritance was eagerly disputed, and Zama, one of his sons, was slain in a domestic quarrel by his brother Firmus. The implacable zeal with which Romanus prosecuted the legal revenge of this murder could be ascribed only to a motive of avarice, or personal hatred. But, on this occasion, his claims were just. The influence was weighty, and Firmus clearly understood that he must either present his neck to the executioner, or appeal from the sentence of the imperial consistory to his sword and to the people. He was received as the deliverer of his country, and, as soon as it appeared that Romanus was formidable only to a submissive province, the tyrant of Africa became the object of universal contempt. The ruin of Caesarea, which was plundered and burnt by the licentious barbarians, convinced the refractory cities of the danger of resistance. The power of Firmus was established, at least in the provinces of Mauritania and Numidia and it seemed to be his only doubt whether he should assume the diadem of a Moorish king or the purple of a Roman emperor. But the imprudent and unhappy Africans soon discovered that, in this rash insurrection, they had not sufficiently consulted their own strength or the abilities of their leader, before he could procure any certain intelligence, that the emperor of the West had fixed the choice of a general, or that a fleet of transports was collected at the mouth of the Rhone, he was suddenly informed, that the great Theodosius, with a small band of veterans, had landed near Igilagus, or Giggory, on the African coast, and the timid usurper sunk under the ascent of virtue and military genius. Though Firmus possessed arms and treasures, his despair of victory immediately reduced him 
to the use of those arts which, in the same country, and in a similar situation, had formerly been practiced by the crafty Jurgurtha. He attempted to deceive, by an apparent submission, the vigilance of the Roman general, to seduce the fidelity of his troops, and to protract the duration of the war, by successively engaging the independent tribes of Africa to espouse his quarrel or to protect his flight. Theodosius imitated the example and obtained the success of his predecessor, Metellius, when Firmus, in the character of a supplicant, accused his own rashness and humbly solicited the clemency of the emperor, the lieutenant of Valentinian received and dismissed him with a friendly embrace, but he diligently required the useful and substantial pledges of a sincere repentance, nor could he be persuaded by the assurances of peace to suspend for an instant the operations of an active war. A dark conspiracy was detected by the penetration of Theodosius, and he satisfied without much reluctance the public indignation which he secretly excited. Several of the guilty accomplices of Firmus were abandoned. According to ancient custom, the tumult of a military execution, many more, by the amputation of both their hands, continued to exhibit an instructive spectacle of horror. The hatred of the rebels was accompanied with fear, and the fear of the Roman soldiers was mingled with respectful admiration. Amidst the boundless plains of Gertulia and the innumerable valleys of Mount Atlas, it was impossible to prevent the escape of Firmus, and if the usurper could have tried the patience of his antagonists, he would have secured his person in the depth of some remote solitude, and expected the hopes of a future revolution. He was subdued by the perseverance of Theodosius, who had formed an inflexible determination that the war should end only by the death of the tyrant, and that every nation of Africa, which presumed to support his cause, should be involved in his ruin. At the head of a small body of troops, which seldom exceeded 3,500 men, the Roman general advanced, with a steady prudence, devoid of rashness or of fear, into the heart of a country where he was sometimes attacked by armies of twenty thousand Moors. The boldness of his charge dismayed the irregular barbarians. They were disconcerted by his seasonable and orderly retreats. They were continually baffled by the unknown resources of the military art, and they felt and confessed the just superiority which was assumed by the leader of a civilized nation. When Theodosius entered the exclusive domain of Igmazian, king of the Isaphelesis, the haughty savage required, in words of defiance, his name and the object of his expedition. I am, replied the stern and disdainful count, I am the general of Valentinian, the lord of the world, who has sent me hither to pursue and punish a desperate robber. Deliver him instantly into my hands, and be assured that if thou dost not obey the commands of my invincible sovereign, Thou and the people over whom thou reignest shall be utterly extirpated. As soon as Igmazian was satisfied that his enemy had strength and resolution to execute the fatal menace, he consented to purchase a necessary peace by the sacrifice of a guilty fugitive. The guards that were placed to secure the person of Firmus deprived him of the hopes of escape and the Moorish tyrant, after wine had extinguished the sense of danger, disappointed the insulting triumph of the Romans by strangling himself in the night. His dead body, the only present which Igmazian could offer to the conqueror, was carelessly thrown upon a camel, and Theodosius, leading back his victorious troops to Sitifi, was saluted by the warmest acclamations of joy and loyalty. Africa had been lost by the vices of Romanus. It was restored by the virtues of Theodosius. And our curiosity may be usefully directed to the inquiry of the respective treatment which the two generals received from the imperial court. The authority of Count Romanus had been suspended by the master general of the cavalry, and he was committed to safe and honorable custody till the end of the war. 
his crimes were proved by the most authentic evidence, and the public expected with some impatience the decree of severe justice. But the partial and powerful favor of Melibotus encouraged him to challenge his legal judges, to obtain repeated delays for the purpose of procuring a crowd of friendly witnesses, and, finally, to cover his guilty conduct by the additional guilt of fraud and forgery. About the same time, the restorer of Britain and Africa, on a vague suspicion that his name and services were superior to the rank of a subject, was ignominiously beheaded at Carthage. Valentinian no longer reigned, and the death of Theodosius, as well as the impunity of Romanus, may justly be imputed to the arts of the ministers who abused the confidence and deceived the inexperienced youth of his sons. If the geographical accuracy of Amineus had been fortunately bestowed on the British exploits of Theodosius, we should have traced, with eager curiosity, the distinct and domestic footprints of his march. But the tedious enumeration of the unknown and uninteresting tribes of Africa may be reduced to the general remark, that they were all of the swarthy race of the Moors, that they inhabited the back settlements of the Mauritanian and Numidian province the country, as they have since been termed by the Arabs, of dates and of locusts, and that, as the Roman power declined in Africa, the boundary of civilized manners and cultivated land was insensibly contracted. Beyond the utmost limits of the Moors, the vast and inhospitable desert of the south extends above a thousand miles to the banks of the Niger. The ancients, who had a very faint and imperfect knowledge of the great peninsula of Africa, were sometimes tempted to believe that the torrid zone must ever remain destitute of inhabitants, and they sometimes amused their fancy by filling the vacant space with headless men, or rather monsters, with horned and cloven-footed satyrs, with fabulous centaurs, and with human pygmies, who waged a bold and doubtful warfare against the cranes. Carthage would have trembled at the strange intelligence that the countries on either side of the equator were filled with innumerable nations, who differed only in their color from the ordinary appearance of the human species, and the subjects of the Roman Empire might have anxiously expected that the swarms of barbarians which issued from the north would soon be encountered from the south by new swarms of barbarians, equally fierce and equally formidable. These gloomy terrors would indeed have been dispelled by a more intimate acquaintance with the character of their African enemies. The inaction of the Negroes does not seem to be the effect either of their virtue or of their pusillanimity. They indulged, like the rest of mankind, their passions and appetites, and the adjacent tribes were engaged in frequent acts of hostility. But their rude ignorance has never invented any effectual weapons of defense, or of destruction, they appear incapable of forming any extensive plans of government or conquest, and the obvious inferiority of their mental facilities has been discovered and abused by the nations of the temperate zone. Sixty thousand blacks are annually embarked from the coast of Guinea, never to return to their native country, but they are embarked in chains, and this constant emigration, which, in the space of two centuries, might have furnished armies to overrun the globe, accuses the guilt of Europe and the weakness of Africa. End of Part 5Dot org. Chapter 25. Reigns of Jovian and Valentinian. Division of the Empire. Part 6. 4. The ignominious treaty which saved the army of Jovian had been faithfully executed on the side of the Romans, and as they had solemnly renounced the sovereignty and alliance of Armenia and Iberia, those tributary kingdoms were exposed without protection to the arms of the Persian monarch, Sapor entered the Armenian territories at the head of a formidable host of cursiers, of archers, and of mercenary foot, 
but it was the invariable practice of Saper to mix war with negotiation, and to consider falsehood and perjury as the most powerful instruments of regal policy. He affected to praise the prudent and moderate conduct of the king of Armenia, and the unsuspicious Tyrannus was persuaded, by the repeated assurances of insidious friendship, to deliver his person to the hands of a faithless and cruel enemy. In the midst of a splendid entertainment he was bound in chains of silver, as an honor due to the blood of Arsacides, and, after a short confinement in the Tower of Oblivion at Ecbatana, he was released from the miseries of life, either by his own dagger or by that of an assassin. The kingdom of Armenia was reduced to the state of a Persian province. The administration was shared between a distinguished satrap and a favorite eunuch, and Sapor marched without delay to subdue the martial spirit of the Iberians. Sauromaces, who reigned in that country by the permission of the emperors, was expelled by a superior force, and, as an insult to the majesty of Rome, the king of kings placed a diadem on the head of his abject vassal, Aspacurus. The city of Atagarasa was the only place of Armenia which presumed to resist the efforts of his arms. The treasure deposited in that strong fortress tempted the avarice of Sapor, but the danger of Olympias, the wife or widow of the Armenian king, excited the public compassion and animated the desperate valor of her subjects and soldiers. The Persians were surprised and repulsed under the walls of Atogarasa by a bold and well-concerted sally of the besieged. But the forces of Sapper were continually renewed and increased. The hopeless courage of the garrison was exhausted, the strength of the walls yielded to the assault, and the proud conqueror, after wasting the rebellious city with fire and sword, led away captive an unfortunate queen, who, in a more auspicious hour, had been the destined bride of the son of Constantine. Yet if Sapper already triumphed in the easy conquest of two dependent kingdoms, he soon felt that a country is unsubdued as long as the minds of the people are actuated by a hostile, cotumacious spirit. The satraps, whom he was obliged to trust, embraced the first opportunity of regaining the affection of their countrymen, and of signalizing their immortal hatred to the Persian name. Since the conversion of the Armenians and Iberians, those nations considered the Christians as the favorites, and the magicians as the adversaries of the Supreme Being. The influence of the clergy over a superstitious people was uniformly exerted in the cause of Rome. And as long as the successors of Constantine disputed with those of Artaxerxes the sovereignty of the intermediate provinces, the religious connection always drew a decisive advantage into the scale of the empire. A numerous and active party acknowledged Para, the son of Tyrannus, as the lawful sovereign of Armenia, and his title to the throne was deeply rooted in the hereditary succession of five hundred years. By the unanimous consent of the Iberians, the country was equally divided between the rival princes, and Aspacrusus, who owned his diadem to the choice of Sapor, was obliged to declare that his regard for his children, who were detained as hostages by the tyrant, was the only consideration which prevented him from openly renouncing the alliance of Persia. The Emperor Valens, who respected the obligations of the treaty, and who was apprehensive of involving the East in a dangerous war, ventured, with slow and cautious measures, to support the Roman party in the kingdoms of Iberia and Armenia. Twelve legions established the authority of Sauromatius on the banks of the Cyrus. The Euphrates was protected by the valor of Arenthesis, a powerful army under the command of Count Trajan and of Vladimir, king of the Alemanni fixed their camp on the confines of Armenia. But they were strictly enjoined not to commit the first hostilities, which might be understood as a breach of the treaty. And such was the implicit obedience of the Roman general that they retreated with exemplary patience under a shower of Persian arrows until they had clearly acquired a just title to an honorable and legitimate victory. 
yet these appearances of war insensibly subsided in a vain and tedious negotiation. The contending parties supported their claims by mutual reproaches of perfidy and ambition, and it should seem that the original treaty was expressed in very obscure terms, since they were reduced to the necessity of making their inconclusive appeal to the partial testimony of the generals of the two nations who had assisted in the negotiations. The invasion of the Goths and Huns, which soon afterward shook the foundations of the Roman Empire, exposed the provinces of Asia to the arms of Separ. But the declining age, and perhaps the infirmities of the monarch, suggested new maxims of tranquility and moderation. His death, which happened in the full maturity of a reign of seventy years, changed in a moment the court and councils of Persia, and their attention was most probably engaged by domestic troubles, and the distant efforts of a Carmanian war. The remembrance of ancient injuries was lost in the enjoyment of peace. The kingdoms of Armenia and Iberia were permitted, by the mutual, though tacit, consent of both empires, to resume their doubtful neutrality. In the first years of the reign of Theodosius, a Persian embassy arrived at Constantinople to excuse the unjustifiable measures of the former reign, and to offer, as a tribute of friendship, or even of respect, a splendid present of gems, of silk, and of Indian elephants. In the general picture of affairs of the East, under the reign of Valens, the adventures of Para form one of the most striking and singular objects. The noble youth, by the persuasion of his mother Olympias, had escaped through the Persian host that besieged Artogorasa, and implored the protection of the Emperor of the East. By his timid counsels, Para was alternatively supported and recalled and restored and betrayed. The hopes of the Armenians were sometimes raised by the presence of their natural sovereign, and the ministers of Valens were satisfied that they preserved the integrity of the public faith, if their vassal was not suffered to assume the diadem and title of king. But they soon repented of their own rashness. They were confounded by the reproaches and threats of the Persian monarch. They found reason to distrust the cruel and inconsistent temper of Para himself, who sacrificed to the slightest suspicions the lives of his most faithful servants, and held a secret and disgraceful correspondence with the assassin of his father and the enemy of his country. Under the specious pretense of consulting with the emperor on the subject of their common interest, Para was persuaded to descend from the mountains of Armenia, where his party was in arms, and to trust his independence and safety to the discretion of a perdiferous court. The king of Armenia, for such he appeared in his own eyes and in those of his nation, was received with due honors by the governors of the provinces through which he passed. But when he arrived at Taurus in Cilicia, the progress was stopped under various pretenses. His motions were watched with respectful vigilance, and he gradually discovered that he was a prisoner in the hands of the Romans. Paras suppressed his indignation, dissembled his fears, and after secretly preparing his escape, mounted on horseback with three hundred of his faithful followers. The officer stationed at the door of his apartment immediately communicated his flight to the counselor of Cilicia, who overtook him in the suburbs and endeavored without success to dissuade him from prosecuting his rash and dangerous design. A legion was ordered to pursue the royal fugitive, but the pursuit of infantry could not be very alarming to a body of light cavalry, and upon the first cloud of arrows that was discharged into the air, they retreated with precipitation to the gates of Taurus. After an incessant march of two days and two nights, Para and his Armenians reached the banks of the Euphrates, but the passage of the river, which they were obliged to swim, was attended with some delay and some loss. The country was alarmed, and the two roads, which were only separated by an interval of three miles, had been occupied by three thousand archers on horseback, under the command of a count and a tribune. Para must have yielded to superior force, if the accidental arrival of a friendly traveler had not revealed the danger and the means of escape. A dark and almost impervious path 
securely conveyed the Armenian troop through the thicket, and Para had left behind him the Count and the Tribune, while they patiently expected his approach along the public highways. They returned to the imperial court to excuse their want of diligence or success, and seriously alleged that the king of Armenia, who was a skillful magician, had transformed himself and his followers, and passed before their eyes under a borrowed shape. After his return to his native kingdom, Para still continued to profess himself the friend and ally of the Romans, but the Romans had injured him too deeply ever to forgive, and the secret sentence of his death was signed in the Council of Valens. The execution of the bloody deed was committed to the subtle prudence of Count Trajan, and he had the merit of insinuating himself into the confidence of the credulous prince, that he might find an opportunity of stabbing him to the heart Para was invited to a Roman banquet, which had been prepared with the prompt and sensibility of the East. The hall resounded with cheerful music. The company was already heated with wine, when the Count retired for an instant, drew his sword, and gave the signal of the murder. A robust and desperate barbarian instantly rushed on the King of Armenia, and though he bravely defended his life with the first weapon that chance offered to his hand, the table of the imperial general was stained with the royal blood of a guest and an ally. Such were the weak and wicked maxims of the Roman administration, that to attain a doubtful object of political interest, the laws of nations, and the sacred rights of hospitality, were inhumanely violated in the face of the world. 5. During a peaceful interval of thirty years, the Romans secured their frontiers, and the Goths extended their dominions. The victories of the great Hermanric, king of the Ostagoths, and the most noble of the races of the Amale, have been compared by the enthusiasm of his countrymen to the exploits of Alexander, with this singular and almost incredible difference that the martial spirits of the Gothic hero, instead of being supported by the vigor of youth, was displayed with glory and success in the extreme period of human life, between the age of fourscore and one hundred and ten years. The independent tribes were persuaded or compelled to acknowledge the king of the Ostagoths as the sovereign of the Gothic nation. The chiefs of the Visigoths, or Thervingi, renounced the royal title and assumed the more humble appellation of judges, and among those judges, Athanaric, Fricigrin, and Alavesis were the most illustrious, by their personal merit, as well as by their vicinity to the Roman provinces. These domestic conquests, which increased the military power of Hermanric, enlarged his ambitious designs. He invaded the adjacent countries of the north, and twelve considerable nations, whose names and limits cannot be accurately defined, successively yielded to the superiority of the Gothic arms. The Heruli, who inhabited the marshy lands near the lake Maeatus, were renowned for their strength and agility, and the assistance of their light infantry was eagerly solicited and highly esteemed in the wars of the barbarians. But the active spirit of the Heruli was subdued by the slow and steady perseverance of the Goths, and after a bloody action in which the king was slain, the remains of that warlike tribe became a useful accession to the camp of Hermanric. He then marched against the Veneti, unskilled in the use of arms, and formidable only by their numbers, which filled the wide extent of the plains of modern Poland. The victorious Goths, who were not inferior in numbers, prevailed in the contest by the decisive advantages of exercise and discipline. After the submission of the Veneti, the conqueror advanced, without resistance, as far as the confines of Sde, an ancient people whose name is still preserved in the province of Estonia. Those distant inhabitants of the Baltic coast were supported by the labors of agriculture, enriched by the trade of amber, and consecrated by the peculiar worship of the mother of the gods. But the scarcity of iron obliged the Estenian warriors to content themselves with wooden clubs, and the reduction of that wealthy country is ascribed to the prudence, rather than to the arms, of Hermanric. His dominions, which extended from the Danube to the Baltic, included the native seats and the recent acquisitions of the Goths, and he reigned over the greatest part of Germany and Scythia with the authority of a conqueror, and sometimes with the cruelty of a tyrant. 
but he reigned over a part of the globe incapable of perpetuating and adoring the glory of its heroes. The name Hermanric is almost buried in oblivion. His exploits are imperfectly known, and the Romans themselves appeared unconscious of the progress of an aspiring power which threatened the liberty of the north and the peace of the empire. The Goths had contracted an hereditary attachment for the imperial house of Constantine, of whose power and liberality they had received so many signal proofs. They respected the public peace, and if a hostile band sometimes presumed to pass the Roman limit, their irregular conduct was candidly ascribed to the ungovernable spirit of the barbarian youth. The contempt for two new and obscure princes, who had been raised to the throne by a popular election, inspired the Goths with bolder hopes, and, while they agitated some design of marching their confederate forces under the national standard, they were easily tempted to embrace the party of Procopius, and to foment, by their dangerous aid, the civil discord of the Romans. The public treaty might stipulate no more than ten thousand auxiliaries, but the design was so zealously adopted by the chiefs of the Visigoth that the army which passed the Danube amounted to a number of thirty thousand men. They marched with the proud confidence that their invincible valor would decide the fate of the Roman Empire, and the provinces of Thrace groaned under the weight of the barbarians, who displayed the insolence of masters and the licentiousness of enemies. But the intemperance which gratified their appetites retarded their progress, and before the Goths could receive any certain intelligence of the defeat and death of Procopius, they perceived, by the hostile state of the country, that the civil and military powers were resumed by his successful rival. A chain of posts and fortifications, skillfully deposed by Valens, or the generals of Valens, resisted their march, prevented their retreat, and intercepted their subsistence. The fierceness of the barbarians was tamed and suspended by hunger. They diligently threw down their arms at the feet of the conqueror, who offered them food and chains. The numerous captives were distributed in all the cities of the east and the provincials, who were soon familiarized with their savage appearance, ventured, by degrees, to measure their own strength with these formidable adversaries, whose name had so long been the object of their terror. The king of Scythia and Hermanric alone could deserve so lofty a title, was grieved and exasperated by this national calamity. His ambassadors loudly complained at the court of Valens of the infraction of the ancient and solemn alliance, which had so long subsisted between the Romans and the Goths. They alleged that they had fulfilled the duty of allies by assisting the kinsman and successor of the Emperor Julian. They required the immediate restitution of the noble captives, and they urged a very singular claim that the Gothic generals, marching in arms and in hostile array, were entitled to the sacred character and privileges of ambassadors. The decent but preemptory refusal of these extravagant demands was signified to the barbarians by Victor, Master General of the Cavalry, who expressed with force and dignity the just complaints of the Emperor of the East. The negotiation was interrupted, and the manly exhortations of Valentinian encouraged his timid brother to vindicate the insulted majesty of the Empire. The splendor and magnitude of this Gothic war was celebrated by a contemporary historian, but the event scarcely deserved the attention of posterity, except as the preliminary steps of the approaching decline and fall of the empire. Instead of leading the nations of Germany and Scythia to the banks of the Danube, or even to the gates of Constantinople, the aged monarch of the Goths resigned to the brave Athanaric the danger and glory of a defensive war against an enemy who wielded with a feeble hand the powers of a mighty state. A bridge of boats was established upon the Danube, the presence of Valens animated his troops, and his ignorance of the art of war was compensated by personal bravery and a wise deference to the advice of Victor and Aranthius, his master general of the cavalry and infantry. The operations of the campaign were conducted by their skill and experience, but they found it impossible to drive the Visigoths from their strong posts in the mountains, 
and the devastation of the plains obliged the Romans themselves to repass the Danube on the approach of winter. The incessant rains which swelled the waters of the river produced a tacit suspension of arms and confined the Emperor Valens during the whole course of the ensuing summer to his camp of Marcianopolis. The third year of the war was more favorable to the Romans and more pernicious to the Goths. The interruption of trade deprived the barbarians of the objects of luxury, which they already confounded with the necessities of life, and the dissolution of a very extensive tract of country threatened them with the horrors of famine. Athanaric was provoked, or compelled, to risk a battle which he lost in the plains, and the pursuit was rendered more bloody by the cruel precaution of the victorious generals, who had promised a large reward for the head of every Goth that was brought into the imperial camp. The submission of the barbarians appeased the resentment of Valens and his council. The emperor listened with satisfaction to the flattering and eloquent remonstrance of the Senate of Constantinople, which assumed for the first time a share in the public deliberations, and the same generals, Victor and Arentheus, who had successfully directed the conduct of the war, were empowered to regulate the conditions of the peace. The freedom of trade, which the Goths had hitherto enjoyed, was restricted to two cities on the Danube. The rashness of their leaders was severely punished by the suspension of their pensions and subsidies, and the exception which was stipulated in the favor of Athanaric alone was more advantageous than honorable to the judge of the Visigoths. Athanaric, who on this occasion appears to have consulted his private interest without expecting the orders of his sovereign, supported his own dignity and that of his tribe in the personal interview which was proposed by the ministers of Valens. He persisted in his declaration that it was impossible for him without incurring the guilt of perjury, ever to set his foot on the territory of the empire. And it is more than probable that his regard for the sanctity of an oath was confirmed by the recent and fatal examples of Roman treachery. The Danube, which separated the dominions of the two independent nations, was chosen for the scene of the conference. The emperor of the east and the judge of the Visigoths, accompanied by an equal number of armed followers, advanced in their respective barges to the middle of the stream. After the ratification of the treaty and delivery of hostages, Valens returned in triumph to Constantinople, and the Goths remained in a state of tranquility about six years, till they were violently impelled against the Roman Empire by an innumerable host of Scythians who appeared to issue from the frozen regions of the north. The Emperor of the West who had resigned to his brother the command of the Lower Danube, reserved for his immediate care the defense of the Retian and Iranian provinces, which spread so many hundred miles along the greatest of the European rivers. The active policy of Valentinian was continually employed in adding new fortifications to the security of the frontier, but the abuse of this policy provoked the just resentment of the barbarians. The Quadi complained, that the ground for an intended fortress had been marked out on their territories, and their complaints were urged with so much reason and moderation that Equitius, master-general of Illyricum, consented to suspend the prosecution of the work till he should be more clearly informed of the will of his sovereign. This fair occasion of injuring a rival and of advancing the fortune of his son was eagerly embraced by the inhuman Maximinin the prefect, or rather tyrant, of Gaul. The passions of Valentinian were impatient of control, and he credulously listened to the assurances of his favorite that if the government of Valeria and the direction of the work were entrusted to the zeal of his son, Marcellanius, the emperor would no longer be importuned with the audacious remonstrances of the barbarians, the subjects of Rome, and the natives of Germany, were insulted by the arrogance of a young and worthless minister, who considered his rapid elevation as proof and reward of his superior merit. He affected, however, to receive the modest application of Gabinius, king of the Quadi, with some attention and regard. But this artful civility concealed a dark and brooding design, and the credulous prince was persuaded to accept the pressing invitation of Marcellinus, I am at a loss how to vary the narrative of similar crimes, or how to relate that, in the course of the same year, but in remote parts of the empire, 
the inhospitable table of two imperial generals was stained with the royal blood of two guests and allies inhumanly murdered by their order and in their presence the fate of gabinius and of para was the same but the cruel death of their sovereign was resented in a very different manner by the servile temper of the armenians and the free and daring spirit of the germans the quadi were much declined from that formidable power which in the time of marcus antonius had spread terror to the gates of rome but they still possessed arms and courage their courage was animated by despair and they obtained the usual reinforcement of the cavalry of their Sumatrian allies, so improvident was the assassin Marcellinus, that he chose the moment when the bravest veterans had been drawn away to suppress the revolt of Firmus, and the whole province was exposed, with a very feeble defense, to the rage of the exasperated barbarians. They invaded Pannonia in the season of harvest, unmercifully destroying every object of plunder which they could not easily transport, and either disregarded or demolished the empty fortifications. The Princess Constantia, the daughter of the Emperor Constantius, and the granddaughter of the great Constantine, very narrowly escaped. That royal maid, who had innocently supported the revolt of Procopius, was now the destined wife of the heir of the Western Empire. She traversed the peaceful province with a splendid and unarmed train. Her person was saved from danger and the republic from disgrace by the active zeal of Messala, the governor of the provinces. As soon as he was informed that the village where she stopped only to dine was almost encompassed by the barbarians, he hastily placed her in his own chariot and drove full speed till he reached the gates of Sermenium which were at the distance of six and twenty miles. Even Sermenium might not have been secure if the Quadi and Sametians had diligently advanced during the general consternation of the magistrates and people. Their delay allowed Probus, the Praetorian prefect, sufficient time to recover his own spirits and to revive the courage of the citizens. He skillfully directed their strenuous efforts to repair and strengthen the decayed fortifications, and procured the seasonable and effectual assistance of a company of archers to protect the capital of the Aurelian provinces. Disappointed in their attempts against the walls of Sermenium, the indignant barbarians turned their arms against the master general of the frontier, to whom they unjustly attributed the murder of their king. Acutius could bring into the field no more than two legions, but they contained the veteran strengths of the Massaean and Pannonian bands. The obstinacy with which they disputed the vain honors of rank and precedency was the cause of their destruction, and while they acted with separate forces and divided councils, they were surprised and slaughtered by the active vigor of the Sametian horse. The success of this invasion provoked the emulation of the bordering tribes, and the province of Messia would infallibly have been lost if young Theodosius, the duke or military commander of the frontier, had not signalized in the defeat of the public enemy an intrepid genius, worthy of his illustrious father, and of his future greatness. End of Part 6《ค and Fall of the Roman Empire》Chapter 25 Part 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 25 Reigns of Jovian and Valentinian Division of the Empire Part 7 The mind of Valentinian, who then resided at Trevor's, was deeply affected by the calamities of Illyricum, but the lateness of the season suspended the execution of his designs till the ensuing spring. He marched in person with a considerable part of the forces of Gaul from the banks of the Moselle and to the suppliant ambassadors of the Sarmatians who met him on the way, he returned a doubtful answer that, as soon as he reached the scene of action, he should examine and pronounce. When he arrived at Sirmium, he gave audience to the deputies of the Illyrian provinces, 
who loudly congratulated their own felicity under the auspicious government of Probus, his praetorian prefect. Valentinian, who was flattered by these demonstrations of their loyalty and gratitude, imprudently asked the deputy of Epirus, a cynic philosopher of intrepid sincerity, whether he was freely sent by the wishes of the province. Quote, with tears and groans am I sent, end quote, replied Epicles, quote, by a reluctant people, end quote. The emperor paused, but the impunity of his ministers established the pernicious maxim that they might oppress his subjects without injuring his service. A strict inquiry into their conduct would have revealed the public discontent. The severe condemnation of the murder of Gabinetus was the only measure which could restore the confidence of the Germans and vindicate the honor of the Roman name. But the haughty monarch was incapable of the magnanimity which dares to acknowledge a fault. He forgot the provocation, remembered only the injury, and advanced into the country of the Quadi with an insatiate thirst of blood and revenge. The extreme devastation and promiscuous massacre of a savage war were justified, in the eyes of the emperor, and perhaps in those of the world, by the cruel equity of retaliation. And such was the discipline of the Romans, and the consternation of the enemy, that Valentinian repassed the Danube without the loss of a single man, and as he resolved to complete the destruction of the Quadi by a second campaign, he fixed his winter quarters at Brigito, on the Danube, near the Hungarian city of Pressburg, while the operations of the war were suspended by the severity of the weather. The Quadi made a humble attempt to depreciate the wrath of their conqueror, and at the earnest persuasion of Equitius, their ambassadors were introduced into the imperial council. They approached the throne with bended bodies and dejected countenances, and without daring to complain of the murder of their king, they affirmed, with solemn oaths, that the late invasion was the crime of some irregular robbers, which the public council of the nation condemned and abhorred. The answer of the emperor left them but little to hope from his clemency or compassion. He reviled in the most intemperate language their baseness, their ingratitude, their insolence. His eyes, his voice, his color, his gestures, expressed the violence of his ungoverned fury, and while his whole frame was agitated with convulsive passion, a large blood vessel suddenly burst in his body, and Valentinian fell speechless into the arms of his attendants. Their pious care immediately concealed his situation from the crowd, but in a few minutes the Emperor of the West expired in an agony of pain retaining his senses till the last, and struggling, without success, to declare his intentions to the generals and ministers who surrounded the royal couch. Valentinian was about fifty-four years of age, and he wanted only one hundred days to accomplish the twelve years of his reign. The polygamy of Valentinian is seriously attested by an ecclesiastical historian. The Empress Severa, I relate the fable, admitted into her family society the lovely Justina, the daughter of an Italian governor. Her admiration of those naked charms which she had often seen in the bath was expressed with such lavish and imprudent praise that the emperor was tempted to introduce a second wife into his bed, and his public edict extended to all the subjects of the empire the same domestic privilege which he had assumed for himself. But we may be assured, from the evidence of reason as well as history, that the two marriages of Valentinian, with Severa and with Justina, were successively contracted, and that he used the ancient permission of divorce, which was still allowed by the laws, though it was condemned by the church. Severina was the mother of Gratian, who seemed to unite every claim which could entitle him to the undoubted succession of the Western Empire. He was the eldest son of a monarch whose glorious reign had confirmed the free and honorable choice of his fellow soldiers. Before he had attained the ninth year of his age, the royal youth received from the hands of his indulgent father the purple robe and diadem with the title of Augustus. 
the election was solemnly ratified by the consent and applause of the armies of Gaul, and the name Gratian was added to the names of Valentinian and Valens in all the legal transactions of the Roman government. By his marriage with the granddaughter of Constantine, the son of Valentinian acquired all the hereditary rights of the Flavian family, which, in a series of three imperial generations, were sanctified by time, religion, and the reverence of the people. At the death of his father, the royal youth was in the seventeenth year of his age, and his virtues already justified the favorable opinion of the army and the people. But Gratian resided, without apprehension, in the palace of Trevors, whilst, at the distance of many hundred miles, Valentinian suddenly expired in the camp of Brigitto. The passions, which had been so long suppressed by the presence of a master, immediately revived in the imperial council, and the ambitious design of reigning in the name of an infant was artfully executed by Melobahes and Equitus, who commanded the attachment of the Illyrian and Italian bands. They contrived the most honorable pretenses to remove the popular leaders and the troops of Gaul who might have asserted the claims of the lawful successor, they suggested the necessity of extinguishing the hopes of foreign and domestic enemies by a bold and decisive measure. The Empress Justina, who had been left in a palace about one hundred miles from Brigitto, was respectfully invited to appear in the camp with the son of the deceased emperor. On the sixth day after the death of Valentinian, the infant prince of the same name, who was only four years old, was shown in the arms of his mother to the legions, and solemnly invested by military acclamation with the titles and ensigns of supreme power. The impending dangers of a civil war were seasonably prevented by the wise and moderate conduct of the emperor Gratian. He cheerfully accepted the choice of the army, declared that he should always consider the son of Justin as a brother, not as a rival, and advised the empress with her son Valentinian to fix their residence at Milan, in the fair and peaceful province of Italy, while he assumed the more arduous command of the countries beyond the Alps. Gratian disassembled his resentment till he could safely punish or disgrace the authors of the conspiracy and though he uniformly behaved with tenderness and regard to his infant colleague, he gradually confounded, in the administration of the Western Empire, the office of a guardian with the authority of a sovereign. The government of the Roman world was exercised in the united names of Valens and his two nephews, but the feeble emperor of the East, who succeeded to the rank of his elder brother, never obtained any weight or influence in the councils of the West. End of Part 7 End of Chapter 25 Chapter 26, Part 1 Of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Lizzie Driver Chapter 26 Progress of the Huns Part 1 Manners of the Pastoral Nations Progress of the Huns from China to Europe Flight of the Goths They pass the Danube Gothic War Defeat and Death of Valens Gratian invests Theodosius with the Eastern Empire His Character and Success Peace and Settlement of the Goths In the second year of the reign of Valentinian and Valens on the morning of the twenty-first day of July, the greatest part of the Roman world was shaken by a violent and destructive earthquake. The impression was communicated to the waters. The shores of the Mediterranean were left dry by the sudden retreat of the sea. Great quantities of fish were caught with the hand. Large vessels were stranded on the mud. And a curious spectator amused his eye, or rather his fancy, by contemplating the various appearance of valleys and mountains, which had never, since the formation of the globe, been exposed to the sun. But the tide soon returned, with the weight of an immense and irresistible deluge, which was severely felt on the coasts of Sicily, of Dalmatia, 
of Greece, and of Egypt. Large boats were transported and lodged on the roofs of houses, or at a distance of two miles from the shore. The people, with the habitations, were swept away by the waters, and the city of Alexandria annually commemorated the fatal day on which fifty thousand persons had lost their lives in the inundation. This calamity, the report of which was magnified from one province to another, astonished and terrified the subjects of Rome, and their affrighted imagination enlarged the real extent of the momentary evil. They recollected the preceding earthquakes, which had subverted the cities of Palestine and Bithynia. They considered these alarming strokes as the prelude only of still more dreadful calamities, and their fearful vanity was disposed to confound the symptoms of a declining empire and a sinking world. It was the fashion of the times to attribute every remarkable event to the particular will of the deity. The alterations of nature were connected by an invisible chain, with the moral and metaphysical opinions of the human mind, and the most sagacious divines could distinguish, according to the colour of their respective prejudices, that the establishment of hearsay tended to produce an earthquake, or that a deluge was the inevitable consequence of the progress of sin and error. Without presuming to discuss the truth or property of these lofty speculations, the historian may content himself with an observation, which seems to be justified by experience, that man has much more to fear from the passions of his fellow creatures than from the convulsions of the elements. The mischievous effects of an earthquake, or deluge, or hurricane, or the eruption of a volcano, bear a very inconsiderable portion to the ordinary calamities of war. As they are now moderated, by the prudence or humanity of the princes of Europe, who amuse their own leisure, and exercise the courage of their subjects, in the practice of the military art. But the laws and manners of modern nations, protect the safety and freedom of the vanquished soldier, and the peaceful citizen has seldom reason to complain, that his life, or even his fortune, is exposed to the rage of war. In the disastrous period of the fall of the Roman Empire, which may justly be dated from the reign of Valens, the happiness and security of each individual were personally attacked, and the arts and labours of ages were rudely defaced by the barbarians of Scythia and Germany. The invasion of the Huns precipitated on the provinces of the west of the Gothic nation, which advanced in less than forty years, from the Danube to the Atlantic, and opened a way, by the success of their arms, to the inroads of so many hostile tribes, more savage than themselves. The original principle of motion was concealed in the remote countries of the north, and the curious observation of the pastoral life of the Scythians, or Tartars, will illustrate the latent cause of these destructive emigrations. The different characters that mark the civilized nations of the globe may be ascribed to the use and the abuse of reason, which so variously shapes and so artificially composes the manners and opinions of a European or a Chinese. But the operation of instinct is more sure and simple than that of reason. It is much easier to ascertain the appetites of a quadruped than the speculations of a philosopher, and the savage tribes of mankind, as they approach nearer to the condition of animals, preserve a stronger resemblance to themselves and to each other. The uniform stability of their manners is the natural consequence of the imperfection of their facilities. Reduced to a similar situation, their wants, their desires, their enjoyments, still continue the same and to the influence of food or climate, which, in a more improved state of society, is suspended or subdued by so many moral causes, most powerfully contributes to form and to maintain the national character of barbarians. In every age the immense plains of Scythia or Tartary, 
have been inhabited by vagrant tribes of hunters and shepherds, whose indolence refuses to cultivate the earth, and whose restless spirit disdains the confinement of a sedentary life. In every age the Scythians and Tartars have been renowned for their invincible courage and rapid conquests. The thrones of Asia have been repeatedly overturned by the shepherds of the north, and their arms have spread terror and devastation over the most fertile and warlike countries of Europe. On this occasion, as well as on many others, the sober historian is forcibly awakened from a pleasing vision, and is compelled with some reluctance to confess that the pastoral manners, which have been adorned with the fairest attributes of peace and innocence, are much better adapted to the fierce and cruel habits of a military life. To illustrate this observation, I shall now proceed to consider a nation of shepherds and of warriors, in the three important articles of, one, their diet, two, their habitations, and three, their exercises. The narratives of antiquity are justified by the experience of modern times, and the banks of the Borysthianis, of the Volga, or of the Selengar, will indifferently present the same uniform spectacle of similar and native manners. 1. The corn, or even the rice, which constitutes the ordinary and wholesome food of a civilised people, can be obtained only by the patient toil of the husbandman. Some of the happy savages who dwell between the tropics are plentifully nourished by the liberality of nature. But in the climates of the north, a nation of shepherds is reduced to their flocks and herds. The skilful practitioners of the medical art will determine, if they are able to determine, how far the temper of the human mind may be affected by the use of animal or of vegetable food, and whether the common association of carnivorous and cruel deserves to be considered in any other light than that of an innocent, perhaps salutary, prejudice of humanity. Yet, if it be true that the sentiment of compassion is imperceptibly weakened by the sight and practice of domestic cruelty, we may observe that the horrid objects which are disguised by the arts of European refinement are exhibited in their naked and most disgusting simplicity in the tent of a Tartarian shepherd. The ox or the sheep are slaughtered by the same hand from which they were accustomed to receive their daily food, and the bleeding limbs are served with very little preparation on the table of their unfeeling murderer. In the military profession, and especially in the conduct of a numerous army, the exclusive use of animal food appears to be productive of the most solid advantages. Corn is a bulky and perishable commodity, and the larger magazines, which are indispensably necessary for the substance of our troops, must be slowly transported by the labour of man or horses. But the flocks and herds which accompany the march of the Tartars afford a sure and increasing supply of flesh and milk. In the far greater part of the uncultivated waste, the vegetation of the grass is quick and luxuriant, and there are few places so extremely barren that the hardy cattle of the north cannot find some tolerable pasture. The supply is multiplied and prolonged by the undistinguishing appetite and patient abstinence of the Tartars. They indifferently feed on the flesh of those animals that have been killed for the table or have died of disease. Horse flesh, which in every age and country has been prescribed by the civilized nations of Europe and Asia, they devour with peculiar greediness. And this singular taste facilitates the success of their military operations. The active cavalry of Scythia is always followed, in their most distant and rapid incursions, by an adequate number of spare horses, who may be occasionally used, either to redouble the speed, or to satisfy the hunger of the barbarians. Many are the resources of courage and poverty, when the forage round a camp of Tartars is almost consumed, they slaughter the greatest part of their cattle and preserve the flesh, 
either smoked or dried in the sun. On the sudden emergency of a hasty march, they provide themselves with a sufficient quantity of little balls of cheese, or rather of hard curd, which they occasionally dissolve in water. And this unsubstantial diet will support, for many days, the life and even the spirits of the patient warrior. But this extraordinary abstinence, which the Stoic would approve, and the hermit might envy, is commonly succeeded by the most voracious indulgence of appetite. The wines of a happier climate are the most grateful present, or the most valuable commodity that can be offered to the Tartars. And the only example of their industry seems to consist in the art of extracting from mare's milk a fermented liquor, which possesses a very strong power of intoxication. Like the animals of prey, the savages, both of the old and new world, experience the alternate vicissitudes of famine and plenty, and their stomach is inured to sustain, without much inconvenience, the opposite extremes of hunger and of intemperance. 2. In the ages of rustic and martial simplicity, a people of soldiers and husbandmen are dispersed over the face of an extensive and cultivated country and some time must elapse before the warlike youth of Greece or Italy could be assembled under the same standard, either to defend their own confines, or to invade the territories of the adjacent tribes. The progress of manufacturers and commerce insensibly collects a large multitude within the walls of a city, but these citizens are no longer soldiers, and the arts which adorn and improve the state of civil society corrupt the habits of the military life. The pastoral manners of the Scythians seem to unite the different advantages of simplicity and refinement. The individuals of the same tribe are constantly assembled, but they are assembled in a camp, and the native spirit of these dauntless shepherds is animated by mutual support and emulation. The houses of the Tartars are no more than small tents, of an oval form, which afford a cold and dirty habitation for the promiscuous youth of both sexes. The palaces of the rich consist of wooden huts, of such a size that they may be conveniently fixed on large wagons, and drawn by a team perhaps of twenty or thirty oxen. The flocks and herds, after grazing all day in the adjacent pastures, retire on the approach of night, within the protection of the camp. The necessity of preventing the most mischievous confusion, in such a perpetual concourse of men and animals, must gradually introduce, in the distribution, the order and the guard of the encampment, the rudiments of the military art. As soon as the forage of a certain district is consumed, the tribe, or rather army of shepherds, makes a regular march to some fresh pastures, and thus acquires, in the ordinary occupations of the pastoral life, the practical knowledge of one of the most important and difficult operations of war. The choice of stations is regulated by the difference of the seasons. In the summer the Tartars advance towards the north, and pitch their tents on the banks of a river or, at least, in the neighbourhood of a running stream. But, in the winter, they return to the south, and shelter their camp behind some convenient eminence, against the winds, which are chilled in their passage over the bleak and icy regions of Siberia. These manners are admirably adapted to diffuse, among the wandering tribes, the spirit of emigration and conquest. The connection between the people and their territory is of so frail a texture that it may be broken by the slightest accident. The camp, and not the soil, is the native country of the genuine Tartar. Within the precincts of that camp, his family, his companions, his property are always included, and, in the most distant marches, he is still surrounded by the objects which are dear or valuable or familiar in his eyes. 
The thirst of rapine, the fear, or the resentment of injury, the impatience of servitude, have, in every age, been sufficient causes to urge the tribes of Scythia boldly to advance into some unknown countries, where they might hope to find a more plentiful subsistence or a less formidable enemy. The revolutions of the north have frequently determined the fate of the south, and in the conflict of hostile nations, the victor and the vanquished have alternatively drove and been driven from the confines of China to those of Germany. These great immigrations, which have been sometimes executed with almost incredible diligence, were rendered more easy by the peculiar nature of the climate. It is well known that the cold of Tartary is much more severe than in the midst of the temperate zone might reasonably be expected. This uncommon rigour is attributed to the height of the plains, which rise, especially towards the east, more than half a mile above the level of the sea, and to the quantity of saltpetre with which the soil is deeply impregnated. In the winter season, the broad and rapid rivers that discharge their waters into the Euxine, the Caspian, or the Icy Sea, are strongly frozen. The fields are covered with a bed of snow, and the fugitive or victorious tribes may securely traverse, with their families, their wagons and their cattle, the smooth and hard surface of an immense plain. 3. The pastoral life, compared with the labours of agriculture and manufacturers, is undoubtedly a life of idleness. And as the most honourable shepherds of the Tartar race devolve on their captives the domestic management of the cattle, their own leisure is seldom disturbed by any servile and assiduous cares. But this leisure, instead of being devoted to the soft enjoyments of love and harmony, is used fully spent in the violent and sanguinary exercise of the chase. The plains of Tartary are filled with a strong and serviceable breed of horses, which are easily trained for the purposes of war and hunting. The Scythians of every age have been celebrated as bold and skilful riders, and constant practice had seated them so firmly on horseback that they were supposed by strangers to perform the ordinary duties of civil life, to eat, to drink, and even to sleep, without dismounting from their steeds. They excel in the dexterous management of the lance, the long tartar bow is drawn with a nervous arm, and the weighty arrow is directed to its object with unerring aim and irresistible force. These arrows are often pointed against the harmless animals of the desert, which increase and multiply in the absence of their most formidable enemy, the hare, the goat, the roebuck, the fallow deer, the stag, the elk, and the antelope. The vigour and patience both of the men and horses, are continually exercised by the fatigues of the chase, and the plentiful supply of game contributes to the subsistence and even luxury of a Tartar camp. But the exploits of the hunters of Scythia are not confined to the destruction of timid or innoxious beasts. They boldly encounter the angry wild boar when he turns against his pursuers, excite the sluggish courage of the bear, and provoke the fury of the tiger as he slumbers in the thicket. Where there is danger there may be glory, and the mode of hunting, which opens the fairest field to the exhortations of valour, may justly be considered as the image and as the school of war. The general hunting matches, the pride and delight of the Tartar princes, compose an instructive exercise for their numerous cavalry. A circle is drawn, of many miles in circumference, to encompass the game of an extensive district, and the troops that form the circle regularly advance towards a common centre, where the captive animals, surrounded on every side, are abandoned to the darts of the hunters. In this march, which frequently continues many days, the cavalry are obliged to climb the hills, to swim the rivers, and to wind through the valleys, 
without interrupting the prescribed order of their gradual progress. They acquire the habit of directing their eye and their steps to a remote object, of preserving their intervals of suspending or accelerating their pace, according to the motions of the troops on their right and left, and of watching and repeating the signals of their leaders. Their leaders study, in this practical school, the most important lesson of the military art, the prompt and accurate judgment of ground, of distance, and of time, to employ, against a human enemy, the same patience and valour, the same skill and discipline, is the only alteration which is required in real war, and the amusements of the chase serve as a prelude to the conquest of an empire. The political society of the ancient Germans has the appearance of a voluntary alliance of independent warriors. The tribes of Scythia, distinguished by the modern appellation of hordes, assume the form of a numerous and increasing family, which, in the course of successive generations, has been propagated from the same original stock. The meanest and most ignorant of the Tartars preserve with conscious pride the inestimable treasure of their genealogy, and whatever distinctions of rank may have been introduced by the unequal distribution of pastoral wealth, they mutually respect themselves and each other as the descendants of the first founder of the tribe. The custom, which still prevails, of adopting the bravest and most faithful of the captives, may countenance the very probable suspicion that this extensive consanguinity is, in a great measure, legal and fictitious. But the useful prejudice, which has obtained the sanction of time and opinion, produces the effect of truth. The haughty barbarians yield a cheerful and voluntary obedience to the head of their blood, and their chief or mercer, as a representative of their great father, exercises the authority of a judge in peace and of a leader in war. In the original state of the pastoral world, each of the mercers, if we may continue to use a modern appellation, acted as the independent chief of a large and separate family and the limits of their peculiar territories were gradually fixed by superior force or mutual consent. But the constant operation of various and permanent causes contributed to unite the vagrant hordes into national communities under the command of a supreme head. The weak were desirous of support, and the strong were ambitious of dominion. The power, which is a result of union, oppressed and collected the divided force of the adjacent tribes, and, as the vanquished were freely omitted to share the advantages of victory, the most valiant chiefs hastened to range themselves and their followers under the formidable standard of a confederate nation. The most successful of the Tartar princes assumed the military command, to which he was entitled by the superiority, either of merit or of power. He was raised to the throne by the acclamations of his equals, and the title of Khan expresses, in the language of the north of Asia, the full extent of the regal dignity. The right of hereditary succession was long confined to the blood of the founder of the monarchy, and at this moment all the Khans, who reigned from Crimea to the wall of China, are the lineal descendants of the renowned Zingis. But, as it is the indispensable duty of a Tartar sovereign to lead his warlike subjects into the field, the claims of an infant are often disregarded. And some royal kinsman, distinguished by his age and valour, is entrusted with the sword and sceptre of his predecessor. Two distinct and regular taxes are levied on the tribes to support the dignity of the national monarch and of their peculiar chief and each of those contributions amounts to the tithe, both of their property and of their spoil. A Tartar sovereign enjoys the tenth part of the wealth of his people, and his own domestic riches of flocks and herds increase in a much larger proportion. He is able plentifully to maintain the rustic splendour of his court, 
to reward the most deserving, or the most favoured of his followers, and to obtain, from the gentle influence of corruption, the obedience which might be sometimes refused to the stern mandates of authority. The manners of his subjects, accustomed, like himself, to blood and rapine, might excuse, in their eyes, such partial acts of tyranny as would excite the horror of a civilized people. But the power of a despot has never been acknowledged in the deserts of Scythia. The immediate jurisdiction of the Khan is confined within the limits of his own tribe, and the exercise of his royal prerogative has been moderated by the ancient institution of a national council. The Koroltai, or Diet, of the Tartars, was regularly held in the spring and autumn in the midst of a plain, where the princes of the reigning family and the mercers of the respective tribes may conveniently assemble on horseback with their martial and numerous trains, and the ambitious monarch, who reviewed the strength, must consult the inclination of an armed people. The rudiments of a feudal government may be discovered in the constitution of the Scythian or Tartar nations, but the perpetual conflict of those hostile nations has sometimes terminated in the establishment of a powerful and despotic empire. The victor, enriched by the tribute and fortified by the arms of dependent kings, has spread his conquests over Europe or Asia. The successful shepherds of the north have submitted to the confinement of arts, of laws, and of cities. And the introduction of luxury, after destroying the freedom of the people, has undermined the foundations of the throne. The memory of past events cannot long be preserved in the frequent and remote emigrations of illiterate barbarians. The modern Tartars are ignorant of the conquests of their ancestors, and our knowledge of the history of the Scythians is derived from their intercourse with the learned and civilized nations of the South, the Greeks, the Persians, and the Chinese. The Greeks, who navigated the Euxine and planted their colonies along the sea coast, made the gradual and imperfect discovery of Scythia. From the Danube and the confines of Thrace, as far as the frozen Myotosis, the seat of eternal winter, and Mount Caucasus, which, in the language of poetry, was described as the utmost boundary of the earth, they celebrated with simple credulity the virtues of the pastoral life. They entertained a more rational apprehension of the strength and numbers of the warlike barbarians. Who contemptuously baffled the immense armament of Darius, the son of Histopes. The Persian monarchs had extended their western conquests to the banks of the Danube and the limits of European Scythia. The eastern provinces of their empire were exposed to the Scythians of Asia. The wild inhabitants of the plains beyond the Oxus and the Jaxartes, two mighty rivers which direct their course towards the Caspian Sea. The long and memorable quarrel of Iran and Turin is still the theme of history or romance. The famous, perhaps the fabulous, valour of the Persian heroes, Rustan and Asfendia, was signalised in the defence of their country against the Asphrasiabs of the north. And the invincible spirit of the same barbarians resisted, on the same ground, the victorious arms of Cyrus and Alexander. The real geography of Scythia was bounded on the east by the mountains of Imus or Cath, and their distant prospect of the extreme and inaccessible parts of Asia was clouded by ignorance or perplexed by fiction. But these inaccessible regions are the ancient residence of a powerful and civilized nation, which ascends by a probable tradition above forty centuries, and which is able to verify a series of near two thousand years by the perpetual testimony of accurate and contemporary historians. The annals of China illustrate the state and revolutions of the pastoral tribes. 
which may still be distinguished by the vague appellation of Scythians or Tartars. The vassals, the enemies, and sometimes the conquerors, of a great empire, whose policy has uniformly opposed the blind and impetuous valour of the barbarians of the north. From the mouth of the Danube to the Sea of Japan, the whole longitude of Scythia is about one hundred and ten degrees, which, in that parallel, are equal to more than five thousand miles. The latitude of these extensive deserts cannot be so easily or so accurately measured, but from the fortieth degree which touches the walls of China, we may scarcely advance above a thousand miles to the northward, till our progress is stopped by the excessive cold of Siberia. In that dreary climate, instead of the animated picture of a Tartar camp, the smoke that issues from the earth, or rather from the snow, betrays the subterraneous dwellings of the Tongausus and the Samoids. The want of horses and oxen is imperfectly supplied by the use of reindeer and of large dogs, and the conquerors of the earth insensibly degenerate into a race of deformed and diminutive savages who tremble at the sound of arms. End of chapter 26, part 1「Of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Chapter 26. Progress of the Huns. Part 2. The Huns who, under the reign of Valens, threatened the empire of Rome, had been formidable, in a much earlier period, to the empire of China. Their ancient, perhaps their original, seat was an extensive, though dry and barren, tract of country, immediately on the north side of the Great Wall. Their place is at present occupied by the forty-nine hordes, or banners, of the Mongus, a pastoral nation, which consists of about two hundred thousand families. But the valour of the Huns had extended the narrow limits of their dominions, and their rustic chiefs, who assumed the appellation of Tanju, gradually became the conquerors, and the sovereigns of a formidable empire. Towards the east, their victorious arms were stopped only by the ocean, and the tribes which are thinly scattered between the Amur and the extreme peninsula of Korea, adhered, with reluctance, to the standard of the Huns. On the west, near the head of the Irtish, in the valleys of Imus, they found a more ample space, and more numerous enemies. One of the lieutenants of the Tanju, subdued, in a single expedition, twenty-six nations. The Igors, distinguished above the Tartar race by the use of letters, were in the number of his vassals. And, by the strange connection of human events, the flight of one of those vagrant tribes recalled the victorious Parthians from the invasion of Syria. On the side of the north, the ocean was assigned as the limit of the power of the Huns. Without enemies to resist their progress, or witnesses to contradict their vanity, they might securely achieve a real or imaginary conquest of the frozen regions of Siberia. The northern sea was fixed as the remote boundary of their empire. But the name of that sea, on whose shores the patriot Sovo embraced the life of a shepherd and an exile, may be transferred, with much more probability, to the Baikal, a capitious basin above three hundred miles in length, which disdains the modern appellation of a lake, and which actually communicates with the seas of the north, by the long course of the Angara, the Tongosha, and the Genesee. The submission of so many distant nations might flatter the pride of the Tanju, but the valour of the Huns could be rewarded 
only by the enjoyment of the wealth and luxury of the empire of the south. In the third century before the Christian era, a wall of fifteen hundred miles in length was constructed to defend the frontiers of China against the inroads of the Huns. But this stupendous work, which holds a conspicuous place in the map of the world, has never contributed to the safety of an unwarlike people. The cavalry of the Tanju frequently consisted of two or three hundred thousand men, formidable by the matchless dexterity with which they managed their bows and their horses. By their hardy patience in supporting the inclemency of the weather, and by the incredible speed of their march, which was seldom checked by torrents or precipices, by the deepest rivers, or by the most lofty mountains. They spread themselves at once over the face of the country, and their rapid impetuosity surprised, astonished, and disconcerted the grave and elaborate tactics of a Chinese army. The Emperor Kaotai, a soldier of fortune, whose personal merit had raised him to the throne, marched against the Huns with those veteran troops which had been trained in the civil wars of China. But he was soon surrounded by the barbarians, and, after a siege of seven days, the monarch, hopeless of relief, was reduced to purchase his deliverance by an ignominious capitulation. The successors of Coyote, whose lives were dedicated to the arts of peace or the luxury of the palace, submitted to a more permanent disgrace. They too hastily confessed the insufficiency of arms and fortifications. They were too easily convinced that while the blazing signals announced on every side the approach of the Huns, the Chinese troops, who slept with the helmet on their head and the cuirass on their back, were destroyed by the incessant labour of ineffectual marches. A regular payment of money and silk was stipulated as the condition of a temporary and precarious peace, and the wretched expedient of disguising a real tribute, under the names of a gift or subsidy, was practised by the emperors of China as well as by those of Rome. But there still remained a more disgraceful article of tribute, which violated the sacred feelings of humanity and nature. The hardships of the savage life, which destroyed in their infancy the children who were born with a less healthy and robust constitution, introduced a remarkable disproportion between the numbers of the two sexes. The Tartars are an ugly and even deformed race, and while they consider their own women as the instruments of domestic labour, their desires, or rather their appetite, are directed to the enjoyment of a more elegant beauty. A select band of the fairest maidens of China was annually devoted to the rude embraces of the Huns, and the alliance of the haughty Tanjurs was secured by their marriage with the genuine, or adopted, daughters of the imperial family, which vainly attempted to escape the sacrilegious pollution. The situation of these unhappy victims is described in the verses of a Chinese princess, who laments that she had been condemned by her parents to a distant exile, under a barbarian husband, who complains that sour milk was her only drink, raw flesh her only food, a tent her only palace, and who expresses, in a strain of pathetic simplicity, the natural wish that she was transformed into a bird, to fly back to her dear country, the object of her tender and perpetual regret. The conquest of China has been twice achieved by the pastoral tribes of the north. The forces of the Huns were not inferior to those of the Mughals, or of the Mandachuoks, and their ambition might entertain the most sanguine hopes of success. But their pride was humbled and their progress was checked by the arms and policy of Vautai, the fifth emperor of the powerful dynasty of the Han. In his long reign of fifty-four years, the barbarians of the southern provinces submitted to the laws and manners of China, and the ancient limits of the monarchy were enlarged from the great river of Qiang 
to the port of Canton. Instead of confining himself to the timid operations of a defensive war, his lieutenants penetrated many hundred miles into the country of the Huns. In those boundless deserts, where it is impossible to form magazines, and difficult to transport a sufficient supply of provisions, the armies of Valtai were repeatedly exposed to intolerable hardships. And, of one hundred and forty thousand soldiers who marched against the barbarians, thirty thousand only returned in safety to the feet of their master. These losses, however, were compensated by splendid and decisive success. The Chinese generals improved the superiority which they derived from the temper of their arms, their chariots of war, and the service of their Tartar auxiliaries. The camp of the Tanju was surprised in the midst of sleep and intemperance, and though the monarch of the Huns bravely cut his way through the ranks of the enemy, he left above fifteen thousand of his subjects on the field of battle. Yet this signal victory, which was preceded and followed by many bloody engagements, contributed much less to the destruction of the power of the Huns than the effectual policy which was employed to detach the tributary nations from their obedience. Intimidated by the arms, or allured by the promises, of Vautai and his successors, the most considerable tribes, both of the east and of the west, disclaimed the authority of the Tanju. While some acknowledged themselves the allies or vassals of the empire, they all became the implicable enemies of the Huns, and the numbers of that haughty people, as soon as they were reduced to their native strength, might perhaps have been contained within the walls of one of the great and popular cities of China. The desertion of his subjects, and the perplexity of a civil war, at length compelled the Tanju, himself to renounce the dignity of an independent sovereign, and the freedom of a warlike and high-spirited nation. He was received at Saigon, the capital of the monarchy, by the troops, the mandarins, and the emperor himself, with all the honours that could adorn and disguise the triumph of Chinese vanity. A magnificent palace was prepared for his reception. His place was assigned above all the princes of the royal family, and the patience of the barbarian king was exhausted by the ceremonies of a banquet, which consisted of eight courses of meat and nine solemn pieces of music. But he performed, on his knees, the duty of a respectful homage to the emperor of China, pronounced in his own name, and in the name of his successors, a perpetual oath of fidelity, and gratefully accepted a seal, which was bestowed as the emblem of his regal dependence. After this humiliating submission, the Tanjos sometimes departed from their allegiance, and seized the favourable moments of war and rapine. But the monarchy of the Huns gradually declined, till it was broken, by civil dissension, into two hostile and separate kingdoms. One of the princes of the nation was urged, by fear and ambition, to retire towards the south with eight great hordes, which composed between forty and fifty thousand families. He obtained, with the title of Tanju, a convenient territory on the verge of the Chinese provinces and his constant attachment to the service of the empire was secured by weakness and the desire of revenge. From the time of this fatal schism, the Huns of the north continued to languish about fifty years, till they were oppressed on every side by their foreign and domestic enemies. The proud inscription of a column, erected on a lofty mountain, announced to posterity that a Chinese army had marched seven hundred miles into the heart of their country. The Senpai, a tribe of Oriental Tartars, retaliated the injuries which they had formerly sustained. And the power of the Tanjus, after a reign of thirteen hundred years, 
was utterly destroyed before the end of the first century of the Christian era. The fate of the vanquished Huns was diversified by the various influence of character and situation. Above one hundred thousand persons, the poorest indeed, and the most pusillanimous of the people, were contented to remain in their native country, to renounce their peculiar name and origin, and to mingle with the victorious nation of the Senpai. Fifty-eight hordes, about two hundred thousand men, ambitious of a more honourable servitude, retired towards the south, implored the protection of the emperors of China, and were permitted to inhabit and to guard the extreme frontiers of the province of Chansi, and the territory of Ortus. But the most warlike and powerful tribes of the Huns maintained, in their adverse fortune, the undaunted spirit of their ancestors. The western world was open to their valour, and they resolved, under the conduct of their hereditary chieftains, to conquer and subdue some remote country, which was still inaccessible to the arms of the Senpai and to the laws of China. The course of their emigration soon carried them beyond the mountains of Imus and the limits of the Chinese geography. But we are able to distinguish the two great divisions of these formidable exiles, which directed their march towards the Oxus and towards the Volga. The first of these colonies established their dominion in the fruitful and extensive plains of Sogdiana, on the eastern side of the Caspian, where they preserved the name of Huns, with the epithet of Euphilates or Nephilates. Their manners were softened, and even their features were insensibly improved by the mildness of the climate, and their long residence in a flourishing province, which might still retain a faint impression of the arts of Greece. The White Huns, a name which they derived from the change of their complexions, soon abandoned the pastoral life of Scythia. Gorgo, which, under the appellation of Charisme, has since enjoyed a temporary splendour, was the residence of the king, who exercised a legal authority over an obedient people. Their luxury was maintained by the labour of the Sogdians, and the only vestige of their ancient barbarism was the custom which obliged all the companions perhaps to the number of twenty, who had shared the liberality of a wealthy lord, to be buried alive in the same grave. The vicinity of the Huns to the provinces of Persia involved them in frequent and bloody contests with the power of that monarchy. But they respected in peace the faith of treaties, in war the dictates of humanity, and their memorable victory over Perosis or Phyras displayed the moderation, as well as the valour, of the barbarians. The second division of their countrymen, the Huns, who gradually advanced towards the north-west, were exercised by the hardships of a colder climate, and a more laborious march. Necessity compelled them to exchange the silks of China for the furs of Siberia. The imperfect rudiments of civilised life were obliterated, and the native fierceness of the Huns was exasperated by their intercourse with the savage tribes, who were compared, with some property, to the wild beasts of the desert. Their independent spirit soon rejected the hereditary succession of the Tanjus, and while each horde was governed by its peculiar mercy, their tumultuary council directed the public measures of the whole nation. As late as the 13th century, their transient residence on the eastern banks of the Volga was attested by the name of Great Hungary. In the winter they descended with their flocks and herds towards the mouth of that mighty river, and their summer excursions reached as high as the latitude of Saratov, or perhaps the conflux of the Karma. Such, at least, were the recent limits of the Black Kalmucks, who remained about a century under the protection of Russia, and who have since returned to their native seats on the frontiers of the Chinese Empire. 
the march and the return of those wandering Tartars, whose united camp consisted of fifty thousand tents or families, illustrate the distant emigrations of the ancient Huns. It is impossible to fill the dark interval of time which elapsed after the Huns of the Volga were lost in the eyes of the Chinese, and before they showed themselves to those of the Romans. There is some reason, however, to apprehend that the same force which had driven them from their native seats still continued to impel their march towards the frontiers of Europe. The power of the Senpai, their implicable enemies, which extended above three thousand miles from east to west, must have gradually oppressed them by the weight and terror of a formidable neighbourhood. And the flight of the tribes of Scythia would inevitably tend to increase the strength or to contract the territories of the Huns. The harsh and obscure appellations of those tribes would offend the ear, without informing the understanding of the reader. But I cannot suppress the very natural suspicion that the Huns of the North derived a considerable reinforcements from the ruin of the dynasty of the South, which, in the course of the third century, submitted to the dominion of China, that the bravest warriors marched away in search of their free and adventurous countrymen, and that, as they had been divided by prosperity, they were easily reunited by the common hardships of their adverse fortune. The Huns, with their flocks and herds, their wives and children, their dependents and allies, were transported to the west of the Volga, and they boldly advanced to invade the country of the Alani, a pastoral people who occupied, or wasted, an extensive tract of the deserts of Scythia. The plains between the Volga and the Tanis were covered with the tents of the Alani, but their name and manners were diffused over the wide extent of their conquests, and the painted tribes of the Agathyrasi and Geloni were confounded among their vassals. Towards the north they penetrated into the frozen regions of Siberia, among the savages who were accustomed, in their rage or hunger, to the taste of human flesh, and their southern inroads were pushed as far as the confines of Persia and India. The mixture of somatic and German blood had contributed to improve the features of the Alani, to whiten their swarthy complexions, and to tinge their hair with a yellowish cast, which is seldom found in the Tartar race. They were less deformed in their persons, less brutish in their manners than the Huns, but they did not yield to those formidable barbarians in their martial and independent spirit. In the love of freedom, which rejected even the use of domestic slaves, and in the love of arms, which considered war and rapine as the pleasure and the glory of mankind. A naked scimitar, fixed in the ground, was the only object of their religious worship. The scalps of their enemies formed the costly trappings of their horses, and they viewed, with pity and contempt, the pusillanimous warriors who patiently expected the infirmities of age and the tortures of lingering disease. On the banks of the Tanis, the military power of the Huns and the Alani encountered each other with equal valour, but unequal success. The Huns prevailed in the bloody contest. The king of the Alani was slain, and the remains of the vanquished nation were dispersed by the ordinary alternative of flight or submission. A colony of exiles found a secure refuge in the mountains of Caucasus, between the Euxine and the Caspian, where they still preserved their name and their independence. Another colony advanced, with more intrepid courage, towards the shores of the Baltic, associated themselves with the northern tribes of Germany, and shared the spoil of the Roman provinces of Gaul and Spain. But the greatest part of the nation of the Alani embraced the offers of an honourable and advantageous union. And the Huns, who esteemed the valour of the less fortunate enemies, 
proceeded with an increase of numbers and confidence to invade the limits of the Gothic Empire. The great Hermanric, whose dominions extended from the Baltic to the Euxine, enjoyed, in the full maturity of age and reputation, the fruits of his victories. When he was alarmed by the formidable approach of a host of unknown enemies, on whom his barbarous subjects might, without injustice, bestow the epithet of barbarians. The numbers, the strength, the rapid motions, and the implacable cruelty of the Huns were felt and dreaded and magnified by the astonished Goths, who beheld their fields and villages consumed with flames and deluged with indiscriminate slaughter. To these real terrors they added the surprise and abhorrence which were excited by the shrill voice, the uncouth gestures, and the strange deformity of the Huns. These savages of Scythia were compared, and the picture had some resemblance, to the animals who walk very awkwardly on two legs, and to the misshapen figures, the termini, which were often placed on the bridges of antiquity. They were distinguished from the rest of the human species by their broad shoulders, flat noses, and small black eyes, deeply buried in the head. And as they were almost destitute of beards, they never enjoyed either the manly grace of youth or the venerable aspect of age. A fabulous origin was assigned, worthy of their form and manners, that the witches of Scythia, who, for their foul and deadly practices, had been driven from society, had copulated in the desert with infernal spirits, and that the Huns were the offspring of this excrescible conjunction. The tale, so full of horror and absurdity, was greedily embraced by the credulous hatred of the Goths. But, while it gratified their hatred, it increased their fear. Since the posterity of demons and witches might be supposed to inherit some share of the preternatural powers, as well as of the malignant temper of their parents. Against these enemies, Hermanric prepared to exert the united forces of the Gothic state. But he soon discovered that his vassal tribes, provoked by oppression, were much more inclined to second than to repel the invasion of the Huns. One of the chiefs of the Roxolani, had formerly deserted the standard of Hermanric, and the cruel tyrant had condemned the innocent wife of the traitor to be torn asunder by wild horses. The brothers of that unfortunate woman seized the favourable moment of revenge. The aged king of the Goths languished some time after the dangerous wound which he received from their daggers, but the conduct of the war was retarded by his infirmities, and the public councils of the nation were distracted by a spirit of jealousy and discord. His death, which has been imputed to his own despair, left the reins of government in the hands of Withyma, who, with the doubtful aid of some Scythian mercenaries, maintained the unequal contest against the arms of the Huns and the Alani, till he was defeated and slain in a decisive battle the Ostrogoths submitted to their fate, and the royal race of the Amali will hereafter be found among the subjects of the haughty Attila. But the person of Witheric, the infant king, was saved by the diligence of Alatheus and Sapphorax, two warriors of approved valour and fidelity, who, by cautious marches, conducted the independent remains of the nation of the Ostrogoths towards the Danistus or Niester, a considerable river which now separates the Turkish dominions from the empire of Russia. On the banks of the Niester, the prudent Athanarach, more attended to his own than to the general safety, had fixed the camp of the Visgoths, with the firm resolution of opposing the victorious barbarians, whom he thought it less advisable to provoke. The ordinary speed of the Huns was checked by the weight of baggage, and the encumbrance of captives. 
but their military skill deceived, and almost destroyed the army of Athanaric. While the judge of the Visgoths defended the banks of the Niester, he was encompassed and attacked by a numerous detachment of cavalry, who, by the light of the moon, had passed the river in a fordable place, and it was not without the utmost efforts of courage and conduct that he was able to effect his retreat towards the hilly country. The undaunted general had already formed a new and judicious plan of defensive war, and the strong lines which he was preparing to construct between the mountains, the Pruth and the Danube, would have secured the extensive and fertile territory that bears the modern name of Ulachia from the destructive inroads of the Huns. But the hopes and measures of the judge of the Visgoths were soon disappointed by the trembling impatience of his dismayed countrymen, who were persuaded by their fears that the interposition of the Danube was the only barrier that could save them from the rapid pursuit and invincible valour of the barbarians of Scythia. Under the command of Fritigern and Alvivius, the body of the nation hastily advanced to the banks of the great river, and implored the protection of the Roman emperor of the east. Althanaric himself, still anxious to avoid the guilt of perjury, retired, with a band of faithful followers, into the mountainous country of Kukorkaland, which appears to have been guarded, and almost concealed, by the impenetrable forests of Transylvania. End of chapter 26, part 2「twenty six part three of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire volume two this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by Lizzie driver chapter twenty six progress of the Huns part three after Valens had terminated the Gothic war with some appearance of glory and success, he made a progress through his dominions of Asia, and, at length, fixed his residence in the capital of Syria. The five years which he spent in Antioch was employed to watch, from a secure distance, the hostile designs of the Persian monarch, to check the depredations of the Saracens and Isaurians, to enforce, by argument more prevalent than those of reason and eloquence, the belief of the Arian theology, and to satisfy his anxious suspicions by the promiscuous execution of the innocent and the guilty. But the attention of the emperor was most seriously engaged by the important intelligence which he received from the civil and military officers who were entrusted with the defence of the Danube. He was informed that the north was agitated by a furious tempest, that the eruption of the Huns, an unknown and monstrous race of savages, had subverted the power of the Goths, and that the suppliant multitudes of that warlike nation, whose pride was now humbled in the dust, covered a space of many miles along the banks of the river. With outstretched arms and pathetic lamentations, they loudly deplored their past misfortunes and their present danger, acknowledged that their only hope of safety was in the clemency of the Roman government, and most solemnly protested that if the gracious liberality of the emperor would permit them to cultivate the wastelands of Thrace, they should ever hold themselves bound, by the strongest obligations of duty and gratitude, to obey the laws and to guard the limits of the Republic. These assurances were confirmed by the ambassadors of the Goths, who impatiently expected from the mouth of Valens an answer that must finally determine the fate of their unhappy countrymen. The Emperor of the East was no longer guided by the wisdom and authority of his elder brother, whose death happened towards the end of the preceding year, and as the distressful situation of the Goths 
required an instant and peremptory decision. He was deprived of the favourite resources of feeble and timid minds, who consider the use of dilatory and ambiguous measures as the most admirable effects of consummate prudence. As long as the same passions and interests subsist among mankind, the questions of war and peace, of justice and policy, which were debated in the councils of antiquity, will frequently present themselves as the subject of modern deliberation. But the most experienced statesman of Europe has never been summoned to consider the property, or the danger, of admitting, or rejecting, an innumerable multitude of barbarians, who are driven by despair and hunger, to solicit a settlement on the territories of a civilized nation. When that important proposition, so essentially connected with the public safety, was referred to the ministers of Valens, they were perplexed and divided. But they soon acquiesced in the flattering sentiment which seemed the most favorable to the pride, the insolence, and the avarice of their sovereign. The slaves, who were decorated with the titles of prefects and generals, dissembled or disregarded the terrors of this national immigration, so extremely different from the partial and accidental colonies which had been received on the extreme limits of the empire. But they applauded the liberality of fortune, which had conducted, from the most distant countries of the globe, a numerous and invincible army of strangers, to defend the throne of Valens, who might now add to the royal treasures the immense sums of gold supplied by the provincials to compensate their annual proportion of recruits. The prayers of the Goths were granted, and their service was accepted by the imperial court, and orders were immediately dispatched to the civil and military governors, of the Thracian diasis, to make the necessary preparations for the passage and substance of a great people, till a proper and sufficient territory could be allotted for their future residence. The liberality of the emperor was accompanied, however, with two harsh and rigorous conditions, which prudence might justify on the side of the Romans but which distress alone could exhort from the indignant Goths. Before they passed to the Danube, they were required to deliver their arms, and it was insisted that their children should be taken from them, and dispersed through the provinces of Asia, where they might be civilized by the arts of education, and serve as hostages to secure the fidelity of their parents. During the suspense of a doubtful and distant negotiation, the impatient Goths made some rash attempts to pass the Danube, without the permission of the government, whose protection they had implored. Their motions were strictly observed by the vigilance of the troops, which were stationed along the river, and their foremost detachments were defected with considerable slaughter. Yet such were the timid counsels of the reign of Valens, that the brave officers who had served their country in the execution of their duty were punished by the loss of their employments and narrowly escaped the loss of their heads. The imperial mandate was at length received for transporting over the Danube the whole body of the Gothic nation. But the execution of this order was a task of labour and difficulty. The stream of the Danube, which in those parts is above a mile broad, had been swelled by incessant rains, and in this tumultuous passage many were swept away and drowned by the rapid violence of the current. A large fleet of vessels, of boats, and of canoes was provided. Many days and nights they passed and repassed with indefatigable toil, and the most strenuous diligence was exerted by the officers of Valens, that not a single barbarian, of those who were reserved to subvert the foundations of Rome, should be left on the opposite shore. It was thought expedient that an accurate account should be taken of their numbers, but the persons who were employed soon desisted, 
with amazement and dismay, from the prosecution of the endless and impracticable task. And the principal historian of the age most seriously affirms that the prodigious armies of Darius and Xerxes, which had so long been considered as the fables of vain and credulous antiquity, were now justified, in the eyes of mankind, by the evidence of fact and experience. A probable testimony has fixed the number of the Gothic warriors at two hundred thousand men, and, if we can venture to add the just proportion of women, of children, and of slaves, the whole mass of people which comprise this formidable immigration must have amounted to near a million of persons, of both sexes and of all ages. The children of the Goths, those at least of a distinguished rank, were separated from the multitude. They were conducted, without delay, to the distant seats assigned for their residence and education. And, as the numerous train of hostages, or captives, passed through the cities, their gay and splendid apparel, their robust and martial figure, excited the surprise and envy of the provincials. But the stipulation, the most offensive to the Goths, and the most important to the Romans, was shamefully eluded. The barbarians, who considered their arms as the ensigns of honour and the pledges of safety, were disposed to offer a price, which the lust or avarice of the imperial officers was easily tempted to accept. To preserve their arms, the haughty warriors consented, with some reluctance, to prostitute their wives or their daughters. The charms of a beauteous maid or a comely boy secured the convenience of the inspectors, who sometimes cast an eye of quivaciousness on the fringed carpets and linen garments of their new allies, or who sacrificed their duty to the mean consideration of filling their farms with cattle and their houses with slaves. The Goths, with arms in their hands, were permitted to enter the boats, and when their strength was collected on the other side of the river, the immense camp which was spread over the plains and the hills of the lower Maesia assumed a threatening and even hostile aspect. The leaders of the Ostrogoths, Aletheus and Sapphorax, the guardians of their infant king, appeared soon afterwards on the northern banks of the Danube, and immediately dispatched their ambassadors to the court of Antioch, to solicit, with the same professions of allegiance and gratitude, the same favour which had been granted to the suppliant Visigoths. The absolute refusal of Valens suspended their progress, and discovered the repentance, the suspicions, and the fear of the imperial council. An undisciplined and unsettled nation of barbarians required the firmest temper, and the most dexterous management. The daily subsistence of near a million of extraordinary subjects could be supplied only by constant and skilful diligence and might continually be interpreted by mistake or accident. The insolence, or the indignation of the Goths, if they conceived themselves to be the objects either of fear or of contempt, might urge them to make the most desperate extremities. And the fortune of the state seemed to depend on the prudence, as well as the integrity, of the generals of Valens. At this important crisis, the military government of Thrace was exercised by Lepicinus and Maximus, in whose venial minds the slightest hope of private emolument outweighed every consideration of public advantage, and whose guilt was only alleviated by their incapacity of discerning the pernicious effects of their rash and criminal administration. Instead of obeying the orders of their sovereign, and satisfying, with decent liberality, the demands of the Goths, they levied an ungenerous and oppressive tax on the wants of the hungry barbarians. The vilest food was sold at an extravagant price, and, in the room of wholesome and substantial provisions, the market was filled with the flesh of dogs, 
and of unclean animals who had died of disease. To obtain the valuable acquisition of a pound of bread, the Goths resigned the possession of an expensive, though serviceable slave, and a small quantity of meat was greedily purchased with ten pounds of precious but useless metal. When their property was exhausted, they continued to this necessary traffic by the sale of their sons and daughters. And, notwithstanding the love of freedom, which animated every Gothic breast, they submitted to the humiliating maxim that it was better for their children to be maintained in a servile condition than to perish in a state of wretched and hopeless independence. The most lively resentment is excited by the tyranny of pretended benefactors, who sternly exact the debt of gratitude which they have cancelled by subsequent injuries. A spirit of discontent insensibly arose in the camp of the barbarians, who pleaded, without success, the merit of their patient and dutiful behaviour, and loudly complained of the inhospitable treatment which they had received from their new allies. They beheld around them the wealth and plenty of a fertile province, in the midst of which they suffered the intolerable hardships of artificial famine. But the means of relief, and even of revenge, were in their hands, since the rapaciousness of their tyrants had left to an injured people the possession and use of arms. The clamours of a multitude, untaught to disguise their sentiments, announced the first symptoms of resistance, and alarmed the timid and guilty minds of Lopicinus and Maximus, those crafty ministers, who substituted the cunning of temporary expedients to the wise and salutary counsels of general policy, attempted to remove the Goths from their dangerous station on the frontiers of the empire, and to disperse them in separate quarters of cantonment through the interior provinces. As they were conscious how ill they had deserved the respect or confidence of the barbarians, they diligently collected from every side, a military force that might urge the tardy and reluctant march of a people who had not yet renounced the title or the duties of Roman subjects. But the generals of Valens, while their attention was solely directed to the discontented Visgoths, imprudently disarmed the ships and the fortifications which constituted the defence of the Danube. The fatal oversight was observed, and improved, by Alatheus and Saphrox, who anxiously watched the favourable moment of escaping from the pursuit of the Huns. By the help of such rafts and vessels as could be hastily procured, the leaders of the Ostrogoths transported, without opposition, their king and their army, and boldly fixed a hostile and independent camp on the territories of the empire. Under the name of judges, Alvivus and Fertigan were the leaders of the Visgoths in peace and war, and the authority which they derived from their birth was ratified by the free consent of the nation. In a season of tranquillity, their power might have been equal, as well as their rank. But, as soon as their countrymen were exasperated by hunger and oppression, the superior abilities of Fertigan assumed the military command which he was qualified to exercise for the public welfare. He restrained the impatient spirit of the Visgoths, till the injuries and the insults of their tyrants should justify their resistance in the opinion of mankind. But he was not disposed to sacrifice any solid advantages for the empty praise of justice and moderation. Sensible of the benefits which would result from the union of the Gothic powers under the same standard, he secretly cultivated the friendship of the Ostrogoths. And while he professed an implicit obedience to the orders of the Roman generals, he proceeded, by slow marches, towards Marcianopolis, the capital of the Lower Mercia, about seventy miles from the banks of the Danube. On that fatal spot, the flames of discord and mutual hatred burst forth into a dreadful conflagration, 
Lupicinius had invited the Gothic chiefs to a splendid entertainment, and their martial train remained under arms at the entrance of the palace. But the gates of the city were strictly guarded, and the barbarians were sternly excluded from the use of a plentiful market, to which they asserted their equal claim of subjects and allies. Their humble prayers were rejected with insolence and derision, and their patience was now exhausted. The townsmen, the soldiers, and the Goths were soon involved in a conflict of a passionate altercation and angry reproaches. A blow was imprudently given, a sword hastily drawn, and the first blood that was spilt in this accidental quarrel became the signal of a long and destructive war. In the midst of noise and brutal intemperance, Lupicinius was informed by a secret messenger that many of his soldiers were slain and despoiled of their arms. And as he was already inflamed by wine and oppressed by sleep, he issued a rash command that their death should be revenged by the massacre of the guards of Fritigan and Alvivus. The clamorous shouts and dying groans. Praised Fritigan of his extreme danger, and as he possessed the calm and intrepid spirit of a hero, he saw that he was lost if he allowed a moment of deliberation to the man who had so deeply injured him. A trifling dispute," said the Gothic leader, with a firm but gentle tone of voice, "appears to have arisen between the two nations, but it may be productive of the most dangerous consequences." Unless the tumult is immediately pacified by the assurance of our safety and the authority of our presence. At these words, Fritigan and his companions drew their swords, opened their passage through the unresisting crowd which filled the palace, the streets, and the gates of Marcianopolis, and mounting their horses, hastily vanished from the eyes of the astonished Romans. The generals of the Goths were saluted by the fierce and joyful acclamations of the camp. War was instantly resolved, and the resolution was executed without delay. The banners of the nation were displayed according to the custom of their ancestors, and the air resounded with the harsh and mournful music of the barbarian trumpet. The weak and guilty Lapicinius, who had dared to provoke, who had neglected to destroy. And who still presumed to despise his formidable enemy, marched against the Goths, at the head of such a military force as could be collected on this sudden emergency. The barbarians expected his approach about nine miles from Marcianopolis, and on this occasion the talents of the general were found to be of a more prevailing efficiency than the weapons and discipline of the troops. The valor of the Goths was so ably directed by the genius of Fritigan, that they broke, by a close and vigorous attack, the ranks of the Roman legions. Lupicinius left his arms and standards, his tribunes and his bravest soldiers on the field of battle, and their useless courage served only to protect the ignominious flight of their leader. That successful day put an end to the distress of the barbarians. And the security of the Romans. From that day, the Goths, renouncing the precarious condition of strangers and exiles, assumed the character of citizens and masters, claimed an absolute dominion over the possessors of land, and held, in their own right, the northern provinces of the empire, which are bounded by the Danube. Such are the words of the Gothic historian. Who celebrates with rude eloquence the glory of his countrymen? But the dominion of the barbarians was exercised only for the purposes of rapine and destruction. As they had been deprived by the ministers of the empire of the common benefits of nature and the fair intercourse of social life, they retaliated the injustice on the subjects of the empire and the crimes of Lupicinius. Were expiated by the ruin of the peaceful husbandmen of Thrace, the conflagration of their villages, and the massacre or captivity of their innocent families. The report of the Gothic victory was soon diffused over the adjacent country. 
and while it filled the minds of the Romans with terror and dismay, their own hasty imprudence contributed to increase the forces of Fritigan and the calamities of the province. Some time before the great immigration, a numerous body of Goths, under the command of Surid and Coleus, had been received into the protection and service of the empire. They were encamped under the walls of Hadrianople, but the ministers of Valens were anxious to remove them beyond the Hellespont, at a distance from the dangerous temptation which might so easily be communicated by the neighbourhood and the success of their countrymen. The respectful submission with which they yielded to the order of their march might be considered as a proof of their fidelity, and their moderate request of a sufficient allowance of provisions and of a delay of only two days was expressed in the most dutiful terms. But the first magistrate of Hadrianople, incensed by some disorders which had been committed at his country house, refused this indulgence, and, arming against them the inhabitants and manufacturers of a populous city, he urged, with hostile threats, their instant departure. The barbarians stood silent and amazed, "'until they were exasperated by the insulting clamours "'and missile weapons of the populace. "'But when patience or contempt was fatigued, "'they crushed the undisciplined multitude, "'inflicted many a shameful wounds "'on the backs of their flying enemies, "'and despoiled them of the splendid armour "'which they were unworthy to bear. "'The resemblance of their sufferings and their actions "'soon united this victorious detachment to the nation of the Viscoths. The troops of Coleus and Surid expected the approach of the great Fertigan, ranged themselves under his standard, and signalized their ardour in the siege of Hadrianople. But the resistance of the garrison informed the barbarians that, in the attack of regular fortifications, the effects of unskilled courage are seldom effectual. Their general acknowledged his error, raised the siege, declared that he was at peace with stone walls, and revenged his disappointment on the adjacent country. He accepted with pleasure the useful reinforcement of hardy workmen, who laboured in the gold mines of Thrace, for the emolument, and under the lash of an unfeeling master. And these new associates conducted the barbarians through the secret paths to the most sequestered places, which had been chosen to secure the inhabitants, the cattle, and the magazines of corn. With the assistance of such guides, nothing could remain impervious or inaccessible. Resistance was fatal, flight was impracticable, and the patient submission of helpless innocence seldom found mercy from the barbarian conqueror. In the course of these depredations, a great number of the children of the Goths, who had been sold into captivity, were restored to the embraces of their afflicted parents. But these tender interviews, which might have revived and cherished in the mind some sentiments of humanity, tended only to stimulate their native fierceness by their desire of revenge. They listened with eager attention to the complaints of their captive children, who had suffered the most cruel indignities from the lustful or angry passions of their masters. And the same cruelties, the same indignities, were severely retaliated on the sons and daughters of the Romans. The imprudence of Valens and his ministers had introduced into the heart of the empire a nation of enemies. But the Viscoths might even yet have been reconciled, by the manly confession of past errors, and the sincere performance of former engagements. These healing and temperate measures seem to concur with the timorous disposition of the sovereign of the East. But, on this occasion alone, Valens was brave, and his unseasonable bravery was fatal to himself and to his subjects. He declared his intention of marching from Antioch to Constantinople, to subdue this dangerous rebellion, and, as he was not ignorant of the difficulties of the enterprise, 
he solicited the assistance of his nephew, the Emperor Gratian, who commanded all the forces of the West. The veteran troops were hastily reconciled from the defence of Armenia. That important frontier was abandoned to the discretion of Sapor, and the immediate conduct of the Gothic war was entrusted, during the absence of Valens, to his lieutenants Trajan and Profitorus, two generals who indulged themselves in a very false and favourable opinion of their own abilities. On their arrival in Thrace, they were joined by Ricoma, count of the domestics, and the auxiliaries of the West, that marched under his banner, were composed of the Gaelic legions, reduced indeed, by a spirit of desertion, to the vain appearances of strength and numbers. In a council of war, which was inflamed by pride rather than by reason, it was resolved to seek and to encounter the barbarians, who lay encamped in the spacious and fertile meadows, near the most southern of the six mouths of the Danube. Their camp was surrounded by the usual fortification of wagons, and the barbarians, secure within the vast circle of their enclosure, enjoyed the fruits of their valour, and the spoils of the province. In the midst of riotous intemperance, the watchful Fritigan observed the motions, and penetrated the designs of the Romans. He perceived that the numbers of the enemy were continually increasing, and, as he understood their intention of attacking his rear, as soon as the scarcity of forage should oblige him to remove his camp, he recalled to their standard his predatory detachments, which covered the adjacent country. As soon as they descried the flaming beacons, they obeyed, with incredible speed, the signal of their leader. The camp was filled with the martial crowd of barbarians. Their impatient clamours demanded the battle, and their tumultuous zeal was approved and animated by the spirit of the chiefs. The evening was already far advanced, and the two armies prepared themselves for the approaching combat, which was deferred only till the dawn of day. While the trumpets sounded to arms, the undaunted courage of the Goths was confirmed by the mutual obligation of a solemn oath. And, as they advanced to meet the enemy, the rude songs, which celebrated the glory of their forefathers, were mingled with the fierce and dissonant outcries, and opposed to the artificial harmony of the Roman shout. Some military skill was displayed by Fritigan, to gain the advantage of a commanding eminence. But the bloody conflict, which began and ended with the light, was maintained on either side by the personal and obstinate efforts of strength, valour, and agility. The legions of Armenia supported their fame in arms, but they were oppressed by the irresistible weight of the hostile multitude. The left wing of the Romans was thrown into disorder, and the field was strewed with their mangled carcasses. This partial defeat was balanced, however, by a partial success, and when the two armies, at a late hour of the evening, retreated to their respective camps, neither of them could claim the honours or the effects of a decisive victory. The real loss was more severely felt by the Romans, in proportion to the smallness of their numbers. But the Goths were so deeply confounded and dismayed by this vigorous and perhaps unexpected resistance that they remained seven days within the circle of their fortifications. Such funeral rites, as the circumstances of time and place would admit, were piously discharged to some officers of distinguished rank. But the indiscriminate vulgar was left unburied on the plain. Their flesh was greedily devoured by the birds of prey, who in that age enjoyed very frequent and delicious feasts. And several years afterwards, the white and naked bones which covered the wide extent of the fields presented to the eyes of Manius a dreadful monument of the Battle of Salicis. The progress of the Goths had been checked by the doubtful event of that bloody day and the imperial generals, whose army would have been consumed by the repetition of such a contest, embraced the more rational plan 
of destroying the barbarians by the wants and pressures of their own multitudes. They prepared to confine the Visigoths in the narrow angle of land between the Danube, the desert of Scythia, and the mountains of Hamas, till their strength and spirit should be insensibly wasted by the inevitable approach of famine. The design was prosecuted with some conduct and success. The barbarians had almost exhausted their own magazines, and the harvests of the country, and the diligence of Saturninus, the master-general of the cavalry, was employed to improve the strength, and to contract the extent, of the Roman fortifications. His labours were interrupted by the alarming intelligence that new swarms of barbarians had passed the unguarded Danube, either to support the cause, or to imitate the example of Fritigan. The just apprehension that he himself might be surrounded and overwhelmed by the arms of hostile and unknown nations compelled Saturninus to relinquish the siege of the Gothic camp. And the indignant Visgoths, breaking from their confinement, satiated their hunger and revenge by the repeated devastation of the fruitful country, which extends above three hundred miles from the banks of the Danube to the Straits of the Hellespont. The sagacious Fritigan had successfully appealed to the passions, as well as to the interest of his barbarian allies, and the love of rapine and the hatred of Rome seconded, or even penetrated the eloquence of his ambassadors. He cemented a strict and useful alliance with the great body of his countrymen, who obeyed Alethaeus and Saphrax, as the guardians of their infant king. The long animosity of rival tribes was suspended by the sense of their common interest. The independent part of the nation was associated under one standard, and the chiefs of the Ostrogoths appear to have yielded to the superior genius of the general of the Visgoths. He obtained the formidable aid of the Typhala, whose military renown was disgraced and polluted by the public infamy of their domestic manners. Every youth, on his entrance into the world, was united by the ties of honourable friendship and brutal love to some warrior of the tribe. Nor could he hope to be released from this unnatural connection, till he had approved his manhood by slaying in single combat a huge bear or a wild boar of the forest. But the most powerful auxiliaries of the Goths were drawn from the camp of those enemies who had expelled them from their native seats. The loose subordination and extensive possessions of the Huns and the Alani delayed the conquests and distracted the councils of that victorious people. Several of the hordes were allured by the liberal promises of Fritigan, and the rapid cavalry of Scythia added weight and energy to the steady and strenuous effects of the Gothic infantry who could never forgive the successor of Valentinian, enjoyed and increased the general confusion, and a seasonable eruption of the Almany in the provinces of Gaul engaged the attention and diverted the forces of the Emperor of the West. End of chapter 26, part 3《ハプタイムズ・ディクライン・アンド・フォール・オブ・ザ・ローマン・エンパイア・ボリューム2》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver《ハプタイムズ・ディクライン・アンド・フォール・オブ・ザ・ローマン・エンパイア・ボリューム2》One of the most dangerous inconveniences of the introduction of the barbarians into the army and the palace was sensibly felt in their correspondence with their hostile countrymen, to whom they imprudently, or maliciously, revealed the weakness of the Roman Empire. A soldier of the lifeguards of Gratian was of the nation of the Almani, and of the tribe of the Lentiensis, who dwelt beyond the lake of Constance. Some domestic business obliged him to request a leave of absence, 
in a short visit to his family and friends, he was exposed to their curious inquiries, and the vanity of the loquacious soldier tempted him to display his intimate acquaintance with the secrets of the state and the designs of his master. The intelligence that Gratian was preparing to lead the military force of Gaul and of the West to the assistance of his uncle Valens pointed out to the restless spirits of the Almany the moment and the mode of a successful invasion. The enterprise of some light detachments, who, in the month of February, passed the Rhine upon the ice, was the prelude of a more important war. The boldest hopes of raping, perhaps of conquest, outweighed the considerations of timid prudence or national faith. Every forest and every village poured forth a band of hardy adventurers, and the great army of the Almany, which, on their approach, was estimated at forty thousand men by the fears of the people, was afterwards magnified to the number of seventy thousand by the vain and credulous flattery of the imperial court. The legions, which had been ordered to march into Pannonia, were immediately recalled, or detained, for the defence of Gaul. The military command was divided between Nanianus and Malobaldus, and the youthful emperor, though he respected the long experience and sober wisdom of the former, was much more inclined to admire and to follow the martial ardour of his colleague, who was allowed to unite the incompatible characters of Count of the Domestics and of the King of the Franks. His rival, Prarius, King of the Almany, was guided, or rather impelled, by the same headstrong valour. And as the troops were animated by the spirit of their leaders, they met, they saw, they encountered each other, near the town of Argentaria, or Colmar, in the plains of Alska. The glory of the day was justly ascribed to the missile weapons and well-practised evolutions of the Roman soldiers. The Almany, who long maintained their ground, were slaughtered with unrelenting fury. Five thousand only of the barbarians escaped to the woods and the mountains. And the glorious death of their king on the fields of battle saved him from the reproaches of the people, who were always disposed to accuse the justice, or policy, of an unsuccessful war. After this signal victory, which secured the peace of Gaul, and asserted the honour of the Roman arms, the Emperor Gratian appeared to proceed without delay on his eastern expedition. But as he approached the confines of the Almany, he suddenly inclined to the left, surprised them by his unexpected passage of the Rhine, and boldly advanced into the heart of their country. The barbarians opposed to his progress the obstacles of nature and courage, and still continued to retreat from one hill to another, till they were satisfied, by repeated trials, of the power and perseverance of their enemies. Their submission was accepted as a proof, not indeed of their sincere repentance, but of their actual distress, and a select number of their brave and robust youth were extracted from the faithless nation as the most substantial pledge of their future moderation. The subjects of the empire, who had so often experienced that the Almany could neither be subdued by arms nor restrained by treaties, might not promise themselves any solid or lasting tranquillity. But they discovered in the virtues of their young sovereign the prospect of a long and auspicious reign. When the legions climbed the mountains and scaled the fortifications of the barbarians, the valour of Gratian was distinguished in the foremost ranks, and the gilt and variegated armour of his guards was pierced and shattered by the blows which they had received in their constant attachment to the person of their sovereign. At the age of nineteen, the son of Valentinian seemed to possess the talents of peace and war, and his personal success against the Almany was interpreted as a sure presage of his Gothic triumphs. While Gratian deserved and enjoyed the applause of his subjects, 
The Emperor Valens, who at length had removed his court and army from Antioch, was received by the people of Constantinople as the author of the public calamity. Before he had reposed himself ten days in the capital, he was urged by the licentious clamours of the Hippodrome to march against the barbarians, whom he had invited into his dominions. And the citizens, who are always brave at a distance from any real danger, declared with confidence that if they were supplied with arms, they alone would undertake to deliver the province from the ravages of an insulting foe. The vain reproaches of an ignorant multitude hastened the downfall of the Roman Empire. They provoked the desperate rashness of Valens, who did not find, either in his reputation or his mind, any motives to support with firmness the public contempt. He was soon persuaded, by the successful achievements of his lieutenants, to despise the power of the Goths, who, by the diligence of Fritigan, were now collected in the neighbourhood of Hadrianople. The march of the Tefali had been intercepted by the valiant Frigird. The king of those licentious barbarians was slain in battle, and the suppliant captives were sent into distant exile to cultivate the lands of Italy, which were assigned for their settlement in the vacant territories of Modian and Parma. The exploits of Sebastian who was recently engaged in the service of Valens, and promoted to the rank of master-general of the infantry, was still more honourable to himself and useful to the Republic. He obtained the permission of selecting three hundred soldiers from each of the legions, and this separate detachment soon acquired the spirit of discipline and the exercise of arms, which were almost forgotten under the reign of Valens. By the rigour and conduct of Sebastian, a large body of Goths were surprised in their camp, and their immense spoil, which was recovered from their hands, filled the city of Hadrianople and the adjacent plain. The splendid narratives, which the general transmitted of his own exploits, alarmed the imperial court by the appearance of superior merit, and though he cautiously insisted on the difficulties of the Gothic war, his valour was praised, his advice was rejected, and Valens, who listened with pride and pleasure to the flattering suggestions of the eunuchs of the palace, was impatient to seize the glory of an easy and assured conquest. His army was strengthened by a numerous reinforcement of veterans, and his march from Constantinople to Hadrianople was conducted with so much military skill that he prevented the activity of the barbarians who designed to occupy the immediate defiles, and to intercept either the troops themselves, or their convoys of provisions. The camp of Valens, which he pitched under the walls of Hadrianople, was fortified, according to the practice of the Romans, with a ditch and a rampart. And a most important council was summoned, to decide the fate of the emperor and of the empire. The party of reason and of delay was strenuously maintained by Victor, who had corrected, by the lessons of experience, the native fierceness of the Sarmatian character, while Sebastian, with the flexible and obiquitous eloquence of a courtier, represented every precaution and every measure that implied a doubt of immediate victory, as unworthy of the courage and majesty of their invincible monarch. The ruin of Valens was precipitated by the deceitful arts of Fritigan, and the prudent admonitions of the Emperor of the West. The advantages of negotiating in the midst of war were perfectly understood by the general of the barbarians, and a Christian ecclesiastic was dispatched as the holy minister of peace to penetrate and to perplex the counsels of the enemy. The misfortunes, as well as the provocations of the Gothic nation, were forcibly and truly described by their ambassador, who protested, in the name of Fritigan, that he was still disposed to lay down his arms, or to employ them only in the defence of the empire, if he could secure for his wandering countrymen a tranquil settlement on the wastelands of Thrace, and a sufficient allowance of corn and cattle. But he added, in a whisper of confidential friendship, that the exasperated barbarians were averse to these reasonable conditions, 
and that Fritigan was doubtful whether he could accomplish the conclusion of the treaty, unless he found himself supported by the presence and terrors of an imperial army. About the same time, Count Richemer returned from the west, to announce the defeat and submission of the Almany, to inform Valens that his nephew advanced by rapid marches at the head of the veteran and victorious legions of Gaul, and to request, in the name of Gratian and of the Republic, that every dangerous and decisive measure might be suspended, till the junction of the two emperors should ensure the success of the Gothic war. But the feeble sovereign of the East was actuated only by the fatal illusions of pride and jealousy. He disdained the importunate advice. He rejected the humiliating aid. He secretly compared the ignominious, at least the inglorious period of his own reign, with the fame of a beardless youth. And Valens rushed into the field to erect his imaginary troops before the diligence of his colleague could usurp any share of the triumphs of the day. On the ninth of August, a day which deserved to be marked among the most inauspicious of the Roman calendar, the Emperor Valens, leaving, under a strong guard, his baggage and military treasure, marched from Hadrianople to attack the Goths, who were encamped about twelve miles from the city. By some mistake of the orders, or some ignorance of the ground, the right wing, or column of cavalry, arrived in sight of the enemy, whilst the left was still at a considerable distance. The soldiers were compelled, in the sultry heat of summer, to precipitate their pace, and the line of battle was formed with tedious confusion and irregular delay. The Gothic cavalry had been detached to forage in the adjacent country, and Fritigan still continued to practice his customary arts. He dispatched messengers of peace, made proposals, required hostages, and wasted the hours, till the Romans, exposed without shelter to the burning rays of the sun, were exhausted by thirst, hunger, and intolerable fatigue. The emperor was persuaded to send an ambassador to the Gothic camp. The zeal of Richemer, who alone had courage to accept the dangerous commission, was applauded. And the count of the domestics, adorned with the splendid ensigns of his dignity, had proceeded some way in the space between the two armies, when he was suddenly recalled by the alarm of battle. The hasty and imprudent attack was made by Bacarius, the Iberian who commanded a body of archers and targeteers, and as they advanced with rashness, they retreated with loss and disgrace. In the same moment, the flying squadrons of Alatheus and Saphrax, whose return was anxiously expected by the general of the Goths, descended like a whirlwind from the hills, swept across the plain, and added new terrors to the tumultuous but irresistible charge of the barbarian host. The event of the Battle of Hadrianople, so fatal to Valens and the Empire, may be described in a few words. The Roman cavalry fled, the infantry was abandoned, surrounded, and cut into pieces. The most skilful evolutions, the firmest courage, are scarcely sufficient to extract a body of foot, encompassed on an open plain, by superior numbers of horse. But the troops of Valens, oppressed by the weight of the enemy and their own fears, were crowded into a narrow space, where it was impossible for them to extend their ranks or even to use, with effect, their swords and javelins. In the midst of tumult, of slaughter and of dismay, the emperor, deserted by his guards and wounded, as it was supposed, with an arrow, sought protection among the Lancarii and the Materii, who still maintained their ground with some appearance of order and firmness. His faithful generals, Trajan and Victor, who perceived his danger, loudly exclaimed that all was lost, unless the person of the emperor could be saved. Some troops, animated by this exhortation, advanced to his relief. They found only a bloody spot, covered with a heap of broken arms and mangled bodies, without being able to discover their unfortunate prince, either among the living or the dead. 
Their search could not indeed be successful. If there is any truth in the circumstances with which some historians have related the death of the emperor, by the care of his attendants, Phelan was removed from the field of battle to a neighboring cottage, where they attempted to dress his wound and to provide for his future safety. But this humble retreat was instantly surrounded by the enemy. They tried to force the door. They were provoked by a discharge of arrows from the roof. Till, at length, impatient of delay, they set fire to a pile of dry faggots, and consumed the cottage with the Roman emperor and his train. Valens perished in the flames, and a youth, who dropped from the window, alone escaped, to attest the melancholy tale, and to inform the Goths of the inestimable prize which they had just lost by their own rashness. A great number of brave and distinguished officers perished in the battle of Hadrianople, which equalled in the actual loss, and far surpassed in the fatal consequences, the misfortune which Rome had formerly sustained in the fields of Cannes. Two master-generals of the cavalry and infantry, two great officers of the palace, and thirty-five tribunes were found among the slain. And the death of Sebastian might satisfy the world, that he was the victim, as well as the author, of the public calamity. Above two-thirds of the Roman army were destroyed, and the darkness of the night was esteemed a very favourable circumstance, as it served to conceal the flight of the multitude, and to protect the more orderly retreat of Victor and Richemir, who alone, amidst the general consternation, maintained the advantage of calm courage and regular discipline. While the impressions of grief and terror were still recent in the minds of men, the most celebrated rhetorician of the age composed the funeral oration of a vanquished army, and of an unpopular prince, whose throne was already occupied by a stranger. "'They are not wanting,' said the candid Libyanus, "'those who arraign the prudence of the emperor, "'or who impute the public misfortune "'to the want of courage and discipline in the troops. "'For my own part, I reverence the memory of their former exploits. "'I reverence the glorious death which they bravely received.' "'standing and fighting in their ranks. "'I reverence the field of battle, stained with their blood, "'and the blood of the barbarians. "'Those honourable marks have been already washed away by the rains. "'But the lofty monuments of their bones, "'the bones of generals, of centurions, and of valiant warriors, "'claim a longer period of duration. "'The king himself fought and fell in the foremost ranks of the battle.' His attendants presented him with the fleetest horses of the imperial stable, that would soon have carried him beyond the pursuit of the enemy. They vainly pressed him to reserve his important life for the future service of the Republic. He still declared that he was unworthy to survive so many of the bravest and most faithful of his subjects, and the monarch was nobly buried under a mountain of the slain. Let none, therefore, presume to ascribe the victory of the barbarians to the fear the weakness, or the imprudence of the Roman troops. The chiefs and the soldiers were animated by the virtue of their ancestors, whom they equalled in discipline and the arts of war. Their generous emulsion was supposed by the love of glory, which prompted them to contend at the same time with heat and thirst, with fire and sword, and cheerfully to embrace an honourable death as their refuge against flight and infamy. The indignation of the gods has been the only cause of the success of our enemies. The truth of history may disclaim some parts of this panegyric, which cannot strictly be reconciled with the character of Valens, or the circumstances of the battle. But the fairest commendation is due to the eloquence, and still more the generosity, of the sophist of Antioch. The pride of the Goths was elated by this memorable victory but their avarice was disappointed by the mortifying discovery that the richest part of the imperial spoil had been within the walls of Hadrianople. They hastened to possess the reward of their valour, but they were encountered by the remains of a vanquished army, with an intrepid resolution, which was the effect of their despair and the only hope of their safety. The walls of the city and the ramparts of the adjacent camp were lined with military engines, 
that threw stones of an enormous weight, and astonished the ignorant barbarians by the noise and velocity, still more than by the real effects of the discharge. The soldiers, the citizens, the provincials, the domestics of the palace, were united in the danger and in the defence. The furious assault of the Goths was repulsed, their secret arts of treachery and treason were discovered, and, after an obstinate conflict of many hours, they retired to their tents, convinced by experience that it would be far more advisable to observe the treaty, which their sagacious leader had tactfully stipulated with the fortifications of great and populous cities. After the hasty and impolitic massacre of three hundred deserters, an act of justice extremely useful to the discipline of the Roman armies. The Goths indignantly raised the siege of Hadrianople. The scene of war and tumult was instantly converted into a silent solitude. The multitude suddenly disappeared. The secret paths of the woods and mountains were marked with the footsteps of the trembling fugitives, who sought refuge in the distant cities of Illyricum and Macedonia and the faithful officers of the household and the treasury cautiously proceeded in search of the emperor, of whose death they were still ignorant. The tide of the Gothic inundation rolled from the walls of Hadrianople to the suburbs of Constantinople. The barbarians were surprised with the splendid appearance of the capital of the east, the height and extent of the walls, the myriads of wealthy and affrighted citizens who crowded the ramparts, and the various prospect of the sea and land. While they gazed with hopeless desire on the inaccessible beauties of Constantinople, a sally was made from one of the gates by a party of Saracens, who had been fortunately engaged in the service of Valens. The cavalry of Scythia was forced to yield to the admirable swiftness and spirit of the Arabian horses. Their riders were skilled in the evolutions of irregular war, and the northern barbarians were astonished and dismayed by the inhuman ferocity of the barbarians of the south. A Gothic soldier was slain by the dagger of an Arab, and the hairy naked savage, applying his lips to the wound, expressed a horrid delight while he sucked the blood of his vanquished enemy. The army of the Goths, laden with the spoils of the wealthy suburbs in the adjacent territory, slowly moved from the Bosphorus, to the mountains which formed the western boundary of Thrace. The important pass of Succi was betrayed by the fear, or the misconduct, of Marus, and the barbarians, who no longer had any resistance to apprehend from the scattered and vanquished troops of the east, spread themselves over the face of a fertile and cultivated country, as far as the confines of Italy and the Hadriatic Sea. The Romans, who so coolly and so concisely mention the acts of justice which were exercised by the legions, reserve their compassion and their eloquence for their own sufferings, when the provinces were invaded and desolated by the arms of the successful barbarians. The simple circumstantial narrative, did such a narrative exist, of the ruin of a single town, of the misfortune of a single family, might exhibit an interesting and instructive picture of human manners. But the tedious repetition of vague and declamatory complaints would fatigue the attention of the most patient reader. The same censure may be applied, though not perhaps in an equal degree, to the profane and ecclesiastical writers of this unhappy period. That their minds were inflamed by popular and religious animosity, and that the true size and colour of every object is falsified by the exaggerations of their corrupt eloquence. The vehement Jerome might justly deplore the calamities inflicted by the Goths, and their barbarous allies, on his native country of Pannonia, and the wide extent of the provinces, from the walls of Constantinople to the foot of the Julian Alps, the rapes, the massacres, the conflagrations, and, above all, the profanation of the churches that were turned into stables, and the contemptuous treatment of the relics of holy martyrs. But the saint is surely transported beyond the limits of nature and history, when he affirms 
that in those desolate countries nothing was left except the sky and the earth, that, after the destruction of the cities and the extirpation of the human race, the land was overgrown with thick forests and inextricable brambles, and that the universal desolation, announced by the prophet Zephaniah, was accomplished in the scarcity of the beasts, the birds, and even of the fish. These complaints were pronounced about twenty years after the death of Valens, and the Illyrian provinces, which were constantly exposed to the invasion and passage of the barbarians, still continued, after a calamitous period of ten centuries, to supply new materials for rapine and destruction. Could it even be supposed that a large tract of country had been left without cultivation and without inhabitants? The consequences might not have been so fatal to the inferior productions of animated nature. The useful and feeble animals, which are nourished by the hand of man, might suffer and perish if they were deprived of his protection. But the beasts of the forest, his enemies or his victims, would multiply in the free and undisturbed possession of their solitary domain. The various tribes that people the air or the waters are still less connected with the fate of the human species, and it is highly probable that the fish of the Danube would have felt more terror and distress from the approach of a voracious pike than from the hostile inroad of a Gothic army. End of section 26, part 4「Chapter twenty six part five of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire volume two This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox org. Recording by Lizzie Driver Chapter twenty six Progress of the Huns Part five Whatever may have been just the measure of the calamities of Europe, there was reason to fear that the same calamities would soon extend to the peaceful countries of Asia. The sons of the Goths had been judiciously distributed through the cities of the East, and the arts of education were employed to polish and subdue the native fierceness of their temper. In the space of about twelve years, their numbers had continually increased, and the children, who, in the first emigration, were sent over the Hellespont, had attained, with rapid growth, the strength and spirit of perfect manhood. It was impossible to conceal from their knowledge the events of the Gothic War, and, as those daring youths had not studied the language of dissimulation, they betrayed their wish, their desire, perhaps their intention, to emulate the glorious example of their fathers. The danger of the time seemed to justify the jealous suspicion of the provincials, and these suspicions were admitted as unquestionable evidence, that the Goths of Asia had formed a secret and dangerous conspiracy against the public safety. The death of Valens had left the East without a sovereign, and Julius, who filled the important station of master-general of the troops, with a high reputation of diligence and ability, thought it his duty to consult the Senate of Constantinople, which he considered, during the vacancy of the throne, as the representative council of the nation. As soon as he had obtained the discretionary power of acting as he should judge most expedient for the good of the Republic, he assembled the principal officers, and privately concerted effectual measures for the execution of his bloody design. An order was immediately promulgated, that, on a stated day, the Gothic youth should assemble in the capital cities of their respective provinces, and, as the report was industrially circulated, that they were summoned to receive a liberal gift of lands and money, the pleasing hope allayed the fury of their resentment, and, perhaps, suspended the motions of the conspiracy. On the appointed day, the unarmed crowd of the Gothic youth was carefully collected in the square or forum. The streets and avenues were occupied by the Roman troops, and the roofs of the houses were covered with archers and slingers. At the same hour, in all the cities of the east, the signal was given of indiscriminate slaughter, and the provinces of Asia were delivered by the cruel prudence of Julius, from a domestic enemy, 
who, in a few months, might have carried fire and sword from the Hellespont to the Euphrates. The urgent consideration of the public safety may undoubtedly authorize the violation of every positive law. How far that, or any other consideration, may operate to dissolve the natural obligations of humanity and justice, is a doctrine of which I still desire to remain ignorant. The Emperor Gratian was far advanced on his march towards the plains of Hadrianople, when he was informed, at first by the confused voice of fame, and afterwards by the more accurate reports of Victor and Richemir, that his impatient colleague had been slain in battle, and that two-thirds of the Roman army were exterminated by the sword of the victorious Goths. Whatever resentment the rash and jealous vanity of his uncle might deserve, the resentment of a generous mind is easily subdued by the softer emotions of grief and compassion, and even the sense of pity was soon lost in the serious and alarming consideration of the state of the Republic. Gratian was too late to assist, he was too weak to revenge his unfortunate colleague, and the valiant and modest youth felt himself unequal to the support of a sinking world. A formidable tempest of the barbarians of Germany seemed ready to burst over the provinces of Gaul, and the mind of Gratian was oppressed and distracted by the administration of the Western Empire. In this important crisis, the government of the East and the conduct of the Gothic War required the undivided attention of a hero and a statesman. A subject invested with such ample command would not long have preserved his fidelity to a distant benefactor, and the imperial council embraced the wise and manly resolution of conferring an obligation rather than of yielding to an insult. It was the wish of Gratian to bestow the purple as the reward of virtue, but at the age of nineteen it is not easy for a prince, educated in the supreme rank, to understand the true characters of his ministers and generals. He attempted to weigh, with an impartial hand, their various merits and defects, and, whilst he checked the rash confidence of ambition, he distrusted the cautious wisdom which despaired of the Republic. As each moment of delay diminished something of the power and resources of the future sovereign of the East, the situation of the times would not allow a tedious debate. The choice of Gratian was soon declared in favour of an exile, whose father, only three years before, had suffered, under the sanction of his authority, an unjust and ignominious death. The great Theodosius, a name celebrated in history and dear to the Catholic Church, was summoned to the imperial court, which had gradually retreated from the confines of Thrace to the more secure station of Sirmium. Five months after the death of Valens, the Emperor Gratian produced before the assembled troops his colleague and their master, who, after a modest, perhaps a sincere resistance, was compelled to accept, amidst the general acclamations, the diadem, the purple, and the equal title of Augustus. The provinces of Thrace, Asia, and Egypt, over which Valens had reigned, were resigned to the administration of the new emperor. But, as he was specially entrusted with the conduct of the Gothic war, the Illyrian prefecture was dismembered, and the two great dioceses of Dacia and Macedonia were added to the dominions of the Eastern Empire. The same province, and perhaps the same city, which had given to the throne the virtues of Trajan and the talents of Hadrian, was the original seat of another family of Spaniards, who, in a less fortunate age, possessed near fourscore years the declining empire of Rome. They emerged from the obscurity of municipal honours by the active spirit of the elder Theodosius, a general whose exploits in Britain and Africa have formed one of the most splendid parts of the annals of Valentinian. The son of that general, who likewise bore the name of Theodosius, was educated by skilful preceptors in the liberal studies of youth. But he was instructed in the art of war by the tender care and severe discipline of his father. Under the standard of such a leader, Young Theodosius sought glory and knowledge, 
in the most distant scenes of military action, inured his constitution to the difference of seasons and climates, distinguished his valour by sea and land, and observed the various warfare of the Scots, the Saxons, and the Moors. His own merit, and the recommendation of the conqueror of Africa, soon raised him to a separate command, and, in the station of the Duke of Macia, he vanquished an army of Sarmatians, saved the province, deserved the love of the soldiers, and provoked the envy of the court. His rising fortunes were soon blasted by the disgrace and execution of his illustrious father, and Theodosius obtained, as a favour, the permission of retiring to a private life in his native province of Spain. He displayed a firm and temperate character, in the ease with which he adapted himself to this new situation. His time was almost equally divided between the town and country. The spirit, which had animated his public conduct, was shown in the active and affectionate performance of every social duty, and the diligence of the soldier was profitably converted to the improvement of his ample patrimony, which lay between Valladolid and Segovia, in the midst of a fruitful district, still famous for a more exquisite breed of sheep. From the innocent but humble labours of his farm, Theodosius was transported, in less than four months, to the throne of the Eastern Empire. And the whole period of the history of the world will not perhaps afford a similar example of an elevation at the same time so pure and so honourable. The princes, who peaceably inherit the sceptre of their fathers, claim and enjoy a legal right, the more secure as it is absolutely distinct from the merits of their personal characters. The subjects, who in a monarchy or a popular state, acquire the possession of supreme power, may have raised themselves, by the superiority either of genius or virtue, above the heads of their equals. But their virtue is seldom exempt from ambition, and the cause of the successful candidate is frequently stained by the guilt of conspiracy or civil war. Even in those governments, which allow the reigning monarch to declare a colleague or a successor, his partial choice, which may be influenced by the blindest passions, is often directed to an unworthy object. But the most suspicious malignity cannot ascribe to Theodosius, in his obscure solitude of Calca, the arts, the desires, or even the hopes of an ambitious statesman. And the name of the exile would long since have been forgotten, if his genuine and distinguished virtues had not left a deep impression in the imperial court. During the season of prosperity he had been neglected, but, in the public distress, his superior merit was universally felt and acknowledged. What confidence must have been reposed in his integrity, since Gratian could trust that a pious son would forgive, for the sake of the Republic, the murder of his father. What expectations must have been formed of his abilities to encourage the hope that a single man could save and restore the empire of the East? Theodosius was invested with the purple in the thirty-third year of his age. The vulgar gazed with admiration on the manly beauty of his face and the graceful majesty of his person, which they were pleased to compare with the pictures and medals of the Emperor Trajan, whilst intelligent observers discovered, in the qualities of his heart and understanding, a more important resemblance to the best and greatest of the Roman princes. It is not without the most sincere regret that I must now take leave of an accurate and faithful guide, who has composed the history of his own times, without indulging the prejudices and passions which usually affect the mind of a contemporary. Armanius Marcellinus, who terminates his useful work with the defeat and death of Valens, recommends the more glorious subject of the ensuing reign to a youthful vigour and eloquence of the rising generation. The rising generation was not disposed to accept his advice or to imitate his example, and in the study of the reign of Theodosius, we are reduced to illustrate the partial narrative of Zosimus, by the obscure hints of fragments and chronicles, 
by the figurative style of poetry or panegyric, and by the precarious assistance of the ecclesiastical writers, who, in the heat of religious faction, are apt to despise the profane virtues of sincerity and moderation. Conscious of these disadvantages, which will continue to involve a considerable portion of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, I shall proceed with doubtful and timorous steps. Yet I may boldly pronounce that the Battle of Hadrianople was never revenged by any signal or decisive victory of Theodosius over the barbarians, and the expressive silence of his venial orators may be confirmed by the observation of the condition and circumstances of the times. The fabric of a mighty state, which had been reared by the labours of successive ages, could not be overturned by the misfortune of a single day, if the fatal power of the imagination did not exaggerate the real measure of the calamity. The loss of forty thousand Romans, who fell in the plains of Hadrianople, might have soon been recruited in the populous provinces of the east, which contained so many millions of inhabitants. The courage of a soldier is found to be the cheapest and most common quality of human nature, and sufficient skill to encounter an undisciplined force might have been speedily taught by the care of the surviving centurions. If the barbarians were mounted on the horses, and equipped with the armour of their vanquished enemies, the numerous studs of Cappadocia and Spain would have supplied new squadrons of cavalry. The thirty-four arsenals of the empire were plentifully stored with magazines of offensive and defensive arms, and the wealth of Asia might still have yielded an ample fund for the expenses of war. But the effects which were produced by the Battle of Hadrianople, on the minds of the barbarians and of the Romans, extended the victory of the former and the defeat of the latter far beyond the limits of a single day. A Gothic chief was heard to declare, with insolent moderation, that, for his own part, he was fatigued with slaughter, but that he was astonished how a people, who fled before him like a flock of sheep, could still presume to dispute the possession of their treasures and provinces. The same terrors which the name of the Huns had spread among the Gothic tribes were inspired by the formidable name of the Goths among the subjects and soldiers of the Roman Empire. If Theodosius, hastily collecting his scattered forces, had led them into the field to encounter a victorious enemy, his army would have been vanquished by their own fears and his rashness could not have been excused by the chance of success. But the great Theodosius, an epithet which he honourably deserved on this momentous occasion, conducted himself as the firm and faithful guardian of the Republic. He fixed his headquarters at Thessaloniki, the capital of the Macedonian diocese, from whence he could watch the irregular motions of the barbarians, and direct the operations of his lieutenants, from the gates of Constantinople to the shores of the Hadriatic. The fortifications and garrisons of the city were strengthened, and the troops, among whom a sense of order and discipline was revived, were insensibly emboldened by the confidence of their own safety. From these secure stations they were encouraged to make frequent sallies on the barbarians, who infested the adjacent country and, as they were seldom allowed to engage, without some decisive superiority, either of ground or of numbers, their enterprises were, for the most part, successful, and they were soon convinced, by their own experience, of the possibility of vanquishing their invincible enemies. The detachments of these separate garrisons were generally united into small armies. The same cautious measures were pursued, according to an extensive and well-concerted plan of operations. The events of each day added strength and spirit to the Roman arms, and the artful diligence of the emperor, who circulated the most favourable reports of the success of the war, contributed to subdue the pride of the barbarians, and to animate the hopes and courage of his subjects. If, instead of this faint and imperfect outline, we could accurately represent the counsels and actions of Theodosius, 
in four successive campaigns, there is reason to believe that his consummate skill would deserve the applause of every military reader. The Republic had formerly been saved by the delays of Fabius, and while the splendid trophies of Scipio and the field of Zama attract the eyes of posterity, the camps and marches of the dictator among the hills of Campania may claim a juster proportion of the solid and independent fame, which the general is not compelled to share, either with fortune or with his troops. Such was likewise the merit of Theodosius, and the infirmities of his body, which most unseasonably languished under a long and dangerous disease, could not oppress the vigour of his mind, or divert his attention from the public service. The deliverance and peace of the Roman provinces was the work of prudence rather than of valour. The prudence of Theodosius was seconded by fortune, and the emperor never failed to seize and to improve every favourable circumstance. As long as the superior genius of Fritigan preserved the union and directed the motions of the barbarians, their power was not inadequate to the conquest of a great empire. The death of that hero, the predecessor and master of the renowned Alaric, relieved an impatient multitude from the intolerable yoke of discipline and discretion. The barbarians, who had been restrained by his authority, abandoned themselves to the dictates of their passions, and their passions were seldom uniform or consistent. An army of conquerors was broken into many disorderly bands of savage robbers, and their blind and irregular fury was no less pernicious to themselves than to their enemies. Their mischievous disposition was shown in the destruction of every object which they wanted strength to remove, or taste to enjoy and they often consumed, with improvident rage, the harvests or the granaries, which soon afterwards became necessary for their own subsistence. A spirit of discord arose among the independent tribes and nations, which had been united only by the bands of a loose and voluntary alliance. The troops of the Huns and the Alani would naturally abrade the flight of the Goths, who were not disposed to use, with moderation, the advantages of their fortune. The ancient jealousy of the Ostrogoths and the Visgoths could not be long suspended, and the haughty chiefs still remembered the insults and injuries which they had reciprocally offered, or sustained, while the nation was seated in the countries beyond the Danube. The progress of domestic faction abated the more diffuse sentiment of national animosity, and the officers of Theodosius were instructed to purchase with liberal gifts and promises, the retreat or service of the discontented party. The acquisition of Modar, prince of the royal blood of the Amali, gave a bold and faithful companion to the cause of Rome. The illustrious deserter soon obtained the rank of master-general, with an important command, surprised an army of his countrymen, who were immersed in wine and sleep, and, after a cruel slaughter of the astonished Goths, returned with an immense spoil and four thousand wagons to the imperial camp. In the hands of a skilful politician, the most different means may be successfully applied to the same ends, and the peace of the empire, which had been forwarded by the divisions, was accomplished by the reunion of the Gothic nation. Althanaric, who had been a patient spectator of these extraordinary events, was at length driven, by the chance of arms, from the dark recesses of the woods of Carcaland. He no longer hesitated to pass the Danube, and a very considerable part of the subjects of Fritigan, who already felt the inconveniences of anarchy, were easily persuaded to acknowledge for their king a Gothic judge, whose birth they respected, and whose abilities they had frequently experienced. But age had chilled the daring spirit of Athanaric, and instead of leading his people to the field of battle and victory, he wisely listened to the fair proposal of an honourable and advantageous treaty. Theodosius, who was acquainted with the merit and power of his new ally, condescended to meet him at a distance of several miles from Constantinople, 
and entertained him in the imperial city, with the confidence of a friend and the magnificence of a monarch. The barbarian prince observed, with curious attention, the variety of objects which attracted his notice, and at last broke out into a sincere and passionate explanation of wonder. I now behold, said he, what I never could believe, the glories of this stupendous capital. And as he cast his eyes around, he viewed and he admired the commanding situation of the city, the strength and beauty of the walls and public edifices, the capacious harbour, crowded with innumerable vessels, the perpetual concourse of distant nations, and the arms and discipline of the troops. Indeed, continued Athanaric, the emperor of the Romans is a god upon earth, and the presumptuous man who dares to lift his hand against him is guilty of his own blood. The Gothic king did not long enjoy this splendid and honourable reception, and, as temperance was not the virtue of his nation, it may justly be suspected that his mortal disease was contracted amidst the pleasures of the imperial banquets. But the policy of Theodosius deserved more solid benefit from the death than he could have expected from the most faithful services of his ally. The funeral of Athanaric was performed with solemn rites in the capital of the East. A stately monument was erected to his memory, and his whole army, won by the liberal courtesy and decent grief of Theodosius, enlisted under the standard of the Roman Empire. The submission of so great a body of the Visgoths was productive of the most salutary consequences, and the mixed influence of force, of reason, and of corruption became every day more powerful and more extensive. Each independent chieftain hastened to obtain a separate treaty, from the apprehension that an obstinate delay might expose him, alone and unprotected, to the revenge or justice of the conqueror. The general, or rather the final capitulation of the Goths, may be dated four years, one month, and twenty-five days, after the defeat and death of the Emperor Valens. The provinces of the Danube had been already relieved from the oppressive weight of the Grathungi, or Ostrogoths, by the voluntary retreat of Alatheus and Saphorax, whose restless spirit had prompted them to seek new scenes of rapine and glory. Their destructive course was pointed towards the west, but we must be satisfied with a very obscure and imperfect knowledge of their various adventures. The Ostrogoths impelled several of the German tribes in the provinces of Gaul, concluded and soon violated a treaty with the Emperor Gratian, advanced into the unknown countries of the north, and, after an interval of more than four years, returned with accumulated force to the banks of the lower Danube. Their troops were recruited with the fiercest warriors of Germany and Scythia, and the soldiers, or at least the historians of the empire, no longer recognised the name and countenance of their former enemies. The general who commanded the military and naval powers of the Thracian frontier soon perceived that his superiority would be disadvantageous to the public service, and that the barbarians, awed by the presence of his fleet and legions, would probably defer the passage of the river till the approaching winter. The dexterity of the spies, whom he sent into the Gothic camp, allured the barbarians into a fatal snare. They were persuaded that, by a bold attempt, they might surprise, in the silence and darkness of the night, the sleeping army of the Romans, and the whole multitude was hastily embarked in a fleet of three thousand canoes. The bravest of the Ostrogoths led the van. The main body consisted of the remainder of their subjects and soldiers, and the women and children securely followed in the rear. One of the knights without a moon had been selected for the execution of their design, and they had almost reached the southern bank of the Danube, in the firm confidence that they should find an easy landing and an unguarded camp. But the progress of the barbarians was suddenly stopped by an unexpected obstacle. 
a triple line of vessels, strongly connected with each other, and which formed an impenetrable chain of two miles and a half along the river. While they struggled to enforce their way in the unequal conflict, their right flank was overwhelmed by the irresistible attack of a fleet of galleys, which were urged down the stream by the united impulse of oars and of the tide. The weight and velocity of those ships of war broke and sunk and dispersed the rude and feeble canoes of the barbarians. Their valour was ineffectual, and Alatheus, the king or general of the Ostrogoths, perished with his bravest troops, either by the sword of the Romans, or in the ways of the Danube. The last division of this unfortunate fleet might regain the opposite shore, but the distress and disorder of the multitude rendered them alike incapable either of action or counsel, and they soon implored the clemency of the victorious enemy. On this occasion, as well as on many others, it is difficult to reconcile the passions and prejudices of the writers of the age of Theodosius. The partial and malignant historian, who misrepresents every action of his reign, affirms that the emperor did not appear in the field of battle, till the barbarians had been vanquished by the valour and conduct of his lieutenant Promotus. The flattering poet, who celebrated in the court of Honorius, the glory of the father and of the son, ascribes the victory to the personal prowess of Theodosius, and almost insinuates that the king of the Ostrogoths was slain by the hand of the emperor. The truth of history might perhaps be found in a just medium, between these extreme and contradictory assertions. The original treaty, which fixed the settlement of the Goths, ascertained their privileges and stipulated their obligations, would illustrate the history of Theodosius and his successors. The series of their history has imperfectly preserved the spirit and substance of this single agreement. The ravages of war and tyranny had provided many large tracts of fertile but uncultivated land for the use of those barbarians who might not disdain the practice of agriculture. A numerous colony of the Visigoths was settled in Thrace. The remains of the Ostrogoths were planted in Phrygia and Lydia. Their immediate wants were supplied by a distribution of corn and cattle and their future industry was encouraged by an exemption from tribute during a certain term of years. The barbarians would have deserved to feel the cruel and perfidious policy of the imperial court, if they had suffered themselves to be dispersed through the provinces. They required, and they obtained, the sole possession of the villages and districts assigned for their residence. They still cherished and propagated their native manners and language asserted in the bosom of despotism the freedom of their domestic government, and acknowledged the sovereignty of the emperor, without submitting to the inferior jurisdiction of the laws and magistrates of Rome. The hereditary chiefs of the tribes and families were still permitted to command their followers in peace and war. But the royal dignity was abolished, and the generals of the Goths were appointed and removed at the pleasure of the emperor. An army of forty thousand Goths was maintained for the perpetual service of the Emperor of the East, and those haughty troops, who assumed the title of Federati, or allies, were distinguished by their gold collars, liberal pay, and licentious privileges. Their native courage was improved by the use of arms and the knowledge of discipline, and while the Republic was guarded or threatened by the doubtful sword of the barbarians, the last sparks of the military flame were finally extinguished in the minds of the Romans. Theodosius had the address to persuade his allies that the conditions of peace, which had been exhorted from him by prudence and necessity, were the voluntary expressions of his sincere friendship for the Gothic nation. A different mode of vindication or apology was opposed to the complaints of the people, who loudly censured these shameful and dangerous concessions. The calamities of the war were painted in the most lively colours, 
and the first symptoms of the return of order, of plenty and security, were diligently exaggerated. The advocates of Theodosius could affirm, with some appearance of truth and reason, that it was impossible to extirpate so many warlike tribes, who were rendered desperate by the loss of their native country, and that the exhausted provinces should be revived by a fresh supply of soldiers and husbandmen. The barbarians still wore an angry and hostile aspect, but the experience of past times might encourage the hope that they would acquire the habits of industry and obedience, that their manners would be polished by time, education, and the influence of Christianity, and that their posterity would insensibly blend with the great body of the Roman people. Notwithstanding these specious arguments, and these sanguine expectations, it was apparent to every discerning eye that the Goths would long remain the enemies and might soon become the conquerors of the Roman Empire. Their rude and insolent behaviour expressed their contempt of the citizens and provincials, whom they insulted with impunity. To the zeal and valour of the barbarians, Theodosius was indebted for the success of his arms. But their assistance was precarious, and they were sometimes seduced, by a treacherous and inconsistent disposition, to abandon his standard, at the moment when their service was the most essential. During the civil wars against Maximus, a great number of Gothic deserters retired into the moroseness of Macedonia, wasted the adjacent provinces, and obliged the intrepid monarch to express his person and exert his power to suppress the rising flame of rebellion. The public apprehensions were fortified by the strong suspicion that these tumults were not the effect of accidental passion, but the result of deep and premeditated design. It was generally believed that the Goths had signed the treaty of peace with a hostile and insidious spirit, and that their chiefs had previously bound themselves, by a solemn and secret oath, never to keep faith with the Romans, to maintain the fairest show of loyalty and friendship, and to watch the favourable moment of rapine, of conquest, and of revenge. But, as the minds of the barbarians were not insensible to the power of gratitude, several of the Gothic leaders sincerely devoted themselves to the service of the empire, or at least of the emperor. The whole nation was insensibly divided into two opposite factions, and much sophistry was employed in conversation and dispute, to compare the obligations of their first and second engagements. The Goths who consider themselves as the friends of peace, of justice, and of Rome, were directed by the authority of Revita, a valiant and honourable youth, distinguished above the rest of his countrymen by the politeness of his manners, the liberality of his sentiments, and the mild virtues of social life. But the more numerous faction adhered to the fierce and faithless Prealf, who inflamed the passions and asserted the independence of his warlike followers. On one of the solemn festivals, when the chiefs of both parties were invited to the imperial table, they were insensibly heated by wine, till they forgot the usual restraints of discretion and respect, and betrayed, in the presence of Theodosius, the fatal secret of their domestic disputes. The emperor who had been the reluctant witness of this extraordinary controversy, dismembered his fears and resentment, and soon dismissed the tumultuous assembly. Fravita, alarmed and exasperated by the insolence of his rival, whose departure from the palace might have been the signal of a civil war, boldly followed him, and, drawing his sword, laid Priolf dead at his feet. Their companions flew to arms, and the faithful champion of Rome would have been oppressed by superior numbers, if he had not been protected by the seasonable interposition of the imperial guards. Such were the scenes of barbaric rage, which disgraced the palace and table of the Roman emperor, and, as the impatient Goths could only be restrained by the firm and temperate character of Theodosius, the public safety seemed to depend on the life and abilities of a single man. End of chapter 26, part 5 
End of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2, by Edward Gibbon.